is touching the truth. Get up, you brats a man yelled with anger in his voice, which woke Dio from his sleep. Maybe it wasn't a dream, who knows Dio hasn't remembered any of them since his reincarnation. Dio threw off the covers and rose from his small bed. There was an old wooden bed with a worn-out mattress and a pillow that was so hard that sleeping on a rock might have been more comfortable. Dio was the first to get up, as usual. The other kids who were sleeping in beds with him still hadn't gotten up. But that didn't matter. Soon, the older kids would gently awaken them. That's what pushed Dio to wake up immediately after the first shout. Dio the shabby bedroom by getting through the small spaces between the beds. It had been nine years since Dio came into this world. At first, he couldn't remember anything about his previous life. But when he turned four, the memories started to return. At first, he thought he was crazy or dreaming, but as time passed and he turned seven, all the memories came back to him. It would be more accurate to say that many of them came back. There were important things he was missing, like my family, my job, his name from his previous lives, and so on. The details about his daily life were blocked, but he couldn't complain. The memories he did remember were full of information about basic knowledge, life knowledge, and, most importantly, the world he was living in at the time. In his previous life, he wasn't that smart. He doesn't know if he completed college, but judging from his knowledge of architecture, he might have been an architecture graduate or student. However, that didn't mean he became a genius, and his learning speed remained average. Moreover, he couldn't just go to the library to acquire more knowledge. He went to the bathroom, which all thirty of the kids shared. Everyone who thought it would be organized was very disappointed, it was coming apart like everything else in this place. After brushing his teeth as quickly as possible, Dio washed his face and looked in the mirror. Dio's new body was young, with slightly sunken cheeks and black eyes, and short black hair on his head. He was very skinny and looked like an average guy, not handsome, but not ugly. Dio is walking toward the door to avoid the older kids, who would probably find a reason to bother him. It was quiet on top of the shelter, and he loved the quiet. Ha 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 Dio laughs unconsciously because this city is connected to the whole world. He walks over to the edge of the roof, sits down on an old chair, and puts a plate of food on his lap. Dio can eat peacefully here while enjoying the magnificent view of the city, which is considered one of the most dangerous in the world. Good morning, Gotham Dio said this and smiled at this cursed place. He was pretty far from the middle of Gotham. He could see a few buildings in front of him, and some of them had been covered by fog and darkness. There are a lot of different sounds in the city, like police sirens, fire trucks, and ambulances. In addition, even though it is daylight, this evil city is always dark. The clouds are so heavy here that a sunny day is unusual. The way Gotham is built doesn't help its image, as Superman said in one of the comics he read. It's like someone built a nightmare out of metal and stone. When Dio learned which universe he was in, he cried for a whole hour. A reincarnation in one of their favorite worlds should bring a lot of joy to a fan. Of course, he was a bit happy, but he literally reincarnated in the worst possible place. Gotham is not the safest place for a child without parents, especially in an orphanage located in a small alley in the East End, officially known as Park Row, but locals call it Crime Alley. Once, this district was one of the richest in the city, but now, after so much time has passed, it has become a haven for all the city's filth. On every corner, anyone can encounter prostitutes, killers, thieves, and other evil people. If he wandered too far from the safe zone, a fate much worse than death could happen to him. After finishing his breakfast, he went downstairs to return his tray and then went to the bathroom again to shower and change. It's almost time to go to school. All the younger kids gathered in their shabby uniforms and worn out backpacks by the gate. There are a lot of tough things about going to school here. The lessons make Dio want to end it all, but revealing some of his knowledge right now would be the same as suicide. Ma, we're ready. One of the boys at the front of the line said. Fei Ma Gun, the old woman who runs this orphanage, always wears clothes that make her look like she's from another century and always has a sweet smile on her face. I see, John. Thank you for looking after your brothers. Now go, or you'll be late. Ma spoke as she leaned on her cane and gently stroked the hair of John, who was the oldest of the children. 
As we walked out of the gates in a line, she called after us. Don't forget to fulfill your daily duties, children, or you'll be punished. Yes, Ma Gun all the children shouted in unison, and Dio did too. The children can walk to school through Crime Alley without fear of being hurt because no one would be stupid enough to go near Ma Gun's shelter for boys who have gone astray. This place was meant to be a school to help criminals change, but Ma Gun is so kind that she takes in all the kids who are alone near Crime Alley. The people here think Ma Gun is a saint because she chose to stay in this place full of sin. They're all complete idiots. They don't know that this nice woman is actually raising kids and training them to be good soldiers at the same time, and they all end up joining her criminal organization. For those who think like villains, this is a great idea, all the kids and teens end up loving Ma Gun, and she gets many new recruits. So they can go to school without risking becoming a corpse with a slashed throat. In the end, most people respect Ma Gun's image as a holy woman. The gang leaders here know her true identity and dare not start a war with her. They know many people will be there for her and guard her no matter what. In addition, she is in charge of a big part of the drug trade in this area. The thought of turning her into the police and using her to escape from this cursed place has crossed Dio's mind more than once. It's a crazy idea, a ten-year-old accusing a saint of something like that, and she has many friends, likely even inside the GCPD and among the Guardians. Dio does have an escape plan, of course, but it's going to be very dangerous. It was always awful for Dio in class, but he couldn't do anything about it. Their small group split up after classes. While some of them went into the alleys, most of them decided to go to the park, which was a good spot to do Ma Gun's daily tasks. Dio and a few other kids chose the alleys. Gotham has many dark alleys, and he didn't like pushing his way through a busy park. In one of these alleys, Dio stood with his back to a trash can in the back of a dirty restaurant and tried his best to ignore the smell of trash. After a while, he got used to it, and now he simply waited. Dio's target didn't appear immediately. A man in a coat carrying a woman's purse walked down the alley with a casual smile. He looked through it carefully and took valuable things out, hiding them in his pockets. Finally, with a grin on his face, he dropped the purse with the useless items on the ground and continued on his way. As he passed by Dio, Dio moved quietly forward like a cat, hid behind the man, and grabbed the gold watch he had seen him put in his back pocket. The stealing was perfect. The thief didn't even realize it and continued on his way. As for Dio, he turned around and walked in the opposite direction. He still didn't like stealing from other people, but he had to do it because he had to. Luckily, it looks like he's good at it, though he had to try many times before getting there. Dio was hit in the face so hard during one of them that he thought he was getting arrested. When the person he tried to rob saw that he was a child, they were kind and didn't do anything more. Despite that, they him on the cold, dirty ground. It's funny that the person Dio tried to rob taught him the skills that have helped him stay alive. After getting beat up and failing several times, he tried to rob someone else a year ago. This time, he thought the person was a prostitute and thought she was someone else. He was caught before he could steal. It surprised him that she didn't hit him or call the police. She instead taught him the basics. She told him that stealing is an art, and he finally agreed with her. Dio doesn't like stealing, but it takes a lot of skill to do it without being noticed. This is especially true in Gotham, where everyone goes around with their eyes on their stuff the whole time. After completing the main task, he usually spends some more time on the streets. Dio might be able to steal from another thief or gangster and hide the money he makes in a stash in a tree in the park on his way home. This isn't the end of his dreams. Due to his age, he can't sell any of the stolen items. This means that Dio's small wealth includes both the things he saved up for the future and the money he stole. There isn't a lot of money around here, but Dio worked hard all year and saved almost $500, which is a lot of money for a child from a shelter. There are far more serious limits than just not being able to sell stolen goods when living in a child's body. Dio really can't handle being a kid by himself. Dio needs help renting a place to buy food or clothes. When a child is seen trying to buy a lot of groceries or rent an apartment on their own, a sensible person would call the cops. They would take him into the care of Child Protective Services and send him back to Ma Gun for sure if they caught him. Dio could run away and try to survive on the streets of Gotham, but that would be much more dangerous than where he is now. 
so, the money he has collected so far is practically useless. If Dio were to go to some other city, and even if he were caught, he'd have a chance of ending up in a safe place where he could stay until he became old enough to fend for himself. But Dio believes Ma Gun has eyes everywhere. When he returned to the shelter, it was already getting dark, and the first thing he saw by the gates was one of the older kids. The older kids are those who can't stay in the shelter anymore because they're adults, but Kind Ma Gun hires them for services like security or cleaning the building. It's such a pretty excuse, but in reality, these older kids are already part of Ma Gun's organization, so those who stay here are ordered to watch over us and raise us. They're all arrogant sadists, but their leader is even worse, and he has issues with him, and the reason is simple jealousy. Look who's back early, it seems Ma's golden child didn't have a lucky day, the guy at the entrance said. I'm luckier than ever, Dylan. Dio didn't want to talk to him, but he answered. Dylan was very fat and almost two meters tall. The thing that made him stand out was his big stomach, which he got by stealing food meant for kids. Kid, I told you to be polite when you talk to me. Or do you want another slap Dylan said while smiling with his crooked yellow teeth. Come here and give me today's loot. I'll personally hand it over to Ma. Dylan said with his hand extended and opened his palm. Dylan is clearly trying to make him look bad for being a good kid. Dio always brings valuable things with him, like earrings, watches, and cell phones, while other kids steal useless things. Therefore, Ma Gun is protecting him, and this security keeps Dylan from being too bold. But it looks like he's gone too far today. I'll personally hand over my task to Ma, just as I always do. Dio said it as confidently as he could and prepared to run to Ma's office. Dylan's smile fades, and his hand clenches into a fist. You arrogant brat, I'm warning you, give it to me immediately, or I'll flip you over and shake you until I get what I want as Dio doesn't move, Dylan approaches him. Dio dodged to the side to avoid being caught and ran past him through the gates. He doesn't stop and starts heading for the door. Dylan turns and chases after him. Stop, you little brat he shouts. Dio doesn't listen to him, but he still stops, and he does too, as the kind lady who runs this place appears from the building's main entrance. After a few moments of silence, she looked at Dio and Dylan and broke the silence with a smile. You're back already, little Dio she asked gently and shifted her gaze to Dio. The strange name Dio got in this new life is Diomedes Inwood, which was written on the blanket they wrapped him in when they dropped him off, but everyone just calls him Dio. Yes, Ma, I got lucky with my daily work, and I made it home quickly. Dio answered and tried his best to talk and look like a child. My little Dio, you always succeed. You're undoubtedly the most talented among all the children. Let's see what you brought me. Dio reached into his pocket, took out the gold watch, and handed it to Ma Gan. She immediately lights up with joy at his items. Excellent work, my little one. Now, why don't you go inside for something hot to eat and a bath she patted him on the shoulder. Yes, Ma. Thank you, Ma. Dio has to put on a happy smile when she congratulates him on the work and hopes he never gets used to it. Dio walks past her while smiling and enters the main door. He turned around and saw Dylan's angry glare, which didn't scare him in the slightest. After taking a shower, Dio heads downstairs to the cafeteria to eat a tasteless tomato soup served with hard biscuits. As usual, Dio gives the rest to a child who didn't finish their work and doesn't have food for today because they didn't finish their task. This gesture has become a habit for him and has earned the favor of many other kids. However, since he lacks the patience to talk with them, Dio avoids socializing. At least they leave him alone, which he greatly appreciates. Dio feels sorry for these kids, and if his plan works, he'll be able to help them. There's not much to do after school and Ma Gan's task. Usually, Dio comes to the shelter late and goes straight to sleep. But today, Dio must stay awake because he came home early to prepare for another robbery he planned to do in his own home. Ma Gun and the seniors will leave the shelter tonight and go to the border to get supplies for the next month. Since the drugs are so valuable, she always sends a big part of her force there to keep an eye on things. This place is almost always empty. She usually does business on different days of the month, but when Dio sees the seniors occupying themselves in the evening before, he knows it's time for her to do business. The only thing Dio couldn't figure out was the exact time of the deal, he wasn't sure, but it seemed like only Ma Gun knew. 
So, it could happen any time after dark, when everyone goes to sleep. That's why he needed to be alert and prepared. All of the kids and teenagers were told to go to bed at 9 o'clock at night. A few minutes later, the lights were turned off in the rooms, and only the hallways were lit, which was good for him. Just after 10 minutes, when all the kids were sound asleep, Dio heard someone walking down the hall. They were going away, and when the noise stopped, he got up and went to the window on the first floor. Dio saw the older people leave through the iron gates, enter a car, and drive away. As he expected, they all, except for two older boys who stayed to guard the gates. Inside the building, there was no one but sleeping children. Dio moved as quietly as possible through the corridors. There were several rooms on this floor, and he didn't want to accidentally wake any of the children. On the first floor, there was an ordinary area, on the second, bedrooms and a bathroom, and on the third, the room for the senior kids and my target, Ma Gun's office. The second floor wasn't as big as the first, so the walk wasn't too long. However, Dio went slowly until he reached the turn leading to the office. He glanced at the corner and tried his best to avoid the surveillance camera. In this place, there wasn't a single proper bed, but there was a camera. He knew about the camera because he came here every day for a year. Each time he returned home after work, he came here and handed over the stolen goods to Ma. It looked like the camera was securely attached to the wall, but it was hanging there too securely. He knew this because the camera would shake when the wind got in through the window below it. So, all Dio needed was a good stone and a throw, which he had been working on for the past month. The throw turned out almost perfect, the stone hit the side of the camera, making it move without causing any damage, and now the camera was facing the wall. All that was for him to do was slip through the barely closed door. What he thought was a big mistake was that Ma Gan never locked it. The office was shabby and old, with peeling wallpaper here and there. The old woman always did her own cleaning because she didn't trust anyone else to do such an important job. The desk in the middle was full of papers. There was only a wooden chair in front of the desk. The wall opposite the entrance was filled with photographs of happy children kissing and hugging Ma. There were no photographs on the wall, but a painting portraying Ma's first children hung in the center. The safe behind this painting was one of the first discoveries Dio made when he was alone in this room for the first time. Lately, he has been alone in the office more and more often when Ma Gan has urgent business to attend to. He was always very careful when he checked things out. He never touched or moved anything to keep her from suspecting him. It took a long time to figure out the combination for the safe, but inside it, he found disappointment. Just birth certificates and legal papers, which is normal for places like this. The owner of the place didn't really care much about bureaucratic matters, but she had to put something in the fake safe. The real safe wasn't on the wall but on the floor. With some effort, Dio pushed the old table aside and carefully lifted the worn-out carpet. It was on top of a wooden floor that looked solid but was easy to remove. After these simple steps, Dio finally reached the purpose of his visit to Ma Gun's office. It was much safer than the rough lead safe on the wall, which was a modern safe with a digital display in front of him. Dio discovered this place entirely by chance during one of his many inspections of this area. Dio saw the marks on the carpet that showed the table had been moved several times. When he found this safe for the first time, he felt relieved, he had nearly stopped looking for what rightfully belonged to him. That day, Dio didn't have the time to try to open it, so this would be his first try. So, let's see if the old lady is as predictable as she seems. Dio muttered to himself while pressing the button that activated the safe's display. Dio entered the combination on the display, and when he pressed enter, the light turned green, confirming that the safe was open. Ma Gun was a tough criminal organization leader, but she was also an old woman with technical problems. So Dio wasn't surprised that the password was the same as the one for the old safe on the wall. The password was also written on the back of a photograph in a frame on her desk. Bingo, Dio whispered when he saw the contents of the safe. A number of piles of $100 bills. At first glance, it looked like there were probably half a million here. Dio saw some money and a small red diary, but it wasn't what he had really come for. When he started regaining his memories of the past, he remembered some memories when he was B.A. baby. He couldn't recall the face of the woman who had abandoned him, his likely mother, but he clearly remembered how she had carried him to a church, wrapped him in a blanket, and placed him on the floor in front of the door. 
Then she took off her necklace and put it around his neck, kissed him on the forehead, and... That's the necklace he's looking for. Dio needed it because his instinct tells him it's very important, not because he has any affectionate feelings or memories of the woman who him. Ma Gun seemed to think the same, when Dio was brought to her, she took the necklace from him. She gave it to one of the seniors and told him to find out its value. Dio remembered this incident very clearly because it was so clear in his mind. A few hours later, while Ma was still watching over him, the senior returned and said the necklace was worthless. Ma had good intuition and decided to keep the necklace to learn more about it. She wears it. That was the only explanation for where it could be. He had already gone through Ma Gun's room, looked through all her jewelry and personal items, and found nothing. Now, there was this safe. Maybe she sold it which is another very likely choice, she may have noticed something special about the necklace, so she put it up for sale after looking for a buyer. In any case, there's only one person who knows where to find it. Dio doesn't have the means to get answers from her. But let's get back to the safe. Dio decided not to pay attention to the money and opened the small red diary. The old lady's writing was hard to read, but the information was clear, so he had no problem reading it. A list of dates, times, places, and weights in kilograms is written on the side. He didn't need to be a detective to realize these were delivery dates and locations where she received goods and then distributed them among Gotham's gangs. Dio flipped through all the pages until he reached the last one, where today's date and time, the location, and two more next dates are listed. He found a blank page, took a pencil, and started writing the dates from the beginning of the year. As Dio did this, he started to think of a plan. Dio is not strong enough to handle Ma Gun by himself, but he can find someone who is. Dio can escape and free the kids from this hell if he gets rid of her. The plan has always been the same, only the method needs to change. At first, he was planning to escape, go to Metropolis, find good reporters at the Daily Planet, and use their help to publish a story about Ma Gun's shelter, which would solve the problem. But before that, he had to find his necklace. Now, he needs help to retrieve it, as well as someone he can trust to take down Ma Gun here in Gotham. The hard part is finding good cops in Gotham, which isn't easy, but it is possible. The problem is that if a child gives evidence in an investigation, it might not be taken seriously, especially if the evidence was gathered in a way that was not legal. In addition, he's more likely to talk to someone who fights for justice in this city, someone who will listen to him and look into the evidence, if he can contact them. Luckily, Dio has a plan for how to reach them. There's only one person who can easily find them, everyone in the city knows that when the signal lights up, he comes. So, all he has to do is turn on the signal and wait for Batman. The idea of meeting Batman and actually meeting Batman are two completely different things. Of course, it's not an impossible task. Dio could create a noise to get his attention, but he's not Superman, and he doesn't move as fast as Superman. There's a chance he might not show up or won't make it to the drug deal in time because he's occupied on the other side of the city. Dio could go straight to Wayne Manor, but that would raise even more questions and suspicions. Dio doesn't want to lie to him, and he doesn't know if he can make Batman believe him. This guy is a genius, he can read him like an open book. So, going to the police station and turning on the bat signal seems like the easiest way to find him. Then Dio can tell him the truth, so he'll agree to arrest Ma Gun and return his necklace. The urge to escape might not be needed if all goes according to plan. The Bruce in the comics generally has a good heart. He might want to take over the institution and make things better for everyone after seeing how these kids live. Dio won't deny that he's doing this partly to get to know him better and maybe get a chance to train himself with Batman. Dio doesn't want to become Robin, but training with one of the world's greatest martial arts masters is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. However, that already breaks away from the original plan, and it seems more like a fantasy. But in any case, Dio needs to figure out the situation he's in first. After writing all the dates and places of transport since the beginning of the year, Dio closed the diary and put it back in its place. It's important to return everything to its proper place so that nobody can think he was here. There's still a long time until the next drug shipment, so there's enough time to prepare. In addition, Dio puts the pile of money away. It's a shame Dio can't take them for himself, they could have been a support for his future when he decided to buy his own house, or perhaps for entering a good university. 
Ever since Dio realized that he had been reborn into the DC world, he had been wondering what to do with his life. Dio's not smart enough to be a genius and use that to become a hero. He also doesn't have a strong body or natural warrior abilities. Of course, he doesn't have any powers or cheats like the MCs from other fanfics he used to read in his world, who gained incredible abilities after their reincarnation. Dio isn't going to lie, becoming a hero in this world sounds tempting. It's fine to do it one step at a time. When the chance comes up, Dio will gladly take it. Dio put everything back in the safe, locked it, covered it, and placed the rug on top. He then moved the old wooden table back into place with a lot of strength. Before stepping back into the room, Dio double-checks to make sure everything is in place. Then he turned around and slowly closed the door. Before returning to his room, Dio glanced at the camera he moved. It's too far from him for him to put it back in the position he found it in, and even if he does that, he'll be caught on tape. So, he needs to create a situation that explains why it moved. Dio ran to the end of the floor, where the tools used by the janitor to clean the place were kept. He grabbed a broom and returned to where he came from. He used the broom handle to tap the camera's stand, which made it easier to move. When he sees that this is enough, he goes to the window beneath the camera and opens it. It's very windy at night here, and Ma hates the cold. She always asks Dylan to close the window before it gets dark. Dylan usually tries to remember it, but sometimes he forgets, and Ma Gunn screams when he forgets to scare all the kids in the shelter. So, hiding the camera problem and making sure Dylan gets a reprimand is a win-win for Dio. After returning the broom to its place, he goes down the stairs to his room. Luckily, no one in the room saw him go out by himself. They are all fast asleep in their beds. There are a lot of thoughts going through Dio's mind as he lies down in bed and tries to fall asleep. After an hour of lying and contemplating his next plan, he finally fell asleep, and as usual, he didn't dream of anything. The next day, he woke up to a sharp scream. It seems like the way he operated worked, Ma Gunn's screams before heading to school confirmed that. Dio for the public school as he would on any other day and went about his daily tasks there. Then, he returned home and did everything possible to avoid meeting Dylan, who is clearly not in a good mood today. The days continue to pass. The next drug supply won't come for another month, so there's nothing to do but get ready. Ma gives them a lot of freedom in how we do their daily jobs, so this goes pretty smoothly. The only important event that happened during these days was that Dio confirmed his suspicion that the old lady was wearing his necklace. She covered her whole body up to her chin in clothes that were out of style about 200 years ago. Therefore, he had to see her without clothes on to make sure she was wearing the necklace. Dio bought a cheap spy camera and spent $200 from his savings. When Dio went to her to deliver the stolen item, he politely asked for permission to use her bathroom, and she allowed it. The camera's memory he bought only allowed for four hours of continuous recording. After four days, Dio asked to use the bathroom again and removed the camera. He didn't do it the next day, as it might have seemed strange. But it all worked out. He took the camera to school, where he used one of the computers to see what was recorded. Dio confirmed that his necklace was around her neck and concealed by all of her clothing while ignoring a lot of things that might have been haunting his nightmares. The day finally came. Dio got up with another shout from the senior and went to the bathroom. He then went to the cafeteria like he did every other day. He talked to one of the other boys here before going up to his room to get ready for school. Hey, Martin. What's up, Dio can we talk Dio asked and pointed to a distant, empty table in the cafeteria. Sure, Martin replied and said goodbye to his other friends before coming to sit with me at the other table. Martin was one of the few boys he talked to at this place. He was 16, a slightly chubby guy with short hair and brown eyes. He sleeps in the same room as him, and they often exchange stolen items. He steals food from stores, of course, small stuff compared to what I steal, but the chance to eat something other than the food they give to them in this place is worth the trade. Since Martin is constantly involved in such activities, many of the kids turn to him. I need you to cover for me today. Dio said without pausing to speak and tried not to raise his voice too loudly. What do you mean Martin asked? Most likely, I'll be late today. I found a great opportunity, but it will only happen after the end of the work. 
So I want you to turn in my assignment today on my behalf and come up with an excuse for Ma Gun. The meeting with Ma Gun today is scheduled for 10 o'clock in the evening. Dio has to arrive at the meeting place early just in case Batman does show up and agrees to help him. It's dangerous, Dio. If she suspects anything, she'll call the police, and they'll definitely punish you. Martin said this while already planning how to say no to my request. They are called escapees if they don't come back before dark, even if they finish their task. Dio is not the first person to think about running away, one of the kids tries to do it every once in a while. That's when Ma Gun calls her a completely corrupt police pig. They find the kids and bring them straight to her without listening to any excuse. Just cover for me, I've already prepared everything. Dio has a certain reputation as a smart and resourceful kid, and Martin knows that too. What do I have to do Martin asked. I'll give you one of my stolen items. When it's time to close the gates, you'll go straight to Ma and tell her that I gave you this item. I couldn't give it to her in person because I got sick and went to bed immediately. Dio created the illusion that he was sick for everyone. For this, he had to cough every time he passed by Ma Gun or the seniors, and he's been doing it for several days in a row now. What's in it for me Martin asked. I'll give you forty dollars and one item to turn in. Dio said it firmly. Martin put his hand on his chin and thought about whether to agree or not. Dio is sure he'll agree. There is a chance to make a lot of money with very little work that no teenager here would pass up. I'm in, Martin replied and nodded. Then they shook hands, and Dio discreetly handed him the money and the stolen items, a pair of earrings and a necklace that he had prepared in advance. After their conversation, Dio finally went up to the second floor to take a bath and get ready for school. Now that Dio had finished everything, he went downstairs and joined the line of kids his age going to school. Dio likes to skip class and go straight to where he needs to be, but if he doesn't show up at school, Ma Gun will definitely call and report me missing, and that's something that Dio can't allow. After another boring lesson and a much more delicious and satisfying lunch than at the shelter, Dio's school heading in the opposite direction from his usual route. Dio needed to walk a long way to get to the police station, which his little legs couldn't do. Dio needed a taxi, but they didn't go to this dangerous area. It's dangerous in the alley, and anyone walking around here could be one of Ma Gun's kids. Dio took the long route and hid in dark and dirty alleys. After so long walking through them, he felt comfortable when wandering in the darkness. After walking through these alleys for three hours without seeing any signs of people, Dio finally came out of the crime alley. Dio was shocked when he crossed a small bridge and went into a different part of the city. This place looked a lot more organized than Crime Alley. As people went about their normal lives, the streets were filled with vehicles and taxis. Dio immediately stepped to the sidewalk and got into a taxi that had just pulled up. The woman who was exiting hadn't even closed the door when he had already sat down and pulled the door, which made a loud noise, catching the taxi driver's attention. What do you need here, kid I don't have time for games. The old man with grey hair and old glasses probably thought Dio was fooling around by getting into the taxi on his own. My parents told me to take a taxi by myself, sir. Dio said it in the most innocent voice he could and thought that this was the proper way for a child to talk to an old person. Did your parents allow you to take a taxi by yourself the old man asked, and looked quite surprised. Yes, they also told me to give this to the taxi driver he sits next to and tell him to keep the change. Dio said and handed him a $50 bill, which the old man took without hesitation. Well, where do you want to go, kid the old man asked and turned to the steering wheel. Five points, Dio replied. The money was a pity, he could still use it. On the other hand, the taxi driver didn't even ask him how old Dio was after he gave him $50, he just started the car and went in the direction Dio said. The ride was calm, so calm that it made Dio uneasy. He checked the clock on the radio receiver, it was almost curfew, and all he could do was pray and hope that Martin had completed his part of the deal. Dio looked at the outside of the window, as riding was too boring. Gotham City was very big. There were bridges connecting the six islands that made up the area. It looked like tall, black buildings were in every part of the city. After half an hour, he finally arrived. As soon as the taxi stopped, Dio jumped out of the taxi without even bothering to say thanks and ran into the nearest alley to hide from people. A bad habit that comes from stealing for a long time. 
The Five Points District was located in the lower east part of the city, and Dio was almost there. After a few minutes, Dio finally reached my destination the Gotham City Police Department. The internet mentioned there's even a basement floor in this old four-story building. It used to be a jail but was changed into something else after many criminals escaped. When Dio approached his destination, he naturally didn't enter through the main entrance. There are many police cars in front of the building. Dio went around it from the back, it was empty except for rats eating the trash that had been behind. The reason Dio is here is quite simple. While studying this place on the school computer, he saw that besides the main and side entrances to the building, there's another way to the roof, an external fire escape. It didn't take much effort to jump to the edge of the stairs and hold on to it, then he immediately started to climb. The stairs are connected to the windows on each floor, so he had to be extremely careful not to be seen. He managed to get past the first two floors without any problems. Their attention was focused on their work, so no one on the other side of the window saw him. In addition, the last two floors were empty, which made it simple. Finally, Dio reached the roof of the GCPD. The roof was almost completely empty, with the only unique thing being a projection of bat signal in the center. There is a bat symbol on the lens of what looks like a huge projector pointed upwards. The signal is something like a legend in Gotham, Batman has been working for many years. A signal shows up in the clouds, and everyone knows what it is, but no one is sure where it comes from. Dio put his bag on the floor. It was empty when he got home from school and full of things that could be useful. He took out a rough iron chain and went to the only exit to the roof besides the fire escape. Dio locked the door with a chain and a hanging lock. It would take a little longer for the cops to get here. It was likely that Batman would come here first when Dio turned on the signal, but if the cops came first, everything he had done would have been for nothing. Finally, everything was ready. After taking a deep breath to calm down, Dio walked over to the bat signal and pressed the button on the back of it without hesitation. At that moment, the bat signal turned on and sent a beam of light into the night sky. The beam made the shape of a bat appear in the clouds. He just had to wait, so he sat down in front of the bat signal and waited. After half an hour of waiting in the cold, there was finally some movement. However, it wasn't the kind of movement I expected. On the other side of the door leading to the police department, a voice shouted. Who turned on the signal without my permission a man shouted who was climbing the stairs at that moment. Bang bang he began pounding the door hard to open it. Who's on the roof I swear to God, if you don't open this door in two seconds, you'll regret it. He shouted again and repeatedly pounded on the door. Batman could have been a bit quicker, Dio said it out loud. He was already a little cold from the long wait. I'm here Dio didn't expect a response. Dio jumped when he heard the cold, harsh voice and lost his balance. He fell and rolled over on his back. When he turned my head, he saw a man standing where he should have been sitting. This guy came up to him without making a sound, which scared him so much that his heart almost stopped. Why did you activate the signal Batman asked with his rough voice. The suit was mostly grey, with two small points sticking out of the hood and the cape that covered almost his whole body. A black bat, the same color as the hood and cape, was on his chest. He didn't look angry that I had turned on the bat signal, Dio couldn't be sure since there was no expression on his face. But he could feel his gaze watching him. In response to his question, all Dio could say was, I want to report a crime. He remained silent, but Dio took it as a sign to continue. In fact, there were several crimes, but wouldn't it be better to inform the police outside first they're about to break down the door, and I don't trust them very much. Batman stared at me for a few seconds while the banging on the door grew louder, then he turned his back to me and pulled something from his belt, throwing it directly at the chain I had hung to secure the door. The door swung open with force as the chain broke. Batman a person was standing on the other side of the door. Batman stood in front of Dio and blocked both him and the person in front of him from seeing who it was. Can we talk, Commissioner Batman asked. It's okay, guys, you can get back to work. James Jim Gordon said this while giving orders to his people, who were probably with him. Dio heard footsteps and the door closing. What was that about Jim asked and was clearly annoyed by everything that had just happened. Instead of answering, Batman only turned around to show me, which confused Jim. While everyone remained silent, Dio observed Jim Gordon, 
a man in a trench coat with a thick beard and glasses. Sorry about the door, sir, but I don't trust the police much, so I had to take precautions. Dio said. Jim just turned to Batman and asked, another one of your students know, Batman answered briefly. As I started explaining to Mr. Batman, I came to report several crimes, and due to the nature of these crimes, I needed a certain level of confidentiality. I don't have time for games, kid. I'll call Child Protective Services. Jim said that and headed for the door. I can put the biggest drug supplier on Crime Alley into your hands Dio spoke with the most confidence in himself, but there was a clear tone of fear in his voice. This made him pause on his way to the door, and he turned toward me with curiosity. What do you know Batman asked. I know everything. The time, the place, the amount, and most importantly, who. You've got two minutes, kid, spit it out. Jim said. Dio has their attention now. All he had to do was tell the story as best he could to the commissioner, not Batman, who would find out if he was telling the truth or not. The drug supplier on Crime Alley is none other than the kindly Lady Faye Gunn, better known as Ma Gunn. Dio said. The same one known as the Saint of Crime Alley, heading the shelter for troubled boys, Ma Gunn Batman asked. Yes, the very same. This kid is clearly one of the troublemakers, and he is playing with us. Jim said, glancing in his direction and perhaps considering arresting him. I've already told you, Commissioner, I have evidence. If I didn't, I wouldn't be here. Dio replied and pulled a sheet of paper from his pocket and handed it to Batman as he moved away from the Commissioner. Batman opened the paper immediately and read it quickly while thinking about the information. These dates match the dates of drug appearances on the streets, and the amounts are correct as well. The last entry is dated today, when is this delivery going to happen Batman asked Dio and handed the paper to the commissioner, who began reading it. In three hours, if I'm not mistaken, Dio replied. Since you didn't specify the time or location of today's delivery, you must want something in return, what exactly Batman asked. Ma Gun has something that belongs to me, a necklace that my mother gave me, the only thing of hers that I own. If she goes to prison, the necklace will remain in the system because I have no proof that it belongs to me, and I won't be able to get it back legally. So, when you two go after her, please retrieve my necklace and give it back to me. Are you setting conditions for me when Batman asked, he leaned in and put his face close to mine. Dio won't lie, his heart stopped for a few seconds, but despite that, he replied as calmly as he could. I'm not setting conditions, I'm merely making a request. I want to get out of the life she dragged me into and save other kids. But a part of me can't just give up the only thing my mom, even though I don't have any attachments to her. Batman seemed to accept that answer, then turned away from me and returned to the commissioner. Where are the original documents from which you copied this list Batman asked. In the shelter, in a safe hidden on the floor. We need to secure an arrest, no Gotham judge will sign a search warrant without evidence. Jim said. Tell us the location, and I promise that if your necklace is there, I'll return it to you. Batman added. Dio trusted the Batman's word, so he gave them the exact location in the port where the deal was going to happen. The next problem came up before they could step aside. I'll call Child Protective Services about the boy. Jim said. You can't, Batman interrupted. Why the Child Welfare Board oversees institutions like shelters, including the one he lives in, and it's quite likely that Ma Gun has connections there. So, what are we supposed to do with him then Jim asked again, but Dio responded. Let me go back there. Have you lost your mind, kid they probably already know you've escaped. No, if they had known I escaped, they would have reported it by now. Ma Gun uses some police officers to track down escapees, but she calls it, using the law. Why do you want to go back the commissioner asked and looked puzzled. Not that I don't trust you, but if something goes wrong and Ma Gun escapes, she'll realize I'm somehow involved if I don't return. You can try to protect me, but in the end, I'll end up in the hands of Child Protective Services. He's right, Gordon, it's better to send him back. Batman agreed with my arguments. Jim walked over to the bat signal and turned it off, causing the image of the bat in the sky to disappear. Then he turned to him, sighed, and said, all right, I'll take him back. He'll have to find a way inside on his own, but I'll leave two trusted officers to keep an eye on him from a distance. They exchanged glances to see if Batman objected, 
but he had vanished just as silently as he had appeared, without making a sound. I hate it when he does that Commissioner Gordon exclaimed loudly. It was kind of cool, Dio said. The ride back to the shelter was much calmer and faster than the taxi. Just in case, he bent down to avoid being seen when they drove through the crime alley because a police car in that area is certainly a way to clear the streets. The commissioner brought two more police officers with him and informed them along the way. As they reached the beginning of Crime Alley, Dio convinced them that he needed to go the rest of the way alone. The two officers who were supposed to guard me were dressed in undercover clothes and followed me from a distance. When he got out of the car, Dio went down his usual path through dark alleys and got to the shelter just a little after Ma Gun and the seniors had for their business. There were only two guards on the place, and they were both at the front gate. Luckily, the fence was not being watched by anyone. After climbing over the fence, it was easy to get inside through a window and get to his room. It was already dark, so no one noticed anything. A blanket was over an object that he could see on his bed. It seemed like Martin did a good job. So he calmly laid down on the bed and waited for good news. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tktigud. Dio doesn't know how, but he managed to fall asleep. Bang 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 there were sounds that woke up everyone in my room and probably the whole orphanage. They sounded like gunshots and came from outside. What's happening what was that let's check it out. It was outside. It was Dio who was the first to get up and walk over to the window facing the front of the shelter, ignoring the sounds of kids everywhere. Dio saw that the gates were open, but there were no injured or dead people on the ground. A group of kids gathered around him and wanted to know what had happened. A shout from the first floor provided an answer. Where is he where's Dio the familiar voice of Dylan cried out. The boys who were surrounding him cleared a path so Dio could run. But there was only one way to the first floor, down the stairs. Dylan showed up in front of me and started to climb up. There you are, you damn traitor Dylan yelled at me. He looked like he had been through hell, with blood on his lip, dirty and bloody clothes, a bruised right eye, and a broken nose. It was clear that he had been in a fight. What are you talking about? Dylan Dio asked as he slowly tried to figure out how to go down the stairs. There's no point in saying anything else, you traitor I know it's somehow you who sold us out to Batman and the police are you out of your mind how could a kid contact Batman Dio asked as he walked toward a small plastic pot for plants against the wall. I told you there's no point in saying anything. You, brat, I saw it with my own eyes when the Batman took the necklace from Ma Gun's neck and said it didn't belong to her. Batman cleverly set me up. He even allowed him to escape. There's no point in trying to justify himself he wouldn't listen. Luckily, he was now close to the small clay pot with the plant, and Dio kicked it with all his strength. The pot flew towards Dylan's face, but to his surprise, he didn't flinch but raised a hand with a gun aimed right at him. Bang the sound of the shot and the impact of the pot happened at the same time. He ducks as the pot hits him in the head, but he missed. H -h -h a person behind me screamed. Dio turned around and saw that one of the kids had been shot in the hand. The kid was screaming in pain as he lay on the ground. He forgot that they were after him, but he couldn't do anything else. He wouldn't die from a shot to the hand, but Dylan would regain his senses in a few seconds. So, ignoring the pain in his leg from kicking the pot, Dio ran past him towards the stairs. You damn bastard Dylan shouted after me. As he went down the stairs, he heard the sound again, and a second later, Dio felt the result. HHHH this time, the bullet hit his shoulder from behind, and he was screaming in pain. Dio tripped and fell down the stairs, feeling each step. He screamed even more when he was hit in the shoulder. I finally got him Dylan shouted in sheer delight. Dylan. What the hell are you doing someone in a crowd yelled in response. Dio lifted his head from the floor and saw one of the older kids who yelled at Dylan, probably one of the ones to guard the gates. Shut up, Rodriguez. After yelling back, Dylan ignored him and walked slowly toward me. The pain in his shoulder was unbelievable, Dio had never experienced anything like it. But thanks to a surge of adrenaline, Dio managed to get up, but only to receive a blow to the back of my head from the gun. Dio must have lost consciousness for a few seconds. He woke up after Dylan knocked him to the ground, him lying on his back, and stared up at him. He pointed the gun at me again and smiled madly. Click the gun was out of bullets. 
Damn, Dylan muttered and tossed it aside. It doesn't matter. It'll be more enjoyable to do this with my bare hands. Then he lunges and grabs me by the throat with both hands. This fully woke him up, and Dio grabbed his wrists, tried to push him away, and his legs hitting on the floor. Dio's resistance seems to amuse him, and he tightens his grip around his neck even more. The pain and lack of air make Dio forget about the shoulder wound. After a few seconds, Dio's vision starts to blur, but not enough that he doesn't notice his smile. I'm dying, and I realize it. But I'm also angry. Angry that I'm dying at the hands of such a worm like Dylan. How I wish I could grip his throat the way he's doing with mine. Then something happens. Dylan loosens his grip on my neck and gives him a bit of air. The smile that had been on his face, filled with happiness, becomes strange, as if he's seen something very frightening. Lying on the floor, Dio can't understand what's happening, but two shadows approach Dylan and grab him by the throat, just as he did to him. This makes him finally release Dio. After a few breaths, his vision fully returned. The first thing he realizes is that what's holding Dylan by the throat are two bony hands that seem to have arose from the floor around his head. These hands must be incredibly strong because Dylan started turning purple. Dio doesn't know if it's from blood loss or from Dylan strangling me, but Dio feels himself weakening, and a moment later, he slips into the world of dreams, possibly for good this time. The bat cave the entrance is in a cave under Wayne Manor. This cave is part of a huge network of caves that are all connected to each other. There is a huge operational base with everything the vigilante needs to fight crime in Gotham in the caves next to the main one, right under the mansion. There's a laboratory, a training area, a workshop, a medical bay, and even some living quarters. These features are all built right into the caves, and there are several exits that make it easy to leave by boat or even small plane. Start recording, Batman said to his giant bat computer. The main computer is in the main cave, and behind the computer is a staircase leading up to the mansion above. There were several display cases here with various Batman suits. It was all built around his car, the Batmobile. A man known as Diomedes Inwood, aged. During our first encounter, he displayed no unusual abilities, except for a remarkably sharp intellect, unusual for a ten-year-old. A camera hidden in Batman's suit recorded images of a shy child speaking to him directly, which appeared on the computer screen while he was speaking. The recording he was making now was his way of processing information and identifying potential issues. After we met and thought about the child's request to get back what rightfully belongs to him, I went to the location where the exchange was supposed to take place. The image on the screen changed, now showing Batman on top of a building. While Commissioner Gordon was taking the child to the shelter, which we both believed the safest place for him, I continued to observe that location until the time of the exchange arrived. The child's information was confirmed when a woman known as Ma Gan appeared at the crime scene, along with several other adults no older than 30. The camera footage from Batman showed the inside of the dock, where Ma Gan was talking to another man, with a group of people standing behind him. The conversation continued until the man opened one of the boxes he had brought and checked the goods inside. Once I was sure the shipment was there, I attacked. It was a quick and accurate attack. First, I created panic by destroying the lights above the platform. Then, using the darkness to my advantage, I silently disarmed those with weapons. After dealing with all who were armed, I focused on the rest, leaving the two leaders for last. After the fight ended, I personally removed the necklace from Ma Gan's neck. That was my mistake. He said the last sentence with a tone of self-pity. It wasn't his first mistake in life, but for the first time, his mistake had risked a child's life. He paused for a moment to ponder before continuing his story. After the fight, I waited for the GCPD to arrive for the arrests. However, when they did, I realized that one of Ma Gan's associates had escaped. When they're hurt, animals and people also tend to go back to a safe place. So, I went to Ma Gan's house for troubled children. There, I found that two off-duty police officers who were supposed to protect the child were dead. I rushed to the door as I thought the worst could happen, and I saw what made me start recording. Then Batman pressed a button on his computer, which showed a full analysis of the moment he arrived at the scene and saw his fugitive hanging from bone hands. Somehow, the child opened an unknown ability when he fought for his life, but this ability lasted only a few seconds. 
As he lost consciousness, the hands dissipated into thin air. After making the fugitive unable to move or do anything, I decided it would be good to take the boy to the laboratory here in the Batcave for further analysis. Beep beep pause, report, Batman commanded. The computer's beeping sound was an alert that something was very close, it was moving quickly toward the Batcave. There were sensors set up several kilometers away from the cave, so Batman had plenty of time to watch the object coming at him on his screen. Seeing who it was, he simply pressed another button on the computer and opened the door for the guest. It didn't take a minute for the guest to soar into the cave and land behind the chair where he was sitting. Bruce, she greeted him. Diana, Batman replied while getting up and facing her. This is the first time you've officially invited me to your city, she said that and looked around. Diana, also known as Wonder Woman, was a beautiful woman with long black hair, sky-blue eyes, and a simple, gentle smile. She wore a red corset with gold accents on the bust and waist, a blue skirt with white stars, and golden boots. On her head, she had a golden tiara with a red star in the center. She carried a shield and a sword on her back. She stood with her hands on her hips, which made her silver rings and gold belt stand out. There's never been a reason to call you here, Batman replied. What happened Diana asked and noticed her friend's serious expression. Take a look at this, Batman simply replied and pointed to the computer screen, where the recording of the boy's awakening abilities played again. Magic Diana asked and watched the recording with some interest. Hard to say. When he lost consciousness, everything he did disappeared without a trace. I felt responsible for his condition and curious about his abilities, so I brought him here for treatment. But the surprises didn't end there. Batman pressed another button, this time showing an image of another part of the cave, the infirmary. On a bed lay an unconscious young man who appeared to be around 12 years old. His hair was as white as snow, and his skin was unblemished and pure. The only thing that set this child apart from a statue was a shoulder bandaged with gauze. Batman was lost in thought for a moment before he continued his story. Two hours after treating his wound, he didn't wake up. Examinations showed that everything was perfectly normal, but then physical changes began suddenly. First, his skin and hair pigmentation changed. Then an image on the screen showed how the child had changed over the course of a few hours. Four hours later, his changes were complete, but he still didn't wake up. The next change was his height. He grew several centimeters, nothing as terrifying as the hair and skin color, but upon closer inspection, it's clear that his entire body structure somehow transformed. I understand that you're interested in this child, Bruce, and you're trying to help, but why did you call me Diana, interrupted him. It wasn't that she wasn't interested in the child, quite the opposite, she was so interested that she wanted her friend to tell her everything immediately. Bruce understood this and didn't take offense. After six hours of observation with no answers, I decided to conduct a complete analysis of his DNA structure. Batman said, then fell silent. And what did you find stop dragging it out? Diana urged him to keep going. I was able to accurately identify only percent of his DNA as human, another percent resembled the DNA of a magician, but I couldn't analyze the remaining percent. There weren't any matches in the database, not even flawed ones. Batman explained. So, one of the child's parents was a magician, and you couldn't analyze the other half, but that still doesn't answer my question, Bruce. I agree with you, Diana, one of the child's parents was a magician. But the other half of his DNA wasn't a big surprise to me, I've seen something similar before in another person. In whom Diana asked. In you, Diana, Batman said that and surprised Wonder Woman. Diana's surprise lasted for a few seconds, and then she hurried to the infirmary. Batman followed her, and they both stood on either side of the child's bed. He appeared to be in a deep sleep. I won't ask based on the fact that you have my DNA and that you've already analyzed it. Do you think he's a demigod like me? Diana spoke in a low voice while still looking at the child's face. Considering that I spent over four hours trying to find another scientific explanation, considering every other possibility in theory, from being a half-demon to being an alien, then yes, I believe he's just as much a demigod as you are. There are no other options. Batman replied in the same quiet tone. After so many centuries, another demigod is born. I don't know if it's good for this child, considering who his father is. Diana sighed. 
Do you have any idea who his father might be Batman asked curiously. He knew that he didn't know much about mythology and magic. In the underworld, there are many gods, but only one god has the right to bring the dead into the mortal realm. Diana replied and gave a hint instead of a direct answer. Understood, Batman easily inferred the answer with the hint and his basic knowledge of mythology. He won't have any support from the Twelve, even the Olympians fear his father, not because he's cruel, but simply because of who he is. Diana said this and looked at the child with pity. Do you know what powers he'll possess? Batman asked. I have no idea, Diana replied. His father is unlike other gods. He doesn't like to go into the mortal world. You can count on one hand how many times he's his domain. He's never had any interest in mortals, so until now, he's never fathered a demigod. Diana explained. He needs to be trained, Batman stated this not as a request but as a final if she refused to train him, he would have to do it. Diana understood this well. On the other hand, she didn't want to take on a student, but on the other hand, this child would now be like her, alone in the mortal world. It was never quite like them, but it was always with them. It didn't take her long to make a decision. All right. I agree, Diana replied. What's his name Diana asked and gently stroked his hair. Diomedes Inwood, Batman answered. That's a good name, Diomedes, son of Hades. Dio dreamed even while he was sleeping. Since he began remembering his previous life, this had not happened before. There are things that don't make sense and happen to everyone sometimes, but he had never dreamed of something stupid. Dio was looking down from an incredible height of many thousands of meters. The sky was so cloudy with thick black clouds that not a single ray of light could penetrate. Surprisingly, that was the only thing he could see clearly. He had never had such good vision, and he could see every detail even when there was no light. There was a huge continent below him that wasn't on Earth. It was significantly bigger than Earth, so calling it a continent would be a mistake. One thing that stood out was the blackness of the ground. He saw several huge mountains covered in black snow and five rivers crossing the entire continent. One of them shone red, it was a river of lava. There were hundreds of buildings all over the place, but he was too far away to see anything but their black color. The only building he could see perfectly from this height was at the center of it all, a massive, majestic black castle. For some reason, he couldn't take his eyes off the castle. He also thought that someone or something was watching him. Then, an invisible force pulled Dio's body towards it. Unfortunately, the speed at which it pulled him didn't allow him even a glimpse of where he was. In the next moment, he had burst through the castle's black walls, and the invisible force stopped its pull only when Dio found himself in a huge, wide hall. He had seen many beautiful and amazing places in his past life, either in real life or in movies or TV shows. However, this place was the most beautiful of all of them. It took up as much space as two football fields. The paintings on the walls looked so real that even though he didn't know much about art, he could tell they were all masterpieces. The floor was mostly black stone, but there was a long, blood-red carpet in the middle of the room. There was a huge Greek pillar at each end of the hall. These pillars went from the floor to the roof. They were black but had gold and other valuable decorations on them. Dio looked at the pillars until he reached the top. It was just as amazing as the rest of the building. It looked like the Great Hall at Hogwarts in the Harry Potter books, with all the stars and galaxies on it. Finally, after a couple of minutes, Dio tore his gaze away from the surrounding light to clear his mind. Dio's body moved on its own. This time, he started moving gently and slowly along a long red carpet. When he stopped, Dio wasn't looking at this whole place. He was looking at a formidable tall staircase with two thrones across from each other at the top. The throne on the right was different from the rest. He had only seen gold or black so far, the colors he saw were the result of the priceless gems that adorned them. On the other hand, this throne was made of green wood and looked fragile. It had many flowers of different colors growing on it naturally. The throne next to it was being used, but this one was empty. The throne on the matched everything else in the room. It was made of the same black material he had seen before, but on the armrest, there were carvings that looked like heads. It was mostly easy and clear what else was going on, but it made things seem much worse than the empty one. It could have been because a man was sitting on it. 
He wore a black Greek mantle that exposed his shoulders, and his skin was the whitest he had ever seen, it was rather pearly white. He couldn't see his face, he wore a black helmet that covered it. In his hand, he held a weapon resembling a black trident, there was a space in the middle as it only had two separate ends. The weapon was slightly larger than the man holding it. The man raised the weapon and hit the floor with its lower end, which caused the entire hall to tremble. Obviously, this movement served as some sort of summoning signal, as multiple shadows began to appear below the stairs. The new arrivals were enveloped in black smoke, and Dio couldn't determine whether they were men or women. They stood still and stared at him. Diomedes Inwood, the man on the throne spoke. The man spoke with a cold, commanding voice that made him feel kindness instead of hate or anger. Son of, he continued, this time saying a name that should have been his mother's, but Dio didn't hear it. In a normal situation, Dio would have thought about why, but his next words caught him off guard. And my son. Son of Hades 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 the chorus of the shadowy voices that followed the man's speech went invisible. My consciousness seemed to freeze after he said that he was Hades. The only Hades Dio had ever heard of was the Greek god Hades. Now he understood who he was. You are my son, just like your mother's son. Even if it was your mother's decision to let you grow in the mortal realm without our involvement, remember, we treasure you. Hades continued. Dio was still in shock, so he listened to everything he said but couldn't react. The mortal realm is a dangerous place, my child, but do not yield to any difficulties, for you are the son of Hades, and Hades never surrenders or bows to anyone after finishing his speech, he rammed his weapon into the ground again. And the invisible force that brought him here reappeared, this time pulling him back. In the next moment, Dio was at the same distance as when he first appeared here and looked down from above. I will be watching your deeds, my son, Hades said, and his voice sounded as if he were right beside me. Now, wake up he commanded. Dio's awakening wasn't pleasant. Dio's vision was blurry, and his body felt heavy, as if he had slept for years. But after a few minutes, his vision returned to normal. However, that wasn't the end of it. Dio's normal vision then changed. The roof of the room where he was standing was made of pure stone, and lamps on the walls lit it up. The lamps were the only things closer to the ground, so the sky should have been dark. But he could see everything as clearly as if it were daylight. This was the first evidence that his dream wasn't a dream. He tried to ignore the changes in his vision and focus on where he was. He remembered that before he passed out, he had choked Dylan in some way. He thought he was hallucinating since he had lost so much blood, so he must have been in a hospital at the moment. But this place was definitely not a hospital. Besides, Dio didn't even feel pain in his bandaged shoulder. He forced himself to get up, his muscles protested with creaks, but he didn't feel any pain. Right now, he feels better than ever. He could see where he was as he was sitting on the edge of the bed. It was clear that it was a hospital in some kind of cave. There were several beds that were just like the one he was sitting on. Dio removed the four needle and tried to get up, but he ended up falling to the floor. Dio's body seemed fine, but he couldn't control it properly. After a few attempts, he understood why his body had changed. Or rather, it had been upgraded. Dio's skin had become pale and delicate, and his height had also increased slightly. But he didn't have a mirror nearby, so he couldn't see his face. You shouldn't have tried to get out of bed on your own, young Master Diomedes. Before he could fully regain his senses, a man in the clothes of an English butler entered the infirmary and carried a silver tray with a glass of water. My name is Alfred Pennyworth, and I work for Batman. You're safe here, so allow me to help you back into bed. Alfred was a fifty-year-old Englishman, bald with a mustache, and his movements gave him an air of nobility. Alfred helped him back into bed, then handed him the glass of water and the room to inform his master. Meanwhile, Dio decided to gather his thoughts. It's not every day he finds out he's the son of the Lord of the Greek Underworld and wakes up in a cave at Batman's place. There wasn't time for Dio to think as Batman quickly walked into the room wearing his suit and black cape. However, the surprise followed right behind him. The most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his two lifetimes entered with him, dressed in blue with red and gold armor, carrying a sword, shield, two bracelets, and a tiara. She is clearly Wonder Woman. 
Thankfully, Dio is still a child and not a teenager with a bunch of hormones, or he'd be drooling over her right now. I see you've awakened. Do you feel any discomfort Batman asked with his rough voice? I feel better than ever. Could you please tell me what happened after I lost consciousness Dio asked. After you lost consciousness, I neutralized the attacker, then the police arrived, arrested the attacker, and provided necessary assistance to the other children. Unfortunately, the attacker learned about you because of my mistake in returning what belonged to you. Batman replied and looked at my chest. Instinctively, Dio touched it and felt that there was something under his tattered hospital gown. He quickly pulled the necklace out from under his clothes. It was the necklace that almost got him killed, the only thing his mom or dad him. Since he knew who his father was now, he didn't feel bad about the pain he had gone through to get that information. The necklace's cord resembled silver, it clearly wasn't made of silver. It shone brighter than ordinary silver. The pendant was black, a five-centimeter piece of uncut black mineral, cold to the touch. It reminded him of the material from which Hades' throne was made. I analyzed the black metal and the pendant, but couldn't identify either of them. This black metal clearly piqued Batman's interest. As for the pendant, I don't know, but the metal is from the underworld. Batman stood behind Wonder Woman, and she spoke for the first time. She had been quiet since the beginning of the talk and had only smiled at him. It's not rare there at all, but what you're holding in your hands is one of the few pieces on earth. She explained. Batman frowned, not out of anger but because Wonder Woman had told him these details without first revealing who he was. They obviously already knew Dio was a demigod. Otherwise, Batman wouldn't have called Wonder Woman, she's an expert when it comes to mythological monsters and gods. Diomedes, I'd like to talk to you about your father. Batman calmly began. I already know, Dio interrupted him. There was no reason to keep his dream or vision a secret since they already knew who he was. You saw him, didn't you Diana asked from behind me. Yes, I saw Hades and the underworld. He also called me his son. He replied. I had a similar experience. Gods like to appear in the dreams of their children and be shown as loving parents. She said that and looked at Batman. Let's continue the conversation after you change, Batman said, turning and leading Wonder Woman away with him. Then Alfred entered the infirmary again with a set of clothes that he placed on my bed. I hope the style and size suit you, sir. Alfred said that and. The second attempt to get up was more successful than the first, so Dio took the clothes by the butler and headed to the bathroom. He stopped moving and stared at the mirror as soon as he walked in. Dio thought the only thing that had changed was his height and skin, but that was far from the truth. Dio's chubby face had changed into that of a teenager, symmetrical and handsome. But his eyes were still dark, but now they held more depth, like a black hole. The short hair was now straight and as white as snow. He hadn't seen Hades' hair because of his helmet, but he guessed his must be similar. Dio changed into the clothes that were given to him and looked at himself in the mirror. They were a simple black shirt and denim shorts. He moved slowly out of the bathroom as his body was still getting used to the rapid changes. When Dio the infirmary, Alfred stood at the door and waited for him. Follow me, sir, Alfred said politely and walked ahead to guide him. Dio didn't know which part of the cave he was in, but they walked through a corridor of rough stone. After a few turns and right, they stopped in front of a door that automatically opened when they approached it. Dio entered and found himself in a meeting room with only one table for eight. Batman and Wonder Woman were sitting in two of the seats. Have a seat, Batman said it without any emotion. Dio sat down across from them and waited for them to speak first. In the silence, he could hear the door closing, leaving the butler outside. You've shown yourself to be quite mature and level-headed, given your age, Diomedes. That's why I'll address you as such. You need to be trained. Batman said that and looked at me. Do you want me to become a hero? Dio asked, a bit excited. If you choose to become one, I want you to be trained because your abilities seem to be more than just physical, unlike Wonder Woman's. You need to be trained so you won't pose a danger to yourself and those around you. Batman added. Batman told me about your encounter when you were asleep. You have understanding and the willpower to do what you did. So, after you experience training, if you decide to become a hero, it seems like a good idea to me. Wonder Woman shared her opinion. 
you're going to train me Dio asked her directly. Do you think there's anyone better for the job she replied playfully. She was right, not many people are capable of training a demigod, and the Amazons had trained her, making her one of the best fighters in the world. Dio won't lie, he likes the idea of becoming a hero, and if she wants to help me with that, why not so, how do we start Dio asked with a smile. Dio thought his training would start immediately, but he was mistaken. He was excited but not in a condition to train. After agreeing to train him, Diana and said she would arrange everything. Diana had to give him a place to stay so she could train me. Diana is a world-saving hero, and that takes time away from her personal life. She might not be able to take him into her home. The Amazons might not like him training the son of Hades, a god, especially since I am a man. Dio stayed at Batman's place as a guest for a few days. Diana mentioned that she needed some time to make plans with a friend who might be willing to watch him. At this point, Dio had to get used to his new life. Dio's body was perfect, even better than any other human body. The problem was that as a human, he found it challenging to adjust to the explosive strength. The situation was so absurd that when Alfred served him, he couldn't hold a glass or utensil without bending or breaking it. It's essential to remember that people in this world are not like those on his original Earth. There are people like Batman who have trained their bodies to the peak of the human condition, can punch through brick walls, jump much higher than Olympic athletes, and have much greater endurance. If someone like Batman were transported to the world Dio came from before he was resurrected, he would become a superhero. So, it's easy to understand why Dio had problems with his new body. Diana came back to see him on the third day and told him that everything would be ready by next week. She didn't provide any other details but taught him to concentrate his senses, which I practiced unsuccessfully for hours. Fortunately, Dio learned quickly. So, after a week of living in this new role, Dio finally managed to fully adapt to his changes. These days, that's all he does. Batman was too suspicious, he hadn't revealed his identity, so he didn't take Dio with him upstairs. But at least Dio could monitor his exploits through the Bat computer. Dio learned a lot about how he operates and discovered how rotten the villains of Gotham truly were. You can stop now, you've reached the limits of what the machine can do. Batman said that and looked at me. Batman had offered to help him test my abilities. Of course, he had been studying him and collecting data, but Dio didn't mind. Batman gathered a lot of information that would quickly become outdated. Dio released the end of the special machine that he was supposed to pull up. The machine measured my strength by pulling him down as he pulled. What's the limit of this machine Dio asked and tossed my towel across the room. Kilograms. Your strength is increasing every day. Batman replied, writing something down on his tablet. He was right, Dio's strength was growing every day, but at a slow pace. He probably won't stop getting stronger until he reaches adulthood. Now, let's test your speed. Batman changed the topic and said. They were in the training room of the cave. This place was equipped with futuristic versions of the equipment anyone would find in regular gyms. Dio approached one of the treadmills, which didn't have speed adjustments, it was used only to measure running speed. Dio had already used it and other equipment in this area several times. Dio wanted to learn more than just his natural strength, which would make him stronger. But as Dio did this, he discovered another interesting ability. He doesn't get tired. Dio's body no longer produces muscle lactate, so it doesn't accumulate, and he doesn't get tired. It would be a benefit in physical activities, but the problem is that alongside endless stamina he also recovers quickly, so his muscles don't develop from exercise. They will develop naturally up to a certain point and stay that way until he dies. Dio also learned something new when he learned that demigods live forever. Of course, they can still be killed, but they will stop getting older once they hit adulthood. Diana told him about Theseus and Hercules for this reason. You can stop now, you've also reached the maximum speed of this device. Batman said it again without being surprised. How fast Dio asked eagerly. Beat before Batman could answer, the station on the wall emitted a sound signal. He went to it and pressed one of the buttons. Alfred's image appeared on the screen. What's going on, Alfred Batman asked. Sorry to interrupt your research, Master, but Miss Diana has arrived for a visit. Alfred said this while maintaining his usual polite tone. We'll be right there. 
After that, the two of us the lab and walked through the cave's corridors. Batman and Dio were almost always silent, and if they talked about anything, it was only about him. After guiding several twists and turns in the tunnel-like corridors, they arrived at the center of his base. It was a very large cave where various collections of his achievements were kept, as well as display cases with his costumes and his protégés. Dio didn't ask about them. Dio knew there's Robin with his family, but it seems that the Teen Titans haven't officially formed in this world yet, as there's no news about them. The most astonishing thing in the cave was the sleek Batmobile. It was a low, black car that was almost touching the ground. The engine compartment was very wide compared to regular cars. There are two seats in the back, where the trunk of a typical car would be. There were two black wings on either side of the rear, and in the center, there was a rocket booster. Dio is not a car enthusiast, but this vehicle struck him as incredibly cool. They passed by the car and found themselves in front of Bat Computer, where Diana was standing. She was dressed in her suit. As usual, she looked at him with a soft smile on her face. Glad to see that you've fully adapted to your body, Dio. Diana said to him. Batman told you everything already Dio asked and looked at him. One of the conditions for releasing you from my guardianship was that you must be able to live in the world of humans without accidentally breaking someone's bones. Batman replied. In any case, it was an incredible feat, getting used to your gift in such a short time. I thought it would take several more months. Diana replied that she was proud of this fact. She was not wrong, Dio got used to his gift very quickly and almost without help. It seems his case is quite unusual. Diana didn't awaken her abilities overnight like Dio did, hers developed slowly from birth. So, she's always had them. But for some reason, Dio was late, and when they finally awakened, they grew quickly and reached his current age in just a few hours. Diana, now that you're back and I'm completely used to my body, is it time to start training Dio? asked hopefully. Yes, she replied with a smile. Finally Dio exclaimed joyfully. But first, we need to go to your new home, she said something that calmed him down a bit. Oh well, you'll like them, they're the ones who helped me when I arrived in the world of mortals. Roi, I don't have anything against being under the care of another family, but it could create some problems, so I'm a little nervous. Dio thought about it when are we leaving Dio, asked her. Right now, she smiled again and pointed to the black bag on the floor that I hadn't noticed. What's this Dio asked and looked at it. I took the liberty of packing your bag, Master Dio. Alfred said as he descended the steps leading to the cave's entrance. Thank you, Alfred, Dio said this to the kindest man in the city. You're welcome, Alfred replied with a nod. I really like this butler. He was strict, polite, and kind. He was my only friend here, as the cave's owner early every evening and busied himself with other matters in the morning. I don't want to sound boring, but what's my legal status Dio asked and looked at Batman. After what happened at the shelter, Dio immediately ended up here. According to the news Batman told him, Ma Gunn and her gang were arrested, which caused a big uproar in Gotham. Afterward, the government took over the shelter and started building another one for kids with much needed money from Wayne Enterprises. The government was working very well because everyone was focused on this project. This means that the authorities probably want him. Don't worry, you're already registered as a protege of Diana's friend. Batman said. Thanks again, Dio thanked Batman, and he nodded in response. I don't mind being considered missing, not that the GCPD were going to search for me or anything like that. There are some problems with not having legal status in the system. So, shall we go Dio? asked Diana. She nodded and started walking toward one of the cave's tunnels. Meanwhile, Dio took another look at Batman and said, thank you for everything. He's not a talkative person. Dio could stand here pouring out endless thanks, but one sincere word was the best option. He never smiled, his face showed no emotion, but Dio felt that he had accepted his gratitude, so he looked at the butler who also took care of him. Thank you for everything, Alfred. You will always be welcome here in the future, sir. Safe travels, Alfred replied and politely nodded. Then Dio slung his bag over his shoulder and walked toward Diana. The tunnel wasn't very long, and there was no lighting, but that was no longer a problem for him. Soon, he heard the sound of falling water, and then he saw Diana standing at the end of the cave behind the waterfall. 
This path is usually closed. Batman uses it for guests who can fly. She said. We're going to fly Dio asked. She just smiled at him, quickly grabbed him, and flew out of the tunnel through the waterfall. HGH Diana started to quickly increase their speed and height, and Dio screamed in fear. It looks like Diana is enjoying the experience. Then they fly through the clouds quickly, and she slows them down as they fly. Look, she said. Dio was amazed, he can proudly say he didn't close his eyes out of fear. The fear was worth the view that was now before him. They were above the clouds, and the city below them could not be seen as the clouds were so thick. The only other thing up there besides them was a commercial plane flying in the opposite direction, several kilometers away. On the other side, there was the sun. The sun was yellow-orange above the clouds, looking beautiful. Ha, huh, they told me I had the same expression on my face when I flew for the first time. Diana laughed. They watched this beautiful spectacle for a few minutes. Can I speed up Diana asked after a while. Yes, as fast as you can. Dio said, a little confident. You asked for it. Dio didn't regret his request, he just wished he could measure her speed. He got used to this speed quickly with his new eyes and body, which made the experience even more exciting. He decided that even if he couldn't fly in the future, he would find a way. We reached our destination quickly. Diana was teasing him at the start of their trip, but she wasn't being reckless. She slowly increased her top speed from the beginning of their trip and didn't speed up immediately. Since Dio wasn't getting impatient, she kept doing this, and they got to their destination in just a few minutes. It wasn't a very long journey, they flew from Gotham to New Jersey to Washington D.C. Diana made sure their path went by many popular city locations, like the Capitol and the White House. The streets were clean, and the weather was nice and clear. After taking a short flight away from the city center, simple houses with identical architectural styles and lovely lawns in front of them took the place of the tall buildings and elaborate structures. Diana began to slow down as we approached a white singlestory house to avoid causing panic among the neighbors. She circled around and landed behind the house. What do you think of your first flight Diana asked as we walked towards the back door of the house. No words can describe it, it was simply incredible. Dio replied and spoke the honest truth. No one ever forgets their first flight. Diana said it with a smile. They approached the back door of the house, and Diana lightly knocked. Knock knock after a couple of seconds, the door opened. Diana, you're early, come in, dear. Dio stood behind Diana, so he couldn't see who was speaking, but it was a gentle female voice. Diana accepted the invitation and entered the house, with him following her. While they were walking through the house, Dio noticed many old things that were scattered around. The walls and shelves in the hallway they went through were full of weapons, tools, and even coins. So, this is the special child you told me about, Diana. Perhaps you'll introduce us when they entered the living room, the female voice caught my attention again. She sat on the couch, and Diana and Dio sat on another couch opposite her. Diomedes, this is Julia Capitellus, an excellent archaeologist and my friend. Diana introduced him to this woman. The woman in front of him said, Pleasure to meet you, Diomedes. In front of him was a middle-aged woman with a kind smile, and this time, Dio hoped she wasn't a wolf hiding like a sheep like Ma Gun. The lady had short, light-colored hair that reached her chin. She was fair-skinned, slightly thin, wearing silver glasses, gold earrings in her ears, and a necklace around her neck. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Capitellus, and thank you for allowing me to stay in your home. Dio thanked her as politely as he could. What a polite young man I'm very pleased, Diomedes. I assure you, I'll do everything I can to make you feel comfortable in my home. Dio's polite introduction seemed to have earned him some points in Julia's eyes. That's good for me. There's no need to create a tense situation or conflict with the homeowner where I'm staying. Julia was the one who helped me the most when I came to the world of mortals. She taught me a lot and helped me adapt to this new world. I know that awakening your abilities late has made things different for you, but I think Julia can help you with that. Diana explained. Diana and Dio had similar origins, but their beginnings were different. She was a divine being who had to adapt to the mortal world after leaving her home. Dio was just a mortal who now had to adjust to his divine nature. This would have been hard for any other child, 
but he just accepted it. The memories of his past life helped him a lot. Diana appreciated me by accepting my help, and in assisting her, I learned a lot. Julia said. Diana introduced herself as an archaeologist, and judging by her Greek name and the various artifacts he saw as they walked to the room, he understood why she enjoyed having Diana as a friend. To be honest, Dio didn't mind being a part of her research and getting a place to live in return. You probably want to see your room. Come with me, and after you settle in, we can have some food to eat. Julia said, stood up, and led them to the front part of the house, where the staircase to the second floor was located. Diana and Dio followed her, and as they went upstairs to the second floor, he saw a teenage girl ahead, dressed in a black rocker jacket. She had a punk-style hairstyle with pink hair, and he didn't see her face as she heard us and walked away down the corridor. This is my daughter, Vanessa, Julia introduced the girl to me. Vanessa didn't even turn around. She opened a door in the corridor on the floor, entered, and slammed it shut loudly. I'm sorry that it turned out this way. This child lost her manners when she entered her teenage years. Julia said this without being offended or irritated by her daughter's behavior. No need to apologize, I remember being quite wild in my teenage years too. Diana said. When this brief conversation ended, Dio almost yelled at both of them. It was clear that this wasn't a hormonal issue or the infamous teenage phase, the girl was clearly trying to get attention. It had started not too long ago. If this continues, it could turn into a disaster, but for now, let's put it aside and focus on the task at hand. This will be your room. Why don't you go in and get settled, and we'll both go back downstairs Julia said this and pointed to one of the doors in the corridor. Thank you, Mrs. Capitellis, Dio thanked her again. Call me Julia, dear, or I feel old and frail. Julia said, and she and Diana began to go down to the first floor. When they, Dio entered his new room, which was opposite Vanessa's room with skulls and a do not disturb sign. It was easy for him to hear the loud metal music she was playing, which she probably had on through headphones. One of the hardest things for him was controlling his super hearing. He hadn't completely mastered it yet, but he was able to block out the sound with a little focus. Dio's new bedroom was very simple, a bed, a wardrobe for clothes, a bookshelf, and a desk. What struck him the most was the group of books on the bookshelf, Dio had to study them in his free time. It was a small room, but for a child who had slept in a crowded room with many other kids, it was a little piece of heaven. After placing his few belongings in the wardrobe, he went downstairs again and saw Diana standing by the staircase. You're leaving already Dio asked her. I've been waiting for you. We both need to visit another place. She replied with a smile. What about Mrs. Julia Dio asked, as he didn't see the host. We're all having dinner together tonight to celebrate your arrival. She went to prepare it. But for now, I want to introduce you to someone, and I think you'll want to see your new training ground. Dio wasn't very excited about meeting new people, but the word training won him over. They went out through the back door and flew away from the house at high speed. They didn't have to leave the capital to reach their destination. It was a giant building perched high on a cliff overlooking the ocean. It was more than ten stories tall, all made of blue glass, with no markings or logos that would allow him to recall it. However, he was sure it wasn't the League of Justice's building. Diana landed on the roof of the building, which had marked spots, obviously for the takeoff and landing of planes parked nearby. There were many people in pilot suits around, but Diana landed in front of a specific man who stood still and looked at us. Diomedes, meet my friend, Steve Trevor, the leader of ARGUS, Diana said that and smiled gently. My angel, when you call me a friend, it sounds like we have a secret affair. Steve gave Diana a playful teasing gesture before reaching out to shake my hand. Pleased to meet you, Diomedes. Steve said. Nice to meet you too, Dio also shook his hand. Steve was a strong man, a blonde with the typical military haircut and blue eyes. He wore army camouflage pants and a simple white shirt with a military logo on his neck. Dio expected to meet him eventually after Diana took him as her apprentice, but not this soon. Welcome to ARGUS. Let's go, allow me to be your guide for today. Steve said that and led him on a tour. On the way, Steve explained to him about the armed revolutionaries governing under secrecy, or simply anonymous ranger group of the USA. 
they were officially established after the first attack by Darkseid a year ago. Their role was to support superheroes in the USA. In other words, they helped any hero or group of heroes in any way they could, and they were also responsible for containing or investigating metahuman activities. Steve had been leading this organization since it was established. To be honest, Dio didn't know about this, even with his knowledge of this world, it was almost impossible to remember all the existing organizations. Steve showed him around. This place had everything, from labs that studied the diseases or poisons that villains used on people to a whole floor that was used to make plans for how to stop a possible second dark side invasion. Dio almost laughed when he heard that. When Dio walked through the building, he saw people wearing what looked like cybernetic suits, with only their heads showing. This was different from the soldiers and pilots outside, who were wearing jumpsuits. He also saw some weapons that looked like they were from the future. It made sense, this organization was facing dangers from superhuman beings directly, so they needed a lot of technological help. He saw drones going back and forth that looked like small planes. The technologies in this world were simply insane compared to his previous world. These technologies could easily kill him if he wasn't very careful. Finally, Dio was led into a room used for Diana's personal training. Diana was the one who got the most help from ARGUS, so it made sense that she had a few rooms here, even though she didn't seem to use them at all, since everything in this room looked brand new. We'll train here. The room is strengthened, so we don't need to hold back. Diana said that and pointed to the setup. When do we start Dio asked. Tomorrow, but the schedule can change due to my duties. Steve will assist with transportation to get you here when it's time for training. Diana replied. Thank you, Dio said and looked at Steve, who stood in the doorway. You're welcome, buddy, Steve smiled in response. Tomorrow, we'll start training with the sword and shield, and then we'll figure out what your unique abilities are and how to control them. I also have an idea on how to train your magical abilities. Diana continued. As if the news about him being a demigod weren't enough, Batman also told him that his mother was a magician. They belong to a parallel line of evolution that separates them from Homo sapiens. Dio remember little about them. The most important thing is that they are born with the ability to manipulate mana as well as a unique type of magic, they can also learn other types of magic without using methods ordinary people use to create magic. Such as special rituals or artifacts. This means Dio is naturally drawn to a certain kind of magic. He should be able to do it easily, but he hasn't tried it yet. Dio knows that magic is very dangerous and that powerful spells cost something. He can't miss this chance to learn it, since Diana is giving it to him. What's the idea Dio asked curiously. My friend is interested in you, but she's busy with her presentations right now, so we'll have to wait a few months. Diana replied. Dio didn't mind waiting a few months for the opportunity to learn magic. That's where you've been Diana, it's rude of you to take on your first student and not introduce me when you bring him here. A female voice drew his attention at the entrance to the room. From behind Steve, a dark-skinned woman with very short hair appeared and was dressed in a gray suit. Sister, it's good to see you back. Diana said that and hugged the woman. I was cleaning up Texas after a sorcerer, I just got back. She said that, broke free from Diana's hug, and smiled at him. Aren't you going to introduce me she asked and looked at me. Of course, this is Diomedes Inwood, my new student. Dio, this is Etta Candy, the second friend I made when I came to this country. Pleasure to meet you, Miss Candy. Dio reached out his hand, but she hugged him instead of shaking his hand. You're so adorable, just like an adult, she said as she swung him from side to side. Etta, please, let go of the boy, he's a demigod, not a mortal. A voice came from Steve and made Etta release him. I'm sorry for that, I was just a bit excited that Diana took a student. Etta said, and Dio noticed that Diana was frowning. Why Dio asked, even though he could see that Diana didn't like this topic. Not that I never wanted to have a student, but I've never liked the idea that we, heroes, train children to fight villains. Too much can go wrong. Diana replied. I know there's a risk, Diana, but I'm still glad you have someone who can understand you. Etta said it with a smile. I'm here, you know, Etta right next to her, Steve said. I didn't know divine blood flowed in your veins, Steve. My apologies. 
Etta joked. Let's stop fooling around. Julia is hosting a dinner in honor of this event, I think we'd better not be late, and both of you are invited as well. Diana ended their conversation with these words. They the ARGUS headquarters and headed to Dio's new home. Left Dio was caught off guard when Diana suddenly yelled. He moved his shield to his hand without thinking, but the attack came from the right, hitting his knee and causing him to fall to the ground. Aya Dio yelled in pain. Why didn't you defend yourself Diana asked as she moved aside so he could stand up. She liked asking such questions when he did something wrong. Why did you suddenly shout Dio replied as he stood up. And why did you believe me while we're training, I'm your enemy. Diana taught him another lesson. Dio didn't answer and assumed the stance she had taught him was sword lowered, shield raised. She had been teaching him different sword and shield styles, but the one he was using now was focused on defense and counterattacks. That's what she was teaching him today. For a few seconds, they simply stared at each other. Dio looked at Diana's legs. She was moving faster than him, and it was hard to see her even when she wasn't using her full speed. The only thing that helped a little was to concentrate on her legs. Diana was dressed in her armor and used a training sword, just like Dio's. It was a Greek-style sword, a Ziphos, relatively short with two straight edges, the blade widening from the hilt to the tip. It was a weapon for both slashing and thrusting through the enemy. She attacked again, and Dio barely had time to see her approaching him. It was a high hit from to right this time, aimed at his right shoulder. He moved his round shield to the right a little and tilted it forward. The Greek shields weren't round and flat plates, the front part stuck out in front, which let an enemy's attack slide off the shield. When her attack hit the shield, he gently pushed her weapon away and used his sword to hit her in the leg to get a counterattack on her. Diana took a small step back, and by the time he got into the right position to attack, she had already raised her sword to his chin. Well done Diana said this and lowered her sword away from his chin, stepping back again. You defended against my strike and managed to start a counterattack. Your movements were almost perfect. You just needed to move faster to initiate the counterattack. Diana continued. Diana, even if I moved ten times faster, you would still be able to avoid it because of your speed. Dio replied, not completely happy with her praise. I've told you, Diomedes, the goal of training isn't to beat me but to learn. So, would you like to try your new trick Diana asked. Since Dio started training three months ago, he has made quite a bit of progress, both physically and in terms of his abilities. It's not as much as he likes, but it's still progress. He pauses for a few seconds and closes his eyes to concentrate. This trick isn't usable in combat yet, it requires too much concentration for him, but that time is decreasing with each of my workouts. Let's begin, Dio said to her after getting ready. Diana charged at me again, but this time, she just lunged at the middle of my shield. There was a black shadow around the shield when her attack hit it. The shadow reached out to her with four skeleton hands. This sudden change of events caught Diana by surprise. Diana's charge changed into a simple strike, shattering two skeletal hands. However, Two others reached out and grabbed her wrists. After raising his shield, he charged Diana with a lunge that hit her in the chest and knocked her back. At this moment, the skeletal hands vanished as if they were evaporating. Diana looked surprised, and Dio was happy that he had finally landed a hit on her during their sparring session. It might be a small achievement, but it showed his progress. Excellent strike, and the way you used your abilities was incredible. Diana said it with pride in her voice. Thank you, Dio replied and breathed heavily. Dio's body didn't tire physically, but using his abilities caused mental fatigue. Dio's perception and reactions became slower as his brain appeared to be blocked. If Dio pushed too hard, his brain would shut down. Once, he was found in that state at home after trying to summon an army of skeletons. The way you used your abilities was impressive. I thought you might summon a skeleton to fight alongside you. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Diana continued. I could, but it wouldn't be very useful against someone like you. Yes, you chose the good strategy. Currently, Dio could summon a skeleton to fight with him, but it had the strength of an average human, which wouldn't be very helpful against Diana or beings more powerful than her. Shall we call it a day it's getting late, and I have Justice League business. 
Diana spoke as she walked toward the rack where our training weapons were kept. Not like I can keep going. Dio said wearily. Have you gotten any answers from Dr. John Peril about your other gift Diana asked as we walked together to the locker room. I'll see him in a while. He was busy with some cases yesterday. Before they parted ways to their respective locker rooms, Diana turned to him and said. My magician friend, the one I mentioned earlier would like to meet you. She'll be back in a few weeks, so if doctor can't help you, she might. Finally, Dio happily replied. I have been waiting to meet this person for a long time. I know it's taking longer than we thought, but I can assure you it'll be worth it. Diana smiled and went into the girl's locker room. Dio took a hot shower. It was a bit unnecessary since he hadn't broken a sweat during the three hours of training, but the feeling of hot water after a long workout was simply incredible. Dio got dressed and headed to the elevator. They always trained in the large gym, which was filled with various weapons and equipment. Diana taught him not only sword fighting but also various hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques and even how to defend himself using bracers. Dio skipped the lasso training, he lacked talent for it. The elevator doors opened on one of the underground floors of the building. Dio stepped out into a corridor with white walls and a clean floor, the scent of chemicals in this place strongly resembles a hospital. He walked down the corridor until he reached the morgue. He opened the door and saw several metal tables against the wall and several small doors where bodies were kept. Dio has been here before, so he is somewhat used to the environment. Dio went to the other end of the room, where there's a door. Instead of knocking, he opened it immediately. It's a small office with a writing desk, a chair, and a computer. A sleeping man sat on the other side of the desk, where a huge pile of papers lay. Dio approached him and gently touched his shoulder, saying, Doctor, it's time to wake up. Hmm. He responds, jerking awake and rubbing his eyes. Dio is it already morning Johnny asked. Dr. John Johnny Peril specializes in researching paranormal phenomena. He met him a few weeks ago. He usually works late into the night, so he asked Dio to wake him up when he arrived. A few moments later, he's fully awake, removed his glasses, and smiled at him. You've come for the results of my research on your new ability. He always asked in a formal way. Did you find anything Dio asked instead of answering? Yes and no, Johnny replied before standing up and walking to a bookshelf on the other side of the room. While Johnny specializes in paranormal phenomena, he doesn't have much practical experience with them. He's neither a magician nor a mystical being. So, everything he learned was obtained from old books and research. He fills in the blanks with science, since that's all he knows. As you know, your magic focuses on areas like necromancy and shadow magic, unfortunately, these are the most important directions to gather information on. But fortunately, not only necromancy deals with ghosts and spirits. He said this as he continued to search through his books. The reason Dio turned to him for help is quite simple, he started seeing ghosts. It began one night as he was walking home from school. He saw something strange between the two buildings. A person standing, holding on to their legs, shivers as if freezing to death. Their clothing was tattered and dirty, they were clearly homeless. Dio walked up to them to see if he could help, but they were shaking too hard for a summer day in the middle of the day. They would only say they were cold when he tried to talk to them. He chose to get medical help because he couldn't communicate with them. But when he turned around, he saw young people staring at him like he was crazy and asking who he was talking to. That made things clear. Dio looked all over the internet and finally found out about the homeless person who died from frostbite in the same place last winter. Dio has been seeing ghosts in different parts of the city ever since. There weren't that many of them, but they all seemed stuck where they died, like they couldn't move or even talk to him. He usually didn't ignore things, so he asked Dr. Peril to help him learn some mystical information about ghosts. I found it Johnny exclaimed joyfully and approached him with two books in his hands. How's your ancient Greek Johnny asked and offered me the first book. Almost nothing, but Julia is teaching me some languages, I can ask her for help. Dio replied and took the black hardcover book with unfamiliar words on the cover. Take this one too, it's more modern and scientific. Johnny said that and handed him another. This one was in English, and it should explain what ghosts are from a scientific perspective. Thank you, doctor. 
Dio replied and took both books. Don't thank me, observing how you use your abilities has also been very helpful to me. Victoria was quite jealous when she heard about it, she wanted the opportunity to study your DNA ever since you arrived here. Victoria October A specialist in biological weaponry at ARGUS Dio hasn't met her personally, but he has heard a lot about her. I have to go, doctor, I still have homework to do, although I hate doing it. Dio said and sighed. Do as I did back in the day, go straight to senior high school or college, it won't be a problem for you. Johnny replied and returned to his chair. The doctor knew that Dio was smarter than his current class, so he always offered to let him skip a few lessons. There are easy ways to skip high school, but Dio needs to go to normal school right now. There isn't much work to do in his class, so he can finish lessons quickly and train. Maybe I'll do that next year, for now, I need to go. Dio replied. Goodbye, boy, Johnny said as he his office. Dio walked back down the corridor to the elevator and went to the top floor, where the hangar is located. Steve is a good guy, and to avoid delaying him or making Diana drive him home every time, he gave him permission to use one of his helicopters for transportation. Dio sat down after saying hello to the pilot and started reading while the chopper took off. The black one was the first one he opened. Of course, he can't read it, but the hand-drawn pictures inside are very helpful. One of the bad things about necromancy is that most of the spells are very scary and involve people dressed in black calling on ghosts to hurt other people. Dio is pretty sure that the book is a story about what ghosts are and how magicians use them to read through its pages. Dio's transport lands at the back of the house. The helicopter he was in was equipped with stealth technology, so no one noticed its arrival. Dio thanked the pilot and went into the house through the back door. Dio was pretty used to this place after living here for a while. The woman who watches over him works at the Smithsonian Museum, so she doesn't spend much time at home during the week. On the weekends, she gives him her full attention. Diana knows a lot about Greek history, but Dio doesn't. When she found out this about him, she lost a bit of interest in him. When Diana suddenly said that he had seen the underworld, it changed everything. She is now waiting for him to learn something new. That wasn't a big deal because Julia wasn't a bad person, she was just really into her work. Dio's relationship with Julia is good, but the same can't be said for her daughter, Vanessa. From day one, he understood that everything she does is a cry for help. After a month of observing her, he finally figured out why. Julia spends a lot of time traveling, and when she's at home, she only does research or learns about Diana. This leaves Vanessa on the sidelines. This is why she was on a path to rebellion. So Dio tried to pay attention to her. In fact, he would be happy to have her as a friend. At first, it worked, even when her mom pushed me away until she learned about the underworld. Dio worked hard for weeks, but it was all over in an instant. Now she won't talk to him, which is a lot worse than when she was with Diana. She still treats Diana like a family member by at least answering her questions and being nice. But she doesn't talk to me at all. Dio looked around the room and then went for the stairs to the second floor. But he stopped when he saw Vanessa sitting on the steps with beer cans around her. Vanessa Dio called out as she looked at him. She was dressed in standard goth clothes, a black shirt with black pants, but her hairstyle had changed, she now had a blue mohawk. What do you want Vanessa asked, and it looked like she was about to fall over. Dio walked up to her, placed down his books to free up his hands, grabbed her hand, made her stand up, and picked her up gently as if she were a princess. Let's go to your bed. Dio said it soothingly. Mm, -mm Vanessa mumbled, as she was already falling asleep on his chest. Dio easily carried her upstairs to her room, opened the door, and got a surprise. Dio was seriously expecting something like Dracula's dungeon, but it turns out her room is filled with pink plush toys and a few posters with Diana's image on the walls. Dio carefully laid her on the bed and covered her. He was about to leave the room when he noticed the diary. Of course, he wouldn't stoop so low as to read a teenager's diary, but one glance at the page was enough for him to read the one she opened, thanks to his enhanced vision. Dear diary, mom forgot my birthday again. There was only one line there. She now feels good about drinking at home and doesn't care about what will happen. Dio thinks it's time to ask Diana for help, as things are getting dangerous. 
Dio picked up a pen lying next to the diary, crossed out her words, and wrote his message. Happy birthday, Vanessa, I hope you'll realize that your happiness depends not on others but on yourself. It sounds cheesy, but he's no poet. Dio her room and returned to the stairs, where his books and her beer cans were lying. Vanessa's mom has already forgotten her birthday, so she definitely doesn't need any more punishment. After getting rid of the teenage crime scene evidence, he took his books and went to the second floor shelves to look for an old Greek dictionary. Obviously, he didn't find one. So, Dio used what he had, a Greek dictionary and an online translator. There wasn't much progress, and when he said slow, he meant four hours of translation and a lot of patience. It wasn't a perfect translation, but it was understandable. What Dio thought at first about the book turned out to be true. He worked on translating parts of a book about ghosts for four hours straight. There are different ways for a necromancer to use souls, but ghosts are not souls at all. It is natural for them to be born that way. They can't be created, a necromancer can steal someone's soul and bind it, but that doesn't turn the soul into a ghost. The book didn't provide any additional information on how they are born, but there were plenty of theories on the internet. The most convincing one was that souls end up trapped in this plane of existence because they unfinished business on earth. The good news is that they are almost harmless. According to the book, that doesn't happen often because some are strong enough to move things or take over human bodies. The book also mentioned that necromancers tame ghosts, not to use them in battle but to curse someone. It seems they can somehow make a ghost torment a person. That's a totally stupid use. If Dio had to use them, it would be for spying, they are perfect secret agents since most beings can't see them, and they are almost impossible to hurt. But their lack of intelligence makes that difficult. Even though these four hours of research finally suppressed my fear of ghosts, Dio still wanted to know what his abilities could do with them. Last time, when Dio encountered the homeless man, he didn't take any action because he was being watched. But now, knowing there's no danger, he can try. Then Dio waited a few more hours, it's not safe to do it before then. The clock strikes midnight after he spends three more hours practicing his magic and doing schoolwork. Finally, midnight. When Julia got home half an hour ago, she skipped the kitchen and went straight to her room. At this very moment, she is lying in bed and calling someone at the museum. Vanessa is still in her room, sleeping. When he uses his super hearing, he feels nervous and like he's doing something wrong, but that feeling quickly fades when he remembers that Superman listens to the entire world almost every day. Dio put on a black jacket, opened his bedroom window, and jumped down from the second floor onto the grass. The window faces the side of the house. There's not much here, just a short corridor and a white fence between Julia's house and the neighbors. Since it was night and the street was dark, Dio let the shadows wrap around him. Dio used to feel uncomfortable in the dark alleys of Gotham, where he committed his robberies. But now that his powers have awakened, darkness seems to be on his side. It hides him in every way possible when he's inside it. That didn't happen by itself, and Diana's increased senses can't find him when he's just standing there in the dark. The ARGUS also did some tests, and they say it looks like he's bound to the darkness in some way. Dio is not good at science, so if anyone asks why, he says it's because of his father. This city isn't like Gotham, where there's a dark alley around every corner. So Dio had to emerge from the darkness. He walked along the city's busy streets, where many people were strolling, meeting, or returning from work. It's still strange to him, this calm city, he's used to the night Gotham, where he could encounter a criminal or a thief on every corner. It didn't take long to reach his destination, the place where he saw his first ghost. There were others nearby, but he intentionally headed toward them. The man was still there, lying on the ground between the two buildings. There were no shops open in those buildings anymore. In addition, no one else was walking around, so it was a great time for a check. If someone did see him, they would probably think he was just taking a break or something. Dio stood facing the man and once again heard his weak voice. So cold, so cold. The man looked around forty, but due to his long beard, it was hard to tell. He just stood there, repeating the same words. He extended his hand and pointed his open palm at his head, about a few inches away. He used the same method as when he summoned the skeletons and relied on his intuition once again. The new sensations rushed over him, 
it felt like a strange connection. He saw the man's memories from a third-person perspective. His life story flashed before him at a very quick pace, like he had fast-forwarded it. Dio caught only a few moments, such as when he was an office worker, until he lost his job for some reason, and things got even worse. He lost his wife and then his home, forcing him to live on the streets. At this point, the memories slowed down and stopped in the normal flow of time, just moments before his death. He was in the same place he was now, with snow covering the streets. From the information he saw, the past winter had been one of the most powerful in the last ten years. The man was trembling from the cold, he could feel his pain and loneliness. Then he died. The memories ended. He took a few steps back and pressed his back against the alley wall. It wasn't as mentally exhausting as summoning skeletons. Instead, he felt what he had felt before his death, not only his physical pain but also his emotions. It wasn't a good experience, and he'll avoid such things unless necessary. What can I do for you? Dio asked aloud. I really want to help him, but I don't know how or if I can. So cold, so cold, the man repeated. Dio knew it might sound silly, but when he said it again, he instinctively took off his jacket and tried to cover him with it. By all laws of physics, the jacket stayed on the old man's body. Then he looked at Dio, and this time he saw clarity in his gaze. Thank you, the man said. After these words, his body began to glow, and he disappeared with a flash of light, leaving his jacket on the ground. What the heck just happened Dio involuntarily asked himself out loud. Of course, Dio didn't find an answer, so he turned and walked back home. After a while, he found himself by his window and jumped, not too high, but enough to grab onto it and get into his room. Dio used his super hearing to check on the situation. Julia was still in her room, but she was already asleep. Vanessa was also in her room, but she wasn't sleeping, she was typing on her computer. It seemed that no one noticed him leaving. Dio laid in bed and thought about what had happened in the alley again. He seemed to understand why the ghost was at peace on his way home. Dio didn't remember anyone helping the man or trying to help him in any of his memories, not even the short ones. That's why all he needed to go to the next life was a simple helping hand. He thought that, but it could be something completely different. There's no point in thinking about it, Dio said as he tried to sleep by closing his eyes. It's very hard, as he never gets tired, but his habits are strong, and he falls asleep quickly. The next day was the same as the ones before it, he got up, brushed his teeth, took a shower, and did breakfast downstairs. Vanessa looked at him a few times while he ate, but Julia stayed quiet and ate while reading the newspaper. He probably didn't say anything to keep her from being embarrassed by the message he for her. Then Dio changed his clothes and went to school. One of the things ARGUS gave him was a bracelet that could change his skin and hair color. This device's purpose is to completely change agent's appearance, but it only changes his skin and hair color. Dio's hair and skin were both white, which drew a great deal of attention, so he changed his skin tone to something more natural and his hair black to divert attention. He didn't pay attention to the other students at school. Instead, he did his homework and waited for class to end. One of the benefits of not feeling tired is that Dio doesn't need to sleep, which means he can study the book all night and be fully prepared for the next day. Dio just needs to check if all this wasn't a waste of time in the first place. Dio crossed his legs over like it said in the book while sitting on the bed and started to focus to clear his mind before he did anything. After a while, he started to think about the magic and how to cast it. The book in front of him is his target. He had been trying for twenty minutes and was about to give up when, on one of his last tries, the book suddenly flew a few centimeters into the air. It's a small achievement, but considering he has only been learning for a few hours, he believed he had a talent for this. This form of telekinesis is an exercise in control. He can't imagine using it in combat, it requires too much attention and concentration, which he can't afford in a battle. There was a chance that he would use the astral projection spell, which separates the spirit from the body, but he decided not to. The book clearly stated that it's dangerous to engage in his own at the beginning, he might end up trapped on some astral plane, or some spiritual entity might capture his soul. Dio would have liked to spend the whole day training, but it's time to go to school. So he closed the book and put it aside. Dio the room and headed to the bathroom to shower, and then, as usual, he went downstairs for breakfast. 
The breakfast went as calmly as usual. Julia was reading her articles while eating, and Vanessa ignored me. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I've taken time off from work. I thought of going on a trip, and since the school holidays are coming soon, why not take both of you on a journey with me Julia said it unexpectedly. This was a big change, she had taken time off. Diana acted quickly, she said she would talk to Julia about the problem, and it seemed Julia agreed to try to help her daughter. Really can I come too Vanessa asked. She was clearly excited, but she was trying hard not to show it. Yes, I've always wanted to take you with me so that you can learn about our ancestors' history, and now I have the opportunity. Julia confirmed and smiled at her daughter. Unfortunately, I won't be able to go. Dio spoke to draw attention to himself. Why Julia asked. Diana found a special teacher for me, and she's a very busy person. She has already agreed to give her free time for my training. Besides, it's better for it to be a trip for mother and daughter, they have the time to reconcile, and they will have a better chance of doing it together. It's a shame, but I won't argue with that. I know how crazy hero schedules can be. Julia replied. The happy mood was short because of breakfast. After that, Dio went to school with the device that ARGUS had given him. However, when he opened the front door of the house, he saw an envelope on the doormat. He saw that it was handwritten and had his name on it, as letters are usually in the mailbox at the front door. Dio opened the letter and read its contents. It was a short letter with an address and a meeting time written by Zatanna. Now, Dio had a meeting time, but the address seemed strange, it was not far from his house. Then Dio went to school and was almost too bored to die. Dio needed to go home, change, and then attend training with Diana. After that, he'll go to training with Zatanna, they've clearly organized his schedule. Today's training with Diana was more informative, as she focused on becoming a hero rather than learning how to fight villains. She began by teaching me the basics of first aid, then moved on to human physiology in similar races. There are many races in the universe, so knowing the most dangerous and famous ones is important. So, Dio returned home and immediately went to the address mentioned in the letter. Surprisingly, he saw the same house as when they were in Gotham. Zatanna's house can teleport. I'm beginning to love magic. Stop staring like an idiot at the house and come in Zatanna shouted from one of the windows of the house. Dio approached the house, and the door opened by itself. He entered and followed the same corridor as yesterday, ending up in the living room. He saw Zatanna in the same clothes as yesterday and stood in the middle of the room. However, the room had changed today, and the furniture had disappeared, leaving a huge empty area. How was your first magical book Zatanna immediately asked. It was amazing Dio replied, as he was unable to hide his excitement. Have you tried anything else Satana asked while still scrutinizing me. Only telekinesis. I was afraid to try astral projection without guidance. Now I feel this was a test, so I answer honestly. It seems he made the right choice again, and when he gave his answer, her emotionless face softened. You passed the second test, Zatanna said. Okay, but could you tell me what it was Dio asked? You know, a lot of new magicians end up hurting themselves by trying to cast spells that are too advanced for their level of experience. It's usually because they don't have enough knowledge. Are you saying that if I had tried astral projection, the same chance would have happened to me, and you gave me the book knowing this, maybe learning magic from Zatanna isn't as safe as I thought? Instead of answering, Zatanna started laughing. After a few seconds, while still chuckling and seeing that Dio was still serious, she stopped and replied. Of course not, you silly. The book is enchanted. If you had tried to use projection near it, it would have sent me a signal. Should I continue studying the basics Dio asked. Of course, and then we'll move on to studying the most commonly used forms of magic. I thought I should focus on my own magic. Zaratana didn't answer, she just smiled, opened her arms, and said it out loud. M.O.T. Amok Skub L.L.A. All books come to me. A book tornado instantly formed around Zatanna as books of all sizes and kinds started to fly around her. Do you know what makes a magician strong Zatanna began to ask. Dio stepped back a bit to avoid getting hit by a book and replied. No. It's their adaptability. A good magician learns to master their magic 
but a master not only masters their own but all others and after such a spectacular demonstration, Dio will finally begin studying magic. Three years had passed since the beginning of the training, both physically and spiritually. A lot has happened in the last three years, but only two things are important enough to talk about. The first was Dio's magical training with Satana. When she told him they would start studying a bit of everything, she wasn't kidding. He spent literally a year just reading about various branches of magical spells. In the beginning, he agreed with Satana that a magician should have a lot of knowledge, but his patience was truly tested during that year. He almost went against her orders to try to improve his magic on his own, but he didn't do it, or else he would have failed another of Zatanna's tests. Finally, after a year buried in books, they began to study what he could do, which wasn't easy. Dio started by learning mystical arts similar to his power, such as necromancy, voodoo, and curses. It was hard to learn necromancy and voodoo as they are so different from each other. He found studying curses to be rather easy because they are extremely similar to necromancy. He had already mentioned that he found necromancy to be pretty dark for him. He learned a lot of spells, but he never tried to use any of them. The same is true of voodoo, it's not a dark art, but it depends on the lower deities, and at the moment, he's not particularly confident in negotiating with gods right now. Now, curses were a nice and pleasant surprise. He could now curse someone to die, or he could simply curse them with bad luck. However, he needed to make an offering of equal value in order to make a curse strong enough to kill. It's only the cost of small curses that he can handle without feeling guilty about them. He had learned enough about the dark arts by the end of the second year, so they started trying his abilities with what he had learned. He had a big surprise when he began training. He was glad he had spent the last two years learning new things. When he started creating his own spells, they came easily to him. When he learned that he could make his own spells, he wasn't sure which path to follow. Dio has to focus on one path and follow it. He can train and create only long-range spells, becoming a true Arpeak-style magician. He could also take a more assassin-like path by focusing on shadow magic to hide and attack by turning into a shadow, or he could just focus on conjuration and summon multiple skeletons to fight for him. This didn't seem like a good choice for him. He wouldn't get any use out of the training he got from Diana if he became a long-range magician or an assassin, since they use very different fighting styles. He knew how conjuration or summoning could be used, but it could also be seen as a form of long-range attack. There are good choices, and each has its own benefits and drawbacks. So why not work on the benefits of all of them the result would be a combat mage, but that description still wasn't quite right. So he started working on it. In the future, he'll have more than enough time to study and create more spells in other areas. While his magical training was progressing well, he didn't forget the importance of physical training with Diana. Over the years, Dio's physical stats have grown. It wasn't as explosive as the first time he awakened his powers, so he didn't need time to adjust. After three years, Dio's strength, speed, endurance, and senses had almost tripled. There is no way to be sure of this number, but this is how he felt. ARGUS didn't have any equipment to check Diana's and my strength, but it was fun for him to easily lift cars around and over his head. The fun part was watching the truck drivers think they had been robbed. It wasn't just Diana and Zatanna who taught him. Dr. Johnny Peril gave him several lessons on occultism, and Dr. Victoria October gave him some lessons on genetics and biology in exchange for a few vials of my blood. Etta Candy and Steve Trevor gave him lessons on military weaponry and tactics. Dio got really close to both of them. Dio believes this can summarize his progress in training over these three years without going into too many details. It's easy to train compared to his social life. There were no problems during the first year. Julia went on vacation with Vanessa during all of the school breaks, leaving the house to Diana, Etta, Steve, Diana, and Dio. They took turns taking care of him. The trip seemed to have accomplished its purpose when they got back. The mother and daughter were very close. Dio doesn't know if Vanessa forced herself to learn about history to get closer to her mother, but it did help them get along better. She kept her promise and didn't work from the museum for a while, but she got bored and started working from home while Vanessa was at school. They would have plenty of time to spend the rest of the day this way. There's nothing wrong with Julia working. What's important is that she learned how to balance her work and her time with her daughter. It seemed like she had finally learned that. 
She also stopped talking too much about Diana or him, which helped her daughter's confidence heal as well. Diana was also staying away and only showed up sometimes. After five months, Julia went back to her bad habits. She was called to excavate some ancient ruins recently found in Greece, and she accepted. Dio knew she wasn't going to be there for a month, but she told her daughter that was the explanation. Dio saw hope and happiness fade from Vanessa's face when one month turned into two and three. He tried to help the girl, they got a bit closer during the time her mother was at home, but she pushed him away again, just like the first time. The situation worsened over time. It reached a point that made Dio act as a hero for the first time. Flashback Dio returned home after his class with Satana, and it was almost midnight. Their classes have very random schedules, but he doesn't mind since he doesn't get physically tired, and he knows the value of time for a magician like her. He's in a good mood. He managed to create his first spell, and he learned how to use a somewhat unpleasant but non-lethal Greek curse. So he walked calmly and enjoyed the quiet surroundings of the streets leading to my house. This street is a residential area, so most people are already asleep. The fact that a child is walking alone on the street at this hour would not cause any of the neighbors to call the police. He could simply shadow travel home, but it's quite exhausting, and as he mentioned, he's in a good mood. After a few minutes, he arrived in front of his house, took the key out of his pocket, opened the door, and stepped inside. She's gone again, Dio said it out loud as he entered. Vanessa is getting more and more out of control while Julia is still traveling. She went to school and returned early in the morning, smelling like alcohol. When Dio had free time, he followed her to her parties and watched her from afar, just in case something went wrong. Dio's efforts to help her have not been successful so far, and there hasn't been anything very serious that has happened. It might be time for him to step in and help. Dio went to the kitchen and made a sandwich for himself. After eating, he went upstairs, took a shower, and headed straight to his room. When he turned on the light, he was startled. There's someone in his room. Dio immediately thought the person was a murderer, as he didn't hear anyone when he arrived home, not even a heartbeat. But he quickly dismissed that idea. The woman in front of him is clearly a ghost because her body is somewhat ghostly and her clothes are torn and stained with blood. Dio can't see her face properly because her messy hair covers it, but he can see marks of injuries on the visible parts of her face. Can you speak Dio asked out loud. The situation is strange. A ghost had never come to find him. All the ones he encountered in the city were usually restricted to a specific location. So what makes her different can you talk Dio asked again, but he didn't get a response. She just keeps staring at him without moving. He knew what he needed to do to find out why she was here. Dio still remembered the sensation of feeling the emotions at the moment of the homeless man's death, whom he helped. But, as he mentioned, a ghost has never come to find him. So he believed it was worth finding out the reason. Dio approached her and put his hand over her head, a few inches away. Then he felt the connection. It was different from the first time but easy, and he supposed it was because of his mystical training. This has enhanced his control over his demigod abilities a bit, or maybe it's his magical ability. To be honest, it's hard to tell which is which. The ease with which he established the connection wasn't the only change. He was also gaining more control over the memories he was seeing. The first time, he could only watch a fast forward of the person's life, stopping only at the moment of their death. Now, he has more control over what he wants to see in their life memories. As he watched the girl's life happen before his eyes, he gathered some information about her. Her name was Sarah, and she lived a bit far from here. Dio was sure she was a good person based on what he had seen so far. He skipped over her memories until he stopped when he saw that she went to the same school as Vanessa. Dio didn't want to waste time watching every single day of her life. This created a sense of urgency to understand how she died. So he fast-forwarded even more and reached the day of her death. It was an ordinary day, she went to school. The girl was very shy and didn't have any friends at school, but she didn't suffer any bullying. At the end of the school day, she was approached by another teenage girl dressed in a gothic style. This girl invited Sarah to a party later, and Sarah was so delighted that she returned home with a skip in her step. That night, she went to the party. She quickly understood that the party was too wild for her, as there were drugs and drunk people everywhere. 
Then her new friend showed up and started talking to her. After an hour, the friend brought her a beer. Sarah didn't want to seem boring, so she only took a sip. Suddenly, she looked like she was drunk. It didn't matter what amount of alcohol she could handle, one sip shouldn't have made her feel this way. The other girl clearly gave Sarah drugs, and when she saw that they worked, she started pulling Sarah out of the house and into the street. Their final destination was a house for sale near Julia's house. When the teenager knocked on the door, it was opened by another man wearing a black hood. He kissed the teenager on the mouth, smiled at her, and then took Sarah inside the house, leaving the person who drugged her outside. There were three other men in the house. What happened next wasn't good, and he's not ashamed to say he skipped to the end. In the morning, the four of them, and Sarah woke up. She remembered what had happened, and very hurt, she tried to leave that house on the way home due to the beating she received from one of the people who found it pleasurable to hit her face. A car struck Sarah after she tripped, fell off an overpass, and hit the ground. The feeling of pain, abandonment, and anger he experienced at the moment of her death is something Dio hopes never to feel again. He almost broke the connection because of it, but he set aside all that he felt to process later and continued to see her memories. There must be a reason for her being here. After Sarah's death, the cops did not find the four teens, three guys and a woman. She really wanted something, so she stayed with these four and followed them. Finally, she remembered that the girl who had drugged her had asked Vanessa to come to a party tonight. The party started an hour ago. Sarah didn't keep following the girl after she saw that another girl would end up like she did. She wanted to get help, but since she was a ghost, she didn't have many choices. It's a good thing she came to him. Now Dio knows that Sarah doesn't seek revenge, she wants to ensure that another girl doesn't suffer what she went through. In the name of all the gods, no one will touch Vanessa today. It's not a time for panic or reckless actions, so he calmed down and thought about how to find Vanessa. Dio has to find the party's venue. In fact, it would take too long for him to look up all the teen parties in the city on the internet, and Vanessa might already have been taken out of the party since she was high. So, the only way to find her quickly is to use magic. Zatanna already showed him a simple location spell, but he didn't pay much attention to it and didn't train in it. He rushed out of his room and went to Vanessa's room. Dio's not soft, he kicked the door, broke it in half, and entered. He looked in all directions and found her hairbrush. He grabbed it and rushed down to the ground floor, the farthest part of the house, a room filled with books. There are books scattered throughout the house, but these are the least used by Julia. Dio comes here a lot, so it didn't take him long to find an old map of their area. The map is outdated, many new places have been built in the areas it shows as empty. However, it's still important to have a plan. Dio the room and went to the kitchen. There, he placed the open map on the table and pulled out strands of hair from Vanessa's hairbrush, holding them in his two hands. He concentrates before trying the spell. He hadn't practiced it before, but it's simple tracking magic, so it should work. He just has to hope his emotional state doesn't affect his spell. After a few seconds with his eyes closed, Dio took a deep breath and said. Sigma Tau Omicron Nu Omicron Nu Alpha Lambda Omega Nu Tau Omega Nu Theta Epsilon Nu, Delta Epsilon Xi Epsilon Nu Omicron Upsilon Tau Iota Psi Chi Nu Omega, in the name of all the gods, show me what I seek, Dio casts his spells in Greek due to his heritage, which makes them happen more easily. Dio kept staring at the map, and after a few seconds, with nothing happening, he thought he had failed. But then his hands joined in front of his body and became enveloped in red flames, the flames burned Vanessa's hair within his hand. After that, a small red flame quickly appears and disappears on the map. The fire goes out and leaves only a burned spot on the map. Vanessa's Location Dio took the map, folded it, and put it in his pocket, along with the hairbrush. He cast the same spell again when he reached his destination, since she may be moving. Now that everything was ready, he ran over to the switch and turned off the lights. When it's dark in the kitchen, the shadows wrap around him and take him somewhere else. He learned how to move through shadows by chance. He can use the shadows to travel from one place to another. He doesn't need to be dark to do this, but it is easier when it is. He can teleport as far as 500 meters away right now. This isn't something he can use more than once, and it affects his body. It feels like he's a human again, 
and he runs the distance his body took him as quickly as possible. Dio appeared in an alley 500 meters away from his home, ignored the fatigue, and jumped again. He had to use the teleportation four times to reach his destination. When the fourth jump ended, he leaned against the wall to avoid falling to the ground. It was the first time he felt so tired since he awakened his powers. Dio looked around and saw that he was beside a house. He wanted to hide, so he sat down on the ground, pulled out the map, and cast the same location spell. Vanessa has moved a bit, only a few meters from the first location. The map is old, so it doesn't show the streets accurately, but he knows she's close, and that's enough. He stood up and ran in her direction. Within seconds, he arrived at his destination, which was in the middle of a private street with white lawned homes that looked beautiful. The lights are still on in the houses, even though it's late. He has to find the right house now, so he keeps running past the houses and trying to find it. He doesn't have to look for long before he finds the one that's probably right, a house for sale. Sarah was also thrown to the wolves in one of these, and the lights inside and the laughter he hears make him even more sure. He stood by the door and thought about teleporting inside. He walks down the hall after appearing on the other side of the door. He sees Vanessa and four young people in the middle of the room. Vanessa is lying in the middle of the room on the floor. They've pushed the couch and armchairs aside to create space. She appears fine despite being drugged and in a semi-conscious condition. There are no signs of anyone touching her clothes, so nothing has happened yet. It's only because of this that Dio stopped tearing the heads off the four of them. The four teenagers are wearing regular clothes, sitting around Vanessa, drinking beer, and laughing like idiots while looking at her. This makes Dio's blood boil. Shall we begin one of them asked. Begin what Dio allowed himself to be noticed. The four of them jump out of their seats. They stood up and looked at me with their idiotic faces. Kid, what the hell are you doing here one of them shouts at him. I don't know if it's because I'm a little shorter than them or because I'm alone, but the four of them get over their nervousness and decide I'm not a threat. The one who shouted at him is around 18 years old, has short hair, and is a bit fat. It's better not to say anything. I'm already restraining myself from tearing the four of you apart. Dio said to them. He must be a friend of this girl. We have to deal with him now before he tries to run. A boy was bald and dressed in black. It seems like my threat wasn't taken seriously because of his age. He doesn't want to do this the easy way anyway. Dio started walking slowly in their direction. Come here, kid the short-haired one also comes toward me. Don't kill them, stay in control. Don't kill them, stay in control. Dio repeated this in his mind like a mantra to keep from losing control of his strength. The short-haired one finally stood before him and put his hand on his shoulder, smiling at him. The moment his fingers touched Dio's shoulder, he grabbed the collar of his shirt and, with a simple motion, threw his body to the as if he were a garbage bag. Bam Haia the teenager's body crossed the entire room and crashed onto the wooden kitchen table in the room, which shattered. The wood of the table hit his leg, which hurt so much that he screamed. What the hell was that finish him, Steve the two of them shouted and watched his actions. The guy who must be called Steve was the bald one. He pulled out a Swiss army knife with a small blade and attacked him. He just pushed the small knife into him and tried to hit him in the gut. The knife didn't hit him as he turned his body to the side. Dio hit him on the elbow with his open hand, as he had his wrist in him. Crack the crack in his bone was very loud, and his arm looked like a stick that had been broken. However, he did not scream in pain, and his nose was broken when Dio spun around and hit him in the face with his elbow before he could do that. The second one fell to the ground and was almost knocked out. He's a monster, let's run the third one shouted and turned his body toward the living room window. Being called a monster by trash like you is not enjoyable. Dio just stood there until he reached the window. He walked across the whole room in less than a second after putting his foot on it to jump. Dio grabbed his shirt and pulled him back inside the house before he could even think about jumping. When he tried to get up, Dio kicked him in the face, which made him roll across the floor until he hit the wall across from him. Only one. Dio said to the last one. He hasn't moved like the other three since he dealt with the second, who was undoubtedly the most cowardly. Dio walked up to him, stood in front of his face, and looked into his eyes. I remember you, Dio said. 
This guy is the boyfriend of the girl who drugged Sarah and Vanessa. He was also the one who beat her for pleasure. You like hitting defenseless women, don't you? Dio asked. He didn't have time to respond, and his hand had already covered his mouth. Crack 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 Dio clenched his jaw, breaking it, and he squirmed and tried to free himself from his grip, but it was futile. After feeling all the bones and teeth in his mouth shatter, he let go of him. He fell to the floor and vomited blood and his teeth. He'll definitely never eat anything solid again. After vomiting his own teeth, the last one passed out from the pain. Dio turned away and ignored him, running straight for Vanessa, who was on the floor. It's all right now, Dio spoke to her and used his calmest voice. She had her eyes open and was crying, but she still couldn't move. Dio placed two fingers on her forehead and said, Upsilon Pinuomicron, sleep, she quickly fell asleep. This was a simple spell to make someone sleep, but because it was quite basic, it often didn't work. However, since she was drugged, her resistance wasn't very high. With Vanessa asleep, he looked at the mess he had made. Dio still had to make them pay for what they did to Sarah. Dio went to the first one he had thrown into the kitchen. He was crawling on the floor and trying to escape through the kitchen door. Dio grabbed him by the neck and punched him, causing him to fall asleep. Then he wiped his fingers with his blood and drew a pentagram with Greek letters on his forehead. He repeated the same process for all four of them. When his art was complete, he closed his eyes and concentrated until he could conjure his next spell. Theta Epsilon Tau Eta Epsilon Kappa Delta Kappa Eta Sigma Eta Sigma Alpha Kappa Alpha Lambda Nu Alpha Epsilon Kappa Pi Lambda Eta Rho Sigma Epsilon Tau Epsilon Tau Eta Nu Epsilon Pi Iota Theta Upsilon Nu Alpha Tau Omicron Upsilon Theta Mu Alpha Tau Omicron Omega Tau Omicron Upsilon Epsilon Pi Iota Tau Epsilon Upsilon Chi Theta Epsilon Delta Iota Kappa Alpha Iota Omicron Sigma Nu Eta Goddess of Revenge, I call upon you to fulfill the victim's desire until justice is achieved, this time, it wasn't a spell but a curse. As soon as he finished casting it, the circle on their heads began to glow red and then disappeared completely. She the sound of something sizzling in the fire came from his hand and palm, the same pentagram he drew on the idiot's heads. This was the price for using the curse. It was nothing he couldn't endure, and the burn would disappear once the curse was fulfilled. He looked around and saw that Sarah's ghost had appeared in the house. She was looking at the bodies of the four. This curse would fuel Sarah's strength, and she would torment the four as if they were in their own horror movies. This would continue until they took responsibility for their actions or went crazy. Sarah would get what she deserved either way. Dio returned to the center of the room and picked up a cell phone from one of the idiot's pockets. He dialed the ambulance and told them the address. He didn't want any of these idiots to die from their injuries, he wanted them to live and suffer for a long time. Then he went to Vanessa and held her in his arms. Before leaving, he looked at Sarah again and said, have fun. Dio took Vanessa back home on foot since shadow teleportation consumed double the energy when taking someone with him. He laid her on his bed and waited for her to wake up, which happened the next day. Diomedes, you. No, Dio interrupted her. She woke up a few seconds ago and remembered what almost happened yesterday. After that, she just sat there and looked at me with tear-filled eyes. Starting today, when you finish school, you'll come with me to ARGUS for training. Dio said to her. But I, Vanessa tried to speak. No, Dio stopped her again. After physical training, the two of us will go to Zatanna's house. While I train in magic, you'll be studying and doing your homework. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. I don't want. Vanessa tried to say something. I don't care what you want. They say you can't save someone from themselves. They might be right, but I'll do my best to ensure that what almost happened yesterday never happens again. I don't care about your opinion on this, you will follow me. When Dio mentioned what almost happened yesterday, she started to cry. Dio stood up from the chair he was sitting in front of the bed and sat beside her. Vanessa jumped into his arms and hugged him. End of flashback it worked better than expected for Dio to try to get Vanessa to be closer to him, even if it meant using force. It didn't take long for her to develop an interest in learning how to fight with him and Diana. At night, she also became quite interested in magic. As she wasn't a homo magi, she would have to rely on other artifacts to use magic. 
Zatanna gave her one of these artifacts, and she can now perform some basic spells. Their relationship has also grown a lot, and now they are as close as siblings. Vanessa has even started to act like an older sister. Their relationship with her mother is now completely broken. When Julia returned home, she tried to reconnect with her daughter, but Vanessa wouldn't let her. However, Vanessa hasn't returned to her old ways. The issue with the boys he confronted was also important. The three of them are still in the hospital, and the one with minor injuries is already in prison. It took less than a week for all four of them to turn themselves into the police and end the curse. All four will be arrested when they are in better condition. The girl who drugged Sarah and Vanessa is also in custody. The authorities also investigated the little lesson Dio gave them, but as he wasn't using any disguise, there was no way for them to connect him to everything. It's not easy to find a young person with white hair walking around. Diana wasn't very happy with how he handled the situation. She said he went too far, and she was worried he was crossing a line. It took some time to make her forget what happened and calm down. On the other hand, Zatanna found that what he did to the four boys was good. She didn't care about their injuries and even said he should have castrated them. That woman is frightening, and he felt sorry for Constantine. So time passed peacefully until one day, when Diana told him it was time for my final test to graduate from the training. Dio doesn't know what the test will be, but he's sure it won't be easy. That's cheating, Dio Vanessa said while smiling at him. There's no such thing as a fight. Dio replied and was also smiling. Vanessa and Dio were in the backyard of the house, and they were training. They usually did this at ARGUS with Diana, but today was the day she would take him for his test, so he got the afternoon off with Vanessa. But they had been training almost every day for three years, so having the afternoon off felt weird. This made them bored, so they went back to training. The backyard isn't very wide, so they were fighting in a Greco-Roman wrestling match, a fighting style that aims to take down their opponent and immobilize them. Vanessa was teasing him as he used his powers to teleport behind her and take her down. It was just a playful move, and she knew it. Vanessa has changed a lot since they started hanging out. She returned to her natural blonde hair and let it grow to shoulder length. She also dropped the gothic makeup style. She often smiles when she's with me or talking to Diana and her little crush, but they won't talk about that. That's the most noticeable change in her. After their little play, they got a bit more serious. They were circling each other with their bodies low and their arms raised. Then she came to Dio and put her arms around his neck, forcing his head down toward her body. Dio certainly has more physical strength than her, but he's holding back, making it a battle of pure skill. Dio tried to break free from her grip by moving backward, but she pulled him back toward her, and her leg went behind him, trying to take him down. When he felt her leg, he twisted his body to the side, which caused them to fall on the grass. He managed to escape from her. She jumps on top of him, wrapping her legs around his torso and her arms around his neck like a koala. Dio twisted his body on the ground, pushed his arms, and made her hit her back on the grass, which made her release him. Now, it was her turn to try to escape from him, but he held her by the waist and lifted her off the ground. In the air, he spun her body and then let her go, which caused her to fall backward on the ground. Dio quickly climbed on top of her and held her down. What are you two doing Julia asked from the door of the house and looked at us on the ground as they paused their fight. Dio laughed and got off Vanessa, then extended his hand, which she accepted and helped her stand up. We were practicing Greco-Roman wrestling, mom. You should know that as an expert. Vanessa replied, her face showing her displeasure toward her mother. Vanessa not only changed her behavior with him and Diana but also with her mother, but not in a positive way. Vanessa was keeping some distance from her mother. She wasn't being rude, but she also wasn't treating her like a close relative either. Julia wasn't expecting her daughter to not give her another chance when she came back from vacation. She was used to that happening every time she her alone. Julia tried to make things right with Vanessa, but Vanessa wouldn't give her any more chances. It made her a little angry with Dio over time as she saw the new bond they had made. I've noticed that Vanessa, but do you really need to dress like that Julia continued. They were both dressed perfectly for sports. She was wearing a sports bra that showed her stomach and black shorts. She worked out almost every day, which is why she had a beautiful body with good measurements and a bust that wasn't too big. 
On the other hand, Dio didn't have a shirt on. He worked out for three years and got to the size of a teenager. He had no fat, and his muscles were well defined. Julia's words were clearly aimed at causing trouble. Dio won't lie and say that Vanessa isn't attractive, but after spending three years training with two of the most attractive women in the DC universe, he is almost immune to attractive women. Disgusting, mom. Dio is my brother. Vanessa replied, but her face showed that she wasn't happy about what she said. Just as he had become immune to female beauty, she had become almost immune to his attractiveness. Shall we call it a day Dio asked Vanessa. Sure, it's almost time for her to arrive. She wasn't wrong. Dio looked up and saw Diana flying in their direction. In fact, she just arrived, Dio said it out loud as Diana landed in front of them. Dio, Vanessa, and Julia, Diana greeted them. You arrived quite early, Diana, Dio remarked, as there were still two hours before the agreed time. I knew you wouldn't rest like I told you to because I know you. It looks like I was right. Diana responded. Training at this hour has become a habit. I feel uncomfortable if I don't. Dio explained. I feel the same way, Diana responded with a smile. Diana, where are you taking Dio? Vanessa asked, as she was just as curious about the test as Dio. I'm taking him to the labyrinth. Diana answered him and finally revealed the location of his test. Labyrinth both Vanessa and Dio asked in surprise. Of course, they didn't know what the labyrinth was, but it seems that Julia did. When Diana mentioned it, her eyes began to sparkle. Diana, is the labyrinth really real? Julia asked excitedly, with her glasses continuously moving like a nervous tick. Yes, my friend, the labyrinth is real. Diana confirmed and looked at her. I would love to see it and study it. Julia continued. I wouldn't advise that. The reason the location of the labyrinth is unknown is that anyone who found it and entered it did not come out alive. Now I'm a bit hesitant about this test. And you're taking Dio to that place Vanessa asked and seemed to be worried about him since she was the only one who was worried. Julia is just disappointed that she can't see the labyrinth. I'll be with him the whole time, don't worry. Diana reassured her. Then I'll get ready. I can't let whatever is waiting for me catch me unprepared. Dio said this and went to the entrance of the house. I couldn't describe your test better, Diana comments from behind me. Dio went right to his room to get his equipment. He doesn't have a superhero suit or anything. The things that Dio uses are a shield, a Zippo's sword, and a Greek breastplate. He put on the breastplate, which covers his torso, and made it a perfect fit for his body. Dio strapped the circular shield, the same bronze color as his armor, to his back and secured his sword. Before leaving, he almost forgot his latest creation, a belt, a more magical version of Batman's utility belt, it was created with expansion magic in the pockets. The space isn't very big, just a few inches, but that's far enough for now. The black police-style belt had a few small holes around it. It didn't match with the sword and armor, but Dio will think more about how it looks when he creates his hero outfit. Dio jumped out of the window and walked to the back of the house, where the three women were still waiting. Ready Diana asked him. Let's go. There were no farewells. Diana grabbed Dio and began to fly at high speed. She went even faster when they the city and reached the ocean. She controlled her speed to avoid causing damage to the city, but over the ocean, her speed easily broke the speed of sound. While it wasn't bad for his body, it was awful for his ears. When she broke the speed of sound, he wasn't prepared, and he couldn't hear for a few minutes. They got to a forest at the end of their flight. It was different from any forest he had seen in his two lives. It looked very old like no one had ever been there before. The magical energy in this place was four times stronger than in the city. Diana didn't say anything during the trip or when they arrived. Dio followed her silently through the forest. It didn't take long for them to arrive at their destination. The entrance was right in the middle of a millennium-old tree. Diana approached and pushed aside the vines that covered the view of the entrance, and she entered. Dio followed immediately. He was surprised to find a stone staircase. Are you ready? Diana asked again before entering. Of course, Dio said to her while pulling his sword and shield. Then let's go. They walked slowly through the place. 
Dio was quite sure they were in another dimension because he couldn't see how excavating such a vast location would be possible. There weren't many people around, and the only signs of Greek statues were a few broken stones here and there. It's time for me to get some information about this place, Diana. Dio asked her. This is the labyrinth of Deadless, a living place full of dangers. Diana finally replied. Are you going to make me fight the Minotaur? Dio asked again. Dio knew a lot about Greek tales and legends as he was Greek. He knew that the Cretan labyrinth, also called Deadless Labyrinth, was made to contain the Minotaur, monster with the body of a man and the head and tail of a bull. That Minotaur died a long time ago, but the labyrinth continues. Then she started running toward an arch-shaped opening in front of them. Let's go, we have to be agile, Diana shouted. Dio also started running towards the entrance and stayed two meters away from Diana. He knew this was his test, but going ahead of her to prove how much he had grown could lead to a terrible result. As soon as they passed through the stone arch, the attack began. It was four meters high minotaurs made of pure stone that came out of the walls and hit them. He jumped back to avoid being hit by the two in front of him. Dio placed his sword on his back, it wasn't a magical weapon or made of any special material, so if he used it to cut stone, there was a chance of losing his weapon. Looking to the side, Diana was already fighting, and he saw her hit one of the stone monsters in the chin. The stone minotaur in front of him tried to grab him, but Dio teleported above its head and kicked its face with all his strength. The stone cracked but didn't break. While still in the air, he looked to the side and saw a stone hand coming towards him. Dio rotated his body, and the stone hand grabbed his shield. He let go of it, fell to the ground, and faced the second stone. BMM then one of the stone monsters that was fighting Diana was thrown into the one in front of Dio. Run Diana said to him and then turned and started running. Dio followed her after picking up his fallen shield. One of the stone's minotaurs stood in front of him and tried to grab him. He sped up and fell backward, sliding on the stone floor and passing under its legs. On the other side, he stood up and ran away, leaving their enemies behind. The four stone attackers turned into dust on the ground after they ran a few meters. The goal of the test is to reach the end of the labyrinth, not to defeat its creations. Diana said while running ahead of him. She was right. Dio had been seeing it as if it were an RPG game, where to advance to the next level and needed to defeat the boss on the floor. They continued running on the stone floor, and then he heard a small sound with his super hearing. It was the sound of a bowstring being pulled. Dio was used to this sound, Diana had trained him to dodge arrows using a bow first. Be careful Diana yelled. There were hundreds of arrows being fired at the same time from both sides of the area. He carefully avoided the arrows that were aimed at him and ignored others, which was hard to do because there were so many of them. This situation worsened and the straight path ahead turned into rough terrain with many rocks scattered throughout the place, making it hard to see the arrows. However, he was able to hide behind this terrain, and when he couldn't get away, he used his shield to protect himself while maintaining his speed. Jump Diana yelled in front of him. Once again, she helped him. He had been so focused on the arrows that he didn't notice the rift in front of him. He jumped over the edge, which was about 10 meters wide. On the other side of the rift, they found themselves facing a Greek temple with two entrances. The first one was well maintained for an abandoned place, and there were torches on the walls that lit up the whole path. The second path was different from the first. It was covered in pure darkness, but Dio could easily see the way. The entrance was a perfect replica of the other, the only difference being the lighting. Which way towards the darkness or the light Diana asked from his side? You've been here before, so you should choose. Dio replied. The labyrinth changes with each visit. Diana responded. Of course, it changes. Now, which path to choose I would have gone down the dark path if I were alone. The darkness is on my side, and the risks I'd face there wouldn't really hurt me if they used darkness to fight. But I'm not alone. Diana may be trained to fight without her vision, but it would reduce her abilities. Let's go towards the light. Dio decided. Diana smiled at him and continued running down the light path, and he followed her. The path isn't very wide, only a few meters. The entire structure is made of large white stones, with small torches above the walls lighting the way. They both walk slowly this time, so as not to set off any traps. 
BAMM then the ceiling above them opened, and several people fell in front of them. They were all wearing complete bronze-colored Greek armor, helmets covering their faces, and holding spears, swords, and bows. There was no talking, they just attacked them. He bent down at first so that the shooters behind the Greek could shoot arrows over his head. Then he teleported away and ignored the Greek that was coming toward him. He reappeared behind the ten archers, who didn't even turn to attack him. He swung his sword and beheaded the two of them. The only thing that came out of their necks was a black mist. These individuals' heads and bodies turned into smoke when they hit the ground. These black clouds didn't disappear, instead, they spread to other people and entered their bodies. Dio jumped backward to try to figure out what happened. The eight archers then turned to him and started shooting. They were a little faster than before. He ran at them while holding his shield out in front of him. When he got in front of them, he cut the third archer in half with his shield. He jumped and rolled on the ground to dodge another attack. When he stood up, he faced the next enemy, whom he hit with his shield, crushing their skull. After these deaths, which happened in a few seconds, the same result happened again. The bodies turned into mist, which was absorbed by those who were still. Dio looked ahead and saw that his time was up. While one group of soldiers turned around and came towards him, the other group kept fighting Diana, who wasn't killing them but using her bracelets to protect herself from their attacks. Dio quickly understood that if he killed one of them, the others would become stronger, so the best way to win was to stop them without killing them. He jumped over any warriors that were in his way as he ran toward Diana. He jumped at them, used the wall of the hallway as a trampoline to get over them, and landed a few inches from Diana. I have a plan, but you have to stay behind me, Dio said to her. Diana nodded and stepped back with him for a few meters so that all the enemies gathered. When that happened, Diana stayed behind him, and Dio advanced. Dio kneeled in front of the warriors with his sword held down and plunged it into the ground. He would normally try to end the fight with magic, but it's getting too hard for him to do so at this point. He doesn't know how far he has to walk to get to the end, but he has to take the chance. Epsilon Pi Iota Kappa Alpha Lambda Omicron Mu Alpha Iota Tau Omicron Kappa Rho Omicron Tau Eta Theta Lambda Psi Eta Tau Omicron Upsilon Pi Omicron Tau Alpha Mu Omicron Cosite, I summon the cold of sorrow from the river Cositis, he was holding the sword when a black mist that looked like tar rose up and moved toward the warriors. They all freeze when it runs through their feet. Now, all the soldiers are frozen up to their knees. The people then try to break free by hitting the ice with their weapons. Those who break the ice in their legs also break their own legs, so they have to crawl on the ground. Your magical abilities are getting more powerful. Diana said as she stood by my side. Thank you. This is one of his personal spells that he created, and he made a few others using the same system. The river Cositis is one of the rivers that flow through the entire underworld, and his spells can summon some parts of the underworld, like the cold of the cries ailing from the river of wailing. At the moment, he can only summon a bit of its true power, but it's enough to give him confidence in being a hero. Let's go, we can't stay still for too long. Diana then said to him. She started running toward the warriors, and when she got close to them, she jumped over them, and Dio also followed. They exit the temple at full speed, with Diana in the lead and him behind. I'm feeling a bit tired, I should have used my shadow teleportation less. It was a mistake I won't repeat. After leaving the temple, they returned to the cave. After going through a big hole in the wall, they saw a huge yellow stone maze. After going through a big hole in the wall, they saw a huge yellow stone maze. They are high above its walls, so all he can see are all the turns and twists it has. It would take days or even weeks for anyone to find the exit. This is the first labyrinth, Diana spoke from his side and looked down at the labyrinth. I thought we were already in the labyrinth. We are, but every time I come here, it maintains this same scene, even if all the others are different. Diana said. Do you come here often? Dio asked her. I like to come at least once every generation to keep my skills sharp. Diana replied with a smile. Then she stopped talking and kept walking, but she didn't jump right into the opening below the labyrinth. Instead, she jumped onto the wall of the labyrinth and kept walking through it without entering it. It might be a kind of cheat, but after a while, he realized why she cheated. In fact, the darn labyrinth we were stepping on was much larger than he thought. 
Honestly, Dio doesn't know how anyone could pass through it. It was another test, this time to judge our creativity. Here they come Diana said. They are being attacked by shadowy hands that look like hands coming from the walls below the labyrinth. They both kept going, and now they were running at full speed. The shadows were moving quickly, and avoiding them was difficult. Is this part of the labyrinth trying to defeat us using mental tricks are you experiencing any hallucinations Diana asked in front of him. Are these black things trying to pull me down as an illusion Dio asked her. No, they are real, Diana responded. Then I'm okay. The shadowy hands were getting harder around the middle of the labyrinth. He pulled out his sword to help him keep going. Meanwhile, Diana decided to fly a few meters above the walls. Then they see the end of the labyrinth with two solid rock walls and another hole in the middle. The torches around the area light up when they exit the original labyrinth and reach the rock ground a few meters from the entrance. A huge minotaur appears in the middle, between the exit and them. The monsters they fought at the beginning of the labyrinth were made of stone, but this one looked like it was made of flesh and bone. It was over four meters tall, had a bull's head, long horns, and red skin, and he wasn't wearing anything to cover his red, muscular torso. He was naked except for a piece of cloth over his private parts, and his hairy legs and feet were exposed. He held a double-edged axe with a short handle in his hand. Jarrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
The spell he used now summoned the power of the river Styx's invulnerability from the underworld and made his body impenetrable to a certain degree of damage for as long as his energy could sustain it. Dio deactivated it after just a second to save more energy. The Minotaur's strength was strong, so he was dragged and stopped only when his back touched the cave wall. Dio didn't want to waste the opportunity, so he wrapped his arms around his neck and quickly chanted his next spell. Epsilon Pi Iota Kappa Alpha Lambda Omicron Nu Alpha Iota Tau Eta Delta Nu Alpha Mu Eta Tau Omicron Upsilon Sisyphus, I summoned the strength of Sisyphus, as Dio finished speaking, he felt a surge of physical strength running through his body. He pulled with all of his strength without pausing and raised the Minotaur's neck. Crack when he heard the sound of the broken bone, he released him, and the monster fell to the ground and then transformed into smoke. Sisyphus, the man condemned to push a giant boulder uphill, was never able to reach the summit. He isn't a god of strength or anything like that, but his task symbolizes it. Magnificent, Dio, you did it Diana suddenly appeared and said. It would have been a bit easier if you had helped, Dio replied and looked a bit frustrated. Dio wasn't convinced by her small act. The only real blow she delivered was the one that tore off the minotaur's horn. If I did that, it wouldn't be your test. Diana explained while smiling as she moved ahead and him behind. Before following her, Dio headed toward his sword on the ground. Unfortunately, the darned monster stepped on it and broke the blade. But Dio kept it anyway, a broken blade is better than nothing. After following Diana through the hole in the wall, the other side had the next test's opponent already there. A pretty woman with blue eyes and white hair, she wore a Greek-style white toga that was thrown across her shoulder and a golden tiara on her head. When Dio saw her, he immediately took an attack stance. It's good to see you again, Ariadne. Diana greeted the woman warmly. The same, Diana, she replied. Now that Dio knew they both knew each other, he lowered his guard. It seems they've reached the end of the labyrinth. This is Ariadne, Diana introduced her. She's in charge of the labyrinth, she continued. Pleasure to meet you, Dio greeted the woman in front of him. If my memory serves me right, she is Dionysus's wife. It's a pleasure to meet you too, son of Hades. She replied with a polite gesture. The tests this year were truly impressive, Ariadne. Diana continued the conversation. I don't create the tests, Diana, I only guard the labyrinth. These were the most deadly I've ever seen. Diana countered. The child's father wanted to know if he was worthy. My father Dio interrupted their conversation. Worthy of what Diana asked. His gifts, Ariadne replied. She then turned around, and behind her, he saw something covered by a black cloth, but from its shape, it was clear that it was armor. And did I pass the test Dio asked Ariadne. Both tests Dio followed up and looked at Diana. Yes, my student, you're ready. Diana responded with a smile. I wouldn't show you the prize if you hadn't passed. Ariadne added. Dio smiled happily as he walked up to the cloth and removed it. He was right about the armor, but there's also a sword and shield, which makes him very happy. Kids, look to your, you'll see another magnificent building. Mrs. Anna was their professor, and she shouted inside their bus. She's a woman in her forties, not very tall, and she always has her ridiculously big glasses on. She's a good teacher at school, but Dio was starting to reconsider that on this trip. It's been four months since his little adventure and test with Diana in the labyrinth. There hasn't been anything in his life since then. Dio had magic classes with Satana in the evenings, went to school in the morning, and spent his afternoons at the ARGUS headquarters, training either on his own or with Diana when she showed up. She's passed on all her knowledge to him, so all he has to do is work on it and perfect it, and that's something he has to do alone. Dio also started his solo adventures as a hero. He has been able to fix the wrongs of evil spirits in all of his cases so far. He put many murderers, rapists, and thieves behind bars, but he did it without revealing himself, using magic, or leaving evidence collected thanks to the memories of the ghosts for the police. There are also good things going on at home. The friendship between Dio and Vanessa seems to be getting stronger, but the relationship between her and her mother seems to be getting weaker. This boring field trip made me miss my sister a lot. At the moment, they were on a school field trip to the most famous city in the United States, New York. 
New York, a city composed of five towns located at the Hudson River and the Atlantic Ocean intersection, is the most populous city in the country. Dio was almost dying of anger due to the traffic, and to make things worse, their teacher shouted every two minutes to draw their attention to any old building, even if it had no historical value or unique architecture. There are huge buildings everywhere, the streets are full of people from all over the world, and screens hanging from the tops of buildings show different kinds of ads all the time, lighting up the streets. However, the city's bridges were what really caught his eye. This city connects the five districts with more than 2,000 bridges. The most famous ones are real works of art. He was so bored that seeing one of them from afar made it all worth it. Man, this is so cool the boy said that and, sitting next to him, invaded his personal space to take a photo of the view out the window. Do not use magic, do not use magic, do not use magic, the mantra to regain his composure worked, and they continued their trip. They were now heading to one of the city's most famous museums, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It would still take a little while to get there, so he put on his headphones and closed his eyes, trying to pass the time while listening to Nothing Else Matters by Metallica. The piece he felt lasted only 30 minutes. Dio felt something hit the bus, which caused it to spin on the road and then fall over. He had his eyes closed, and he couldn't hear anything as the music was so loud. It tipped over to the side. He opened his eyes as his side of the bus hit the ground. The first thing he saw were three people and a bunch of bags falling on top of him. A normal person would have suffered many injuries from this. The only thing that really bothered him was being buried. Dio was able to get the people who were crying and panicking off of him with a little work. There were slight injuries to all three of them, the most serious injury was the broken arm. After leaving them on the ground, he looked at the whole situation. The other passengers are in the same position as he was, and it will take a while for everyone to get away without his help. A loud noise from both inside and outside the bus hit him like a punch when he took off his headphones. There is a lot of chaos on the street outside, not just on the bus. He started to help the stuck people by jumping over the seats and going from person to person to check on them and pull them out. There are 25 kids, the driver, and two teachers on this bus. The kids are all okay, with only slight injuries, but the driver and two teachers are obviously not doing well. Since he's not good at healing magic, he thought it would be best to leave the driver alone until someone who was trained could help him. Professor Anna had a broken arm, and she was lucky as she was the only one standing. There were worse things that could have happened. The other teacher who came with us died immediately because of the luggage that fell on her and broke her neck. Come on, we have to get out of here Dio shouted to everyone who could move. The top priority right now was the only way out, so he climbed over the seats to the other side of the bus, which was upside down, used the two locks on the emergency exit, and pushed the window down to the ground, making a loud noise. Dio was the first to exit the bus, and when he stepped on top of it, he had a perfect view of what was happening in the city. The large number of cars that occupy every small corner of the road are almost all with their doors open and empty, people have chosen to abandon their vehicles to escape on foot. There are still a lot of them running toward him between the cars or on the sidewalk. He can also see several points of fire in buildings a few kilometers away. I wonder what caused all this chaos. Luckily, he was smart enough to control his super hearing when he removed his headphones, or he would have really hurt his ears with all the screams. Drum then one of the culprits reveals itself. There was a small black spaceship that looked like a dart and had a narrow front and a sphere at the back that was flying over him very fast. Dio looked back to see the alien ship firing blue energy at the cars. The energy sphere didn't explode when it hit the target, and the energy sphere crushed it as if a strong gravitational force was pushing it. When they flew over a person, a blue cone-shaped energy beam shot out from the bottom of the ship covered the person and teleported them away instantly. Dio looked down and saw the first person coming out of the window. He also noticed a large circular dent on the other side of the bus where it was hit. I'm going to look for help. Take anyone who can walk as far away from here as possible. Dio told one of his classmates as he helped them out through the opening. Without waiting for their response, he jumped off the bus and ran to the other side of the street, entering one of the now empty shops, a store that used to sell various designer clothes. He hurried to the back of the store and picked up clothing that people running away from danger had thrown or knocked to the ground. Before exiting through the back door, 
he looked around and used his senses to check if anyone was nearby. He also searched for security cameras. When he was sure he was alone, he removed the camouflage device and revealed his natural skin and hair colors. He touched his metal pendant. With a thought, a shadow slowly covered his body. Once it covers him completely, the shadows return to the metal on his pendant. Dio's body is now fully equipped with the armor and weapons granted to him by his father. He used a simple equipment conjuring spell, which worked perfectly without any cost since he used the same material as his equipment to cast the spell and make it easier. Now that he was ready to fight, he put his hand on the door. But first, he looked at himself in the large mirror on the other side of the room. Dio was wearing Greek-style armor that fit his body perfectly. It covered his entire torso up to his shoulders and his arms free. The lower part is shorts, with multiple black fabric straps covering them and extending to his knees. On his feet are knee-high boots, and his gloves reach up to his elbows. The armor is adorned with many small details in shiny black. Dio's two shoulder pieces are carved to look like black skulls and a large golden trident. It runs from the center of his abdomen, splitting into two prongs over his chest. It comes with a black helmet with tall red feathers, but he's not wearing it, just like the red cape. He thought it was better to leave his thin, strong chin face, his short, snow-white hair, and his skin exposed. Dio liked the armor, but not as much as he liked the sword and shield that were strapped to his back. The blade of the sword is black, a ziphos, with its only being its pommel, and also a silver skull with ruby eyes. The shield is different from the rest of the armor and weapon because it is gray and round. On the front, there are three high-relief sculptures of Cerberus's heads, and they look like they are about to bite his enemies. Diana told him that the weapons and armor have divine magical enchantments, but he hasn't succeeded in figuring out how they work. Dio walked through the door and saw the streets again, this time full of chaos from the attack. There are still a lot of people running like crazy to get away from the place that must be the main focus of the attack. There aren't any coming toward him because he's outside an alley at the back of the store. This keeps him from seeing him. Just knowing the direction they're coming from isn't enough to figure out where the battle is happening, so he opened his palm and spoke. Lambda Alpha, Kappa Alpha Iota Gamma Nu Epsilon Tau Alpha Mu Tau Iota Alpha Mu Omicron Upsilon, come and become my eyes, in his open hand, a human skull forms from the darkness, but its eyes are aflame with red fire. The skull slowly starts to float, and it stops when it's twenty meters high. When he closed his eyes, he observed the situation from the skull's point of view. There aren't many buildings twenty meters high in this city of stone, but it helps him find his way around. There is a lot of smoke and the sounds of fighting about two kilometers away from where he was. The smoke from the nearby fires made it impossible for him to see who was fighting. Dio cancelled his spell and ran as fast as he could towards the fight, which was challenging since he was running against the large number of people escaping it. Vrum a second UFO appeared from a street curve and flew toward him. He's not sure if it's the same one that attacked the bus and passed him earlier, but he needed to deal with it. The spaceship started firing at the buildings and abducting people as it passed them. Dio ran toward it and jumped. When it was in front of him in the air, he swung his sword to try to destroy it, but he underestimated its mobility. The spaceship managed to dodge his attack by turning to the. He teleported above it since he couldn't fly, and there was nothing that could help him. The moment he placed his hands on it, he struck with his blade pointing downward and cut through the alien metal without difficulty, which also prevented him from being thrown off. The sword still pierces it, but it keeps flying and is now doing a few maneuvers in the air to try to get rid of him. But it keeps him firmly attached by infusing a bit of magical energy into the soles of his boots. Dio released one of his hands that was holding the sword and began to deliver several punches to the inside of the dart, which seemed to be where the pilot was located. After a few punches, the metal became dented. He gripped it tightly and pulled with force, opening to get inside. Then Dio was surprised that there was no pilot inside, just a lot of machinery. The ship is definitely pilotless. Dio smiled. Dio had no reason to hold back since there was no pilot. He grabbed the sword with both hands and pulled it to the, cutting the metal and breaking it in half until the ship exploded in the air and he dropped himself away. Dio can see that he's about to fall on the roof of a two-story building as he twists his body in the air. While he was on the roof, he saw the spaceship pieces falling to the ground. Fortunately, there's no one on that street. 
He jumped from the roof and continued his way as fast as he could, the spaceship maneuver having taken him a bit further from the battle. So, he had to use a shadow teleport to make up for the distance. Blam 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 after using teleportation twice in a row, he finally arrived at the battle scene, and it was perfect timing. In the middle of the street, a man stands behind him with his back to him and two things in his hands that look like knife hilts raised above his head. The tattoos that look like snakes on his black arms make them shine. There's a water bubble protecting him. Two darts that were circling above him were shooting at him. The reason he can't leave that spot is that behind him, there are two crying children huddled together. Blam 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 there were four more shots that hit his water shield, and each one sent a gravity shock through his water shield. The force field of water sank into the ground and them in the middle of the street, in the middle of a crater. Robin, Kid Flash, I won't last much longer the man shouted and clearly reached his limit. Dio sprinted toward a severely damaged taxi and ripped off one of its doors. He took the typical stance and held the door. He spun his body and released it using his arm like a slingshot. The door flew through the air and precisely hit one of the spaceships, which caused it to explode. The second dart lost interest in its target, turned around in the air, and went in his direction. Blam it fired at Dio once, but his speed was much faster, and he easily dodged it while running toward it. The spaceship tried to hit him with its teleportation ray as it moved over him, but he rolled to the side and avoided it. Dio took the shield from his back and threw it like Captain America. The shield hits the rear of the spaceship and damages it. It didn't fly more than two meters before losing altitude and crashing to the ground with an explosion. Before heading to the crater, he again used the conjuration to retrieve his shield, which reappeared on his back. Unfortunately, it's not made of the same material as Captain America's, and it doesn't have the ability to return to him on its own. Then Dio approached the crater. When he got close, he saw the man who was defending the children coming out with both of them in his arms. They are hugging him and crying. He took a good look at the man now. He's roughly the same height, with dark skin, light green eyes, and very short blonde hair. Thank you for the assistance, stranger. He said that and smiled at him. Shiv the noise comes from behind him, and his instincts had alerted him a moment earlier. He had turned his body in time to see an arrow coming toward him, which he caught with his hand. The one who fired it was pointing a bow at Dio and was wearing a red suit with a yellow hat, gloves, and a mask covering their eyes. They were reaching for another arrow, and then he felt something striking his body. The force of the blow sent him spinning in the air. BAAM Dio landed on a nearby car in a bad mood. I know who attacked me, and even if it was a mistake, it doesn't mean I won't get revenge. Shift shift the archer shoots at him twice, and this time, he doesn't bother catching the arrows, he simply dodges them. With his senses at their limit, Dio can glimpse the speedster who hit him last coming toward him. Dio's speed may be much slower than his, but his reaction time is another matter. It's easy to guess where he'll be, no matter how fast he is, once he knows where he's coming from. Epsilon Pi Iota Kappa Alpha Lambda Omicron Nu Alpha Iota Tau Omicron Kappa Rho Omicron Tau Eta Theta Lambda Psi Eta Tau Omicron Upsilon Pi Omicron Tau Alpha Mu Omicron Kappa Omega Kappa Upsilon Tau, I summon the cold of sadness from the river Cositis, Dio said it out loud. A black, tar-like mist appears and covers a small section of the asphalt, freezing it. There is a black mist that looks like tar that covers a small area of asphalt and freezes it. Dio had no trouble with the ice and slid on it. He punched the speedster in the face and sent him flying towards another car that he crashed into. Stop the man he saved earlier shouted at him. He's not the enemy, he saved me he continued. It seems that his word carries a lot of importance since the archer stopped shooting at him. I apologize for my friends, they misunderstood the situation. The man said this as he walked over to him and held the children. I accept your apology, Dio told him. My name is Aqualad. Aqualad introduced himself. I don't have a hero name yet. Dio said. A newcomer really the archer sarcastically said this while coming toward them. The newbie nearly broke my jaw Kid Flash yelled and stood up from the ground with his hands on his face. Kid Flash is wearing a skin-tight suit, it's gold with a red bottom. He had a mask that covered his entire face and only his mouth exposed, and his suit had a symbol of a red lightning bolt on a white background right in the center of his chest. I only defended myself from the sudden attack. Dio responded to him. 
Dude, you're dressed all in black with our friend in a sword on your back, everything about you describes a villain Kid Flash explained. It was a misunderstanding, Kid Flash, he really saved me. Aqualad said. It doesn't matter, we don't know him, and that means we can't trust him. The archer said this with his hand crossed and glared at him. I agree, Kid Flash sounded in. I never asked to join your group, all I did was help, as I was trained to do. Dio told them, which the archer visibly displeased. Help is always welcome, if you didn't ask to join us, I will. Aqualad said we can't trust him the Speedy shouted to his friend, who remained calm. I know him, Speedy. A new voice came from above them. A boy is squatting on top of a pole, and everyone looks at Dio. The boy is a little shorter than me and wore an orange suit with a yellow R on the chest, a black cape that isn't very long, short black hair, and a green mask with white eyes. Have you met this guy before? Robin Speedy asked. Not in person, but there are records of him in the Batcave's records. He's Wonder Woman's student. Robin replied. Robin then jumped from the pole, did a somersault in the air, and landed right in front of him with his hand extended. It's a pleasure to meet you, Robin said it with a smile. The pleasure is mine, Dio replied and shook his hand. He knew Wonder Woman and trained with her, man that's so unfair. Kid Flash exclaims, but his remark is ignored by everyone. Kid Flash, could you take these children to a safe place Aqualad asked him. Right away, Kid Flash responded by moving at high speed to pick up the children, who have now forgotten their fear and are listening to their conversation with curiosity. Kid Flash does not release lightning when he runs, like the speedsters in comics. There's a shelter two blocks from here. Robin said. Kid Flash nodded and rushed away with the children. Could someone tell me why these ships are attacking us? Dio asked Aqualad. We're not entirely sure. They appeared a few minutes ago without showing any signs of attack, only observation. Aqualad replied. But after a few seconds, they started attacking us. We tried talking to them, but they didn't understand our words. Luckily, after we started fighting, they showed more interest in us than the rest of the city, reducing the number of casualties. Aqualad explained. Vrum 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 Dio wanted to learn more about the situation and why they wanted to abduct humans, but their conversation was cut short when they saw four darts approaching them in formation. What did I miss Kid Flash asked as he returned from his run. We need to end this quickly, Aqualad told them. Blam 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 they fire their high gravity sphere from a distance. They all split up to dodge their attacks. It didn't take long for them to pass by and make a U-turn at the end of the street, returning to their position. Aqualad was the first to take action. He ran to a fire hydrant, broke it, and gushed water from the ground. He then pulled out his two weapons, and the water started to glow from his tattoos. He controlled it and turned it into a huge water jet that hit one of the darts and sent it flying and crashing into a building before exploding. Kid Flash then rushed toward them, and when he got close, he changed his position and ran up the walls of the building next to the street, reaching the height of the dart. He jumped and landed on top of one of them. Dio saw his hand easily enter the dart, and when he pulled it out, the dart simply started to fall. He jumped out of the dart to escape the explosion. Robin didn't fall behind either. He pulled a grappling gun from his belt and fired at one of the darts. It clutched it and pulled it up by the rope. The weapon started to pull back the rope and bring it to his target. He put something on the dart and then jumped, doing acrobatics in the air and falling perfectly on the ground. The dart exploded when his feet hit the ground. They were good, but not all of them. With the last target still in his hands, Speedy shot two arrows at it. They exploded in the air, just inches from the target. The blast sent out red foam that covered the whole dart. The dart quickly fell as it was covered in foam. Speedy didn't think about where his opponent would land, which is what went wrong. Seeing the dart coming in his direction, he grabbed another arrow and fired it. Boom he made another mistake. He forgot to consider the material of the foam he had used before, so when the explosive arrow hit the flammable foam, the dart turned into a large fireball heading toward him. Seeing Speedy's shocked face, Dio jumped over him and hit him with his shield to block the flaming remnants of the dart across the street. Aqualad moved quickly and made a water bubble to protect Robin and Kid Flash. Speedy was behind Dio, so he was shielded. 
When Dio landed on the ground, he turned around and went in his direction with his hand extended. When Dio stopped the fireball, he fell on his butt. I didn't need your help Speedy said, smacking his hand away and then getting up on his own. No one can say he didn't try. Speedy was an idiot, and it's better to ignore him to avoid losing his patience. That was the last one, Robin said this to them and looked at a computer screen on his forearm. We still need to locate those who were abducted, Aqualad told them. Guys, they're aliens. Where else could they have put their hostages other than their mothership Kid Flash said. We already know that. The problem is how to get there. As far as I know, no one here has a dart. Speedy sounded in while still looking at him with anger. He is right, they can't reach the mothership by magic or by using technology. Zatanna could teleport them to the ship, but she would need something touched by a living being there to track it, and the dart was pilotless, so there was no item on it for that purpose. As Dio thought about it, he considered the dart, and a plan came to mind. I have an idea, Dio said that and got everyone's attention. But I'll need a complete and functioning dart to make it work. Dio continued. Dart Aqualad asked and didn't understand him. An enemy ship, I called them that because of their shape. Dio explained it to him. A dart, yes, this plan might work. Robin quickly understood his plan. Do you want to explain Kid Flash asked and looked at his friend. He wants to use the dart's own teleporter to get inside the mothership. Robin explained. That's nonsense. They clearly have measures to immobilize anyone being teleported. Speedy seems quite pleased to dismiss Dio's plan. They surely have measures to immobilize us, but I have a certain degree of invulnerability. If I act quickly, there's a good chance this measure won't catch me. DOP continued selling his plan. Atlantean skin is much stronger than human skin, and I can also use my magic to defend myself. I believe I can do this. Aqualad also agreed and accepted the plan. With my speed, I can vibrate and become intangible for a second, which is enough time to escape. Kid Flash agreed. You guys are crazy, Speedy said this to his friends. Maybe, but we're out of ideas, my friend. Aqualad told him, who wasn't thrilled but agreed. Well, now that everyone agrees, we need to find a whole dart. Robin said. Dio couldn't find any darts on his own, and all the ones he did find were destroyed. Let's hope they haven't them all in pieces too. I froze one of them, it fell inside a store, and from what I saw, it was a bit damaged. Fortunately, Aqualad didn't destroy one of them. Is the store still standing Kid Flash asked Aqualad. A few blocks from here, to the north, Aqualad replied. Kid Flash then ran to the north, and after a few seconds, he returned to tell everyone, the dart is really there, it seems to be in good condition, except for its engine. Great, then let's get moving. Robin said that and took a black device from his belt. One more thing, I found many injured people on the way. I won't be able to save them all alone. Kid Flash said. I'll need some time to analyze and get the dart working. Robin said. So while Robin tries to put the plan into action, let's help those in need. Aqualad suggested. Then, they move through the city and run toward the dart and mothership. The path they walked through was worse than Kid Flash said it was. Especially, this amount of damage might not be enough for a battle against invading forces since they've been heroes longer than Dio had. These streets were designed to handle a lot of people walking, as the city is a big capital. They are quite wide and open. There were more deaths when the streets were full of people running in fear. When compared to the number of people injured by other people's actions, the darts didn't cause much harm. The four of them walked through the streets and helped, while Robin went earlier to try to get the fallen dart working. Finally, the first aid training Diana gave him became useful. He assisted lightly injured people and stabilized those with more serious injuries as best as possible when the emergency services arrived. Aqualad and Dio were the only ones who seemed to have some medical training. The others were more focused on bringing the injured to themselves and helping those trapped in collapsed buildings, most of which were shops. After an hour of helping those injured, Dio could hear the police and ambulance sirens approaching them. It took a while for the authorities to get there, but it wasn't due to their inefficiency, it was because so many people were running away from the attack. 
The police cars were late because a large group of people were blocking their way, and many people had their cars in the street, which made things worse. There are several streets in this city that all lead to the same place, like a spider's web, so the authorities just took a different route, which took a little longer. They'll arrive in a few seconds, so they'll focus on the main task of rescuing those who were abducted. During these moments of waiting, Dio continued to help those nearby while thinking about the members of this small team. He's not formally a part of them yet, but at least for this mission, they are his companions. Aqualad is the one that stands out from the rest. He is smart and can manipulate water, and his actions make him the perfect leader for this team. Dio recognized him from the Young Justice animated series. This character doesn't exist in the comics, but looking at this version of Kid Flash in this reality, he was sure he was not in the Young Justice universe. Next comes Robin. The young boy is intelligent and received his instruction from a more knowledgeable person. He somehow got into the city's cameras and used them to find people who were closest to them who were in danger, which made them more efficient. He did all this while trying to figure out how to operate alien technology. Kid Flash is the opposite. He's more relaxed and playful. The difference from the first season's Young Justice version is that he knows when to play around, and his speed and ability to control it are also excellent. So, this version of Wally West might become the one who surpasses his mentor. Lastly, Speedy. He's an arrogant idiot. Dio won't deny that he's skilled, but that doesn't stop him from being an idiot. Speedy was so obnoxious that even when Dio tried to help him save someone, he yelled at him and said he didn't need any help. Frankly, Dio was close to losing his patience with him. The authorities have arrived Aqualad announced and led the older woman to the other side of the street, where they had gathered all the injured. Then let's go, we don't know how long the mothership will remain in orbit. Kid flashed said and appeared beside him. I agree, we're not of much use here anymore. Speedy agreed. Since there was no opposing opinion, they began to move toward Robin. They weren't far away, it only took a few seconds of running for them and Aqualad. Kid Flash had already arrived a long time ago and assisted Robin with the dart. Speedy was the last to arrive. The place where the dart fell seems to be a cafe. The dart crashed through the store and scattered chairs and tables everywhere. The dart's engine was destroyed, it was turned sideways, and the black armor on the bottom part that fired the teleportation beam was taken off, showing bizarre pieces of machinery. Robin was crouched beside the dart, with a cable extending from his wrist computer connected to the machine. Kid Flash was behind him and watched what was happening on the screen. So, is it going to succeed or not Speedy impatiently asked. It'll take months to understand this thing, Kid Flash said. Yes, but we don't need to understand it, just make it work. Robin responded and moved his fingers on his wrist, typing something. How long until that Speedy asked again? Give me a few seconds, Robin replied, which should earn him a 10 just for keeping his cool. The army has arrived. Aqualad said that and once again captured their attention. He looked outside the cafe storefront, and even with him in the way, Dio could see a very familiar jet landing in the street in front of the cafe. It's not the army, it's ARGUS Robin said this without looking at them. Whoever it is, they'll probably steal our new toy. Let me handle it. Speedy said, holding his bow and pulling an arrow from his back. Before he did anything foolish, Dio stepped in front of him to stop him. Get out of my way, rookie Speedy yelled at him. I know them, I'll talk to them. Dio told them to stay calm. Do you work with the government Speedy asked with disgust in his eyes. Wonder Woman has worked with ARGUS many times. Robin responded to him. If our new friend can handle the situation without a fight, we should let him try. Aqualad said. Despite Speedy's angry glare, Dio walked out of the cafe to speak to the people who had landed on the jet. Steve Trevor hasn't changed much in these three years, except for the pathetic attempt to grow a beard on his face. He came with two other soldiers wearing ARGUS's tech suits. Nice outfit, kid, Steve said it to him with a smile. You too, Dio said it with a mocking tone. Steve's locker has few choices with just standard military uniforms, which he used as a target for jokes for a long time. You certainly chose the perfect time to show up, Steve said this as he looked around at all the damage. It's more like the perfect time that forced me to participate. That happens in 90% of the messes Diana gets into. Steve sighed. 
Is the ARGUS taking jurisdiction over this matter? Dio asked. No, I was just worried about you. How did you know I was here? I didn't tell you about the school trip. How could I not know the entire internet knows you're here? Steve said it with a smile. It's amazing that the Americans captured him despite being attacked. So, judging by the fact that you're here stalling while your friends are inside, does that mean you guys had some idiotic idea of how to get inside the mothership to rescue the hostages correct, let's say you managed to get there. What are you going to do next you'll be surrounded by whatever species attacks us. I won't lie, I didn't have much time to plan that part of the plan. Dio said it with a smile. It's not like him to do something without careful planning. You're very smart, Dio. You know this mission is a bit above your pay grade. I agree as well, but do we have any other options Dio asked him. It's been quite some time since the invasion began, and so far, no high-profile heroes have shown up. That means they're occupied with more urgent matters. They can't wait for them. Dio, can I say anything to make you not do this Steve has sort of adopted me as an older brother. He follows Diana on most of her adventures and knows very well the difficulties and dangers a hero faces. You know me well, Steve. Even though you didn't think I could be a good hero, I have to do something, I can't just stand by and do nothing. That's also true. It's not a lie that I want to be a hero, but my motivation compared to the true heroes of this world is much weaker. Superman fights to bring a bit of hope to the world, and Batman fights so that no one else suffers what he has, and the examples go on. It took Dio a while to understand why he took so long to reveal himself. It's because he still considers himself just a kid wanting to be a hero. That's the truth. But it's also true that he can't just stand by and watch. That's why you'll be a good hero, kid. Steve said that his words affect him. He was serious before, but now he's smiling. And why do you think that Dio asked, as he genuinely wanted to know? Steve turned around and started heading back to his jet. A while ago, I met a princess who gave up everything because she had to go to a foreign land simply because she couldn't bear to see their suffering and do nothing. Steve began to speak. Then the jet's door opened, and he entered. As the door began to close, he continued talking. And that princess, who couldn't stand by and watch others suffer, became one of the world's greatest heroines. That's why I know you'll become one too. With those words, the door closed, and the aircraft took off. Hey, rookie, we're ready. Speedy shouted behind Dio as he watched the jet disappear. Dio turned and went back to the cafeteria. Aqualad and Kid Flash are already facing underneath the dart, which was turned to the side. Robin is on the other side of the dart and looks at him. Let's go over the plan once again. Robin said it seriously. Aqualad, Kid Flash, and our new friend will go ahead to secure the path. Aqualad says. After exactly ten minutes, I'll activate the teleporter again, this time taking Speedy and me to provide support. Robin continued. Aqualad then took his two weapons from his belt, and the tattoos on his body started to glow. Kid Flash didn't do anything specific, he just looked at Robin with a smile. On three, Aqualad said. One, Robin began to count down. Two. Epsilon Pi Iota Kappa Alpha Lambda Omicron Mu Alpha Iota Tau Omicron Tau Rho Omega Tau Omicron Tau Omicron Upsilon Pi Omicron Tau Alpha Mu Omicron Sticks, I summoned the invulnerability of the river Sticks, before reaching three, Dio whispered his spell softly, and a thin layer of dark energy covered his entire body. Three Robin pressed a button on his wrist, and a blue light emitted from the dart, hitting them. Dio might have passed out for a second. This was a different sensation from using shadow travel. One moment, he was standing, and the next, he was lying in a small pod with no in-between. The capsule was filled with smoke, some kind of gas, but with his invulnerability still active, he was safe. It's getting hard to maintain this spell, so he punched the green glass in the capsule and destroyed it. He could break and pull the glass away with a little more force. After that, he got out of the box and cancelled his spell. When his feet touched the ground, he already had his sword in his hand and looked around cautiously. Luckily, this place seems to be empty. Dio was in a massive chamber, five meters tall and over ten meters wide. There are only other pods like his, which are lined up in several rows, and the whole area is straight. The floor and walls of the ship were silver, and the dim lighting wasn't a problem for him. 
After making sure he was alone, he tried to find his new friends, but none of them had their pods, which meant their natural protections didn't work. It doesn't take long for him to find them, they are in the pods beside him. The first one he helped was Aqualad. Dio hit the glass with the hilt of his sword and shattered it. Then he grabbed Aqualad, pulled him out of the pod, and laid him on the ground. Dio did all this while holding his breath to avoid exposure to the gas inside the capsule. Dio Aqualad lying on the floor, it will take a little time for him to wake up. Then he moves to help Kid Flash. After going through the same process with Kid Flash's pod, he placed them both on the floor and faced the only door in the room. He put his hand on their foreheads and spoke aloud. Zypinu Alpha, wake up, as if they'd received an electric shock, they both jumped up from the floor, wide-eyed, and scanned their surroundings. It took a few seconds for them to fully wake up and calm down a bit. Thank you for saving us, my friend. Aqualad said and understood what happened. Wow, so we're really on the mothership, Kid Flash said this and looked around. He then ran around the room before returning to where he started. So Aqualad asked. I saw all the pods, and most of them are empty, and humans occupy the others. Kid Flash replied. How many Dio asked? Thirty, of different ages and genders. That complicates things a bit. I didn't think there were so many. Dio remark. We can't wake them up, and protecting thirty people is very difficult. Aqualad also understood the problem. What do we do Kid Flash asked. Aqualad stopped talking and contemplated. Dio already knew what they could do to save everyone. We'll take control of the ship, Dio said to them, which surprised them all. Yes, it's the only thing we can do to save everyone. Aqualad agreed with him, and Kid Flash has no reason to disagree. We'll wait for the others first, Aqualad suggested it and sat on the floor in front of the only door. So they wait one minute, two, and finally ten minutes pass. Aqualad, who was watching the door in front of them like the rest of them, turned to Kid Flash and said. Kid, could you? Before he could finish, Kid Flash had already jumped up, crossed the entire room, and returned. No new arrivals in the pods, Kid Flash reports. Robin isn't the type to be late. Aqualad said to them we'll wait a few more minutes, maybe the teleporter beam malfunctioned, and he needs time to fix it. Kid Flash suggested. So they wait for another five minutes, and there is still no sign of Robin or the idiot. Something must have happened to the dart, we can't wait any longer. Dio told them. Aqualad stood up, drew his two weapons, and his tattoos started to glow. From a silver bag attached to his back, the water emerges, forming two swords. He's right, Aqualad said this to Kid Flash, who was already in a running position behind them. Dio also grabbed his sword and shield, ready for battle. Who's going to have the honor Kid Flash asked. I think our new friend should have that honor. Dio didn't disagree with them and ran toward the door in front of him. When he was just a few meters away from it, he leaped towards it with his shield raised. Boom the doors, which are made of an unknown metal, can't take the force of his blow and blow forward, starting the attack. On the other side of the door, there was a long, wide corridor as big as the room they were in. We're taking this ship, you bastards Kid Flash shouted after appearing at his side. For humanoid forms appear in front of them from the other end of the corridor. They all held weapons similar to rifles and wore white suits with futuristic helmets of the same color covering their faces. Aqualad appeared on his other side and looked at their enemies. Let's go Aqualad shouts as he charges, and they follow him. This must be a battle focused on speed. If they give the enemy time to regroup, they'll need help fighting on their turf. So, Dio didn't hold back and teleport in front of the first enemy. When he appeared in front of him, he lowered his body to dodge the red energy blast from his weapon and struck with his sword, cutting it in half. Then he kicked his helmet with all his strength and sent it flying. Dio's teleport was slightly faster than Kid Flash's. When Dio looked to the side, he saw him approaching another enemy and punching him in the head, forcing him to fall to the ground. While Kid Flash dealt with the second enemy, Dio was already on the third. This one managed to shoot accurately at Dio. Dio didn't dodge but placed his sword in front of its body at the right angle and redirected the energy blast precisely where he wanted, hitting the fourth enemy directly in his weapon. When Dio saw the third enemy, 
he cut its weapon again and then hit its helmet with the handle of his sword, which knocked it to the ground. The helmet dented but didn't break, and the enemy tried to get up, but Dio kicked him again and broke its helmet. Aqualad, who is the slowest of them all, finally gets to his enemy, who isn't armed. He changes one of his swords into a hammer and hits the last enemy in the face very hard. That was simply incredible Kid Flash cheered. While he celebrated, Dio focused his attention on the second enemy he knocked down with his helmet destroyed, and it was easy to remove it, revealing his enemy. Dio must admit he was quite surprised because his enemy clearly had four limbs like any human, but he certainly wasn't human. Instead, he resembled a lizard, with a spherical skull like a human but an elongated jaw like an alligator, and his skin was yellow and wrinkled. This is definitely an alien, my first alien Kid Flash exclaimed and looked at the lizard's face. You've seen aliens before, Kid Flash, like Superman, for example. Aqualad said this while also staring at the alien. He looks too human in appearance to give me the feeling I'm having now. Kid Flash responded passionately. Tup 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 the dim lights in the corridor started to flicker, and a low alarm noise began to sound throughout the ship. We've been discovered, Aqualad said it without panicking. Their approach hasn't been quiet from the start, so this was expected. The mothership is quite large, and its corridors are identical copies of each other. They pass through several locked doors. The most important thing right now is to reach the command center and somehow take control of the ship without their computer specialist. Watch out the distraction was a mistake. As they made a turn, they came face to face with the lizard creatures. They stood in a row with their rifles. The one in the middle is aiming a massive gun that looks like a caliber machine gun at them. Aqualad was the first to shout and act. He drew water from his backpack and combined it with the water he already had on his swords, creating a water shield in front of them. The middle weapon fires a shot similar to the darts, a blue energy sphere that hits the water shield and explodes it. Aqualad wasn't hurt, he was thrown backward. As Kid Flash ran along the walls, he defied gravity like Spider-Man and avoided the shots from the energy gun. He was heading for the big gun in the middle, but he couldn't reach it before it fired again, this time at Dio. The corridor was quite wide, but the energy sphere nearly filled it and him no choice but to raise his shield and defend against the blast. BAMM the increased gravity of the shot enveloped his entire body, ignoring his defense, and his feet sank into the ground up to his knees. The good news is that Kid Flash reached for the big gun and dismantled it. Then Kid Flash punched the shooter, but he had to retreat when the others with rifles started firing at him. Aqualad also returned to the fight and transformed his weapon into a whip that struck some of the lizard creatures. Meanwhile, Dio struggled to free himself from the ground. When he managed to do so, he took advantage of the fact that the lizards were focused on Aqualad and Kid. He used the Path of Shadows to appear behind them. Epsilon Pi Iota Kappa Alpha Lambda Omicron Nu Alpha Iota Tau Omicron Kappa Rho Omicron Tau Eta Theta Lambda Psi Eta Tau Omicron Upsilon Pi Omicron Tau Alpha Mu Omicron Cosite, I summoned the cold of the river Cositis, as he spoke his spell, he took a deep breath and exhaled a black mist that covered the entire corridor in front of him. When the mist cleared, only the lizards remained frozen in their positions. Reptiles tend to hibernate in the cold. Good idea, Aqualad said this and walked over to him. You used the same trick as Superman, it was pretty cool. They the frozen lizards behind and continued running ahead. Look Aqualad called their attention again. After turning another corner, they found themselves facing an observation deck with a view of planet Earth. Now we know we're still in orbit. Kid Flash said it happily. Not for much longer. We need to go faster. Dio told them and reminded them of the time. They resumed running through the corridors as fast as they could. But they knew that going ahead alone would be a mistake. Along the way, they encountered more lizards, but the three of them managed to defeat each one. They were rapidly improving their teamwork and increasing their efficiency. Finally, they found a terminal in one of the corridors. Since he couldn't read their language, Kid Flash pressed all the buttons to observe the actions. He did this in less than a second and luckily found a map of the maze of corridors. After finding a way, they ran quickly to the mothership's command room, which wasn't far away. BOMMM as they ran down a corridor, a side door a few meters ahead of them blew open, and several lizard things were thrown against the wall of the hallway, their armor smoking. 
whatever hit them had a lot of firepower. They took a combat stance and waited for whoever or whatever appeared from the side door. They were shocked and a very beautiful woman who they knew had to be an alien walked out. With her eyes were light green, her hair was long and straight, and her skin was orange. She was undoubtedly as stunning as Diana or Zatanna. Dio's not surprised that Starfire is on this ship. Starfire spoke something in her language, and no one understood her. As she sent two of their enemies flying and was dressed in a grey jumpsuit covering her entire body, Dio's companions figured that she wasn't an enemy. Their attention was entirely on her, so they didn't notice three lizards appearing behind her. Dio moved through the shadows when they pointed their weapons and appeared in front of the three, protecting Starfire's back from their shots with his shield. When they were about to fire again, Dio teleported again, appearing in front of one of them, cutting its weapon with his sword and hitting its helmet with his shield. A green energy beam passed by Dio and struck the other two as he was about to turn to deal with them, sending them flying. Dio looked back and saw Starfire's hand glowing green. Dio walked calmly toward her, with Aqualad and Kid Flash following. They gathered around her, and she continued to look at Dio. Starfire said it again in her language. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Dio told her in his language to let her know that they couldn't speak the same language. It seemed to work because she extended her hand and held onto his armor, then pulled him closer and kissed him. It wasn't a romantic kiss, their lips barely touched, there was no love, yet it was his first kiss in this life, and he was quite thrilled. The kiss lasted only a few seconds, and then she released Dio and moved away a bit. Can you understand me now Starfire asked in perfect English. Dio just nodded. Are you also fleeing from the Psions? Starfire asked. Dio nodded again and assumed that the Psions were the name of the race they were fighting. In fact, we're trying to take control of their ship to rescue our people who were kidnapped. Aqualad said. Seriously, no one's going to talk about the kiss Kid Flash asked. Starfire looked at Kid Flash and replied, my people have the ability to learn alien languages through physical contact. She said it casually. Not to offend, but could you tell us who you are and why you're on this ship Aqualad asked. My name is Coriandar. I've been held here as a prisoner and a Psion test subject for some time. I can explain the reasons later because we don't have much time. Why don't we have much time Dio asked, as he had enough time to recover. I overheard the Psions talking about an evacuation protocol. In a few seconds, they'll abandon this ship, but not before triggering the self-destruct. That clearly killed the mood. They were foolish not to consider self-destruction. Let's go Aqualad said this while already running toward the bridge. Their new ally chose to fly instead of running. It was a beautiful sight with her long, fiery red hair, which reached down to her feet and began to glow as if it were on fire, and its tips truly were. After running for a few minutes and fighting anyone in their path with the help of their new friend, they arrived at a large round door. Aqualad wasted no time and transformed his weapon into a large sword, which he thrust into the door and tried to cut a path for them. Dio went to the other side of the door and helped by doing the same with his sword. When both sides were cut, Coriandar shot at the center and created an entrance. Kid Flash was the first to go, and they followed. The command room of the mothership was much larger than the corridors they had passed through. It was a singlestry circular room, with the first floor connected by a long spiral path, and the entire place was filled with psions. Kid Flash, who was the first to enter, was landing punches on everyone in front of him and knocking them down. Unfortunately, the surprise attack didn't last long. On the first floor, several lizards holding weapons started shooting from above. Dio managed to shield himself with his shield, but Kid Flash and Aqualad had to dodge and move from side to side. Dio was about to teleport up, but Coriandar was faster. She flew up to the first floor level and began firing her green beams with both hands at the enemies. Boom 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 in addition to hitting the people who were fighting them, her attack also went through some equipment on that level and caused explosions. She didn't retreat, instead, she flew onto the first floor and attacked even harder. While she caused chaos above, they did the same below. Epsilon Pi Iota Kappa Alpha Lambda Omicron Nu Alpha Iota Tau Omicron Kappa Rho Omicron Tau Eta Theta Lambda Psi Eta Tau Omicron Upsilon Pi Omicron Tau Alpha Mu Omicron Cositis I summoned the cold of the river Cositis Dio's sword's blade was enveloped in a thin black mist, and he charged into the attack against three psions in front of him. 
They fired at him. He easily dodged their shots, cut one of them on the shoulder, and took the other shot again, ignoring how close Dio was to its companion. Dio defended himself with his shield, attacked, and hit its leg. The third one seemed a little scared and shot a few times at Dio while trembling. Dio was kind to him and struck him with the hilt of his sword, which was a better outcome than his friend's suffering cuts from his magic. The cuts were simple, but his spell immediately froze the wounds and spread cold throughout their bodies, which them frozen on the ground. Aqualad and Kid Flash were working in perfect sync. Aqualad used his two weapons, now in the form of short hammers, to hit anything close to him, and Kid Flash appeared in front of Aqualad just as he was about to be hit by an enemy shot and protected him with a chestplate from the Psion's armor. Bill when they reached the end of the room, another explosion, more than the last ones, happened above them, and Coriandar landed beside them. The battle is over up there, Coriandar said to them. The battle down here was also over, and now they were facing the ship's controls in a big area with a beautiful view of Earth. However, there were still Psions operating the ship's controls. Stop them Coriandar shouted to them. Dio teleported close to them and plunged his sword into the ground. It was still enchanted by his spell, which erupted and covered all the Psions in front of me with a black mist. The spell wasn't powerful enough to freeze them completely, but it rapidly lowered their temperature, which made them very sluggish. One of them, who was in the middle of the control, turned to Dio, and since it was without his helmet, Dio could see its jaw opening, and a strange sound came out of it. He said that even if we manage to stop the self-destruct, we won't get out of here alive. Coriandar translated for them. What does he mean Kid Flash asked? Truum the answer came immediately, the mothership that was in its stable position began to move and was rapidly increasing its speed. They were flying toward Earth, and it seemed to be a suicide attack. We have to regain control Dio shouted to them. They all sped to a terminal and looked for buttons similar to those of an airplane to regain control. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Dot Of course, Kid Flash was moving much faster than anyone else. I've tried them all Kid Flash shouted in panic. In the few seconds they attempted to control the ship, it had already entered Earth's atmosphere and transformed into a massive fireball. To make matters worse, they could see a large continent ahead of them. We have to destroy the ship, Dio told them. Is that possible Aqualad asked. Yes, but everyone should know the cost. If I use an attack with all my energy, it would be possible to destroy the ship, but I'll likely die from exhaustion. Still, it's more important to prevent this ship from crashing. Do it, Aqualad spoke calmly and looked at Dio. To hell with it, do it. Kid Flash agreed. Then Dio looked at Coriandar. Do it, warrior, but know that I won't give up on surviving. When the ship is destroyed, I'll do my best to get you out of here by flying. I doubted she could carry all three of us while everything collapsed around us, but of course, I wouldn't say that to her. There was no time for hesitation or cowardly thoughts, they had only a few seconds. So, as he was about to do what was necessary, he saw a blue blur flying at high speed toward the ship. As it got closer, he could see the blue suit and a beautiful red cape. This being held the ship with his bare hands. First, Dio was attacked by alien ships, then he got into a battle with the young heroes, and finally, he came to the enemy's mothership secretly and had his first kiss there. Superman saved him just as he was about to give his life to destroy the ship, which would have killed thousands of people. It was a great day the whole time these things happened. After Superman saved them and lifted the huge ship, which must have weighed millions of tons, above a city he couldn't see from the front of the ship, he carried them out of the city slowly and dropped them down gently in a desert. So, who's going to open the door for him Kid Flash asked and looked at Superman, who was floating in front of them with his arms crossed over his chest and a smile on his face. The Superman in this reality closely resembles the one from current comic books, a strong man with a sharp jaw, smooth dark hair, and blue eyes. The suit had an old-fashioned texture, with a full blue suit, red trunks with a yellow belt, a large red S on a yellow logo on his chest, and a long, flowing red cape. Dio's heart was racing with excitement more than when he met Diana or Batman. The same way would be felt by anyone who knows what this character means in the comics. In addition, Dio felt even more excitement when he realized that all the amazing things he does every day in the comics were real in this world, not just in the comics. 
Who is this man Coriandar? asked curiously. Aqualad was standing next to her and provided her with a simple but truthful response. He is the greatest hero on earth. Coriandar took another careful look at Superman and did not appear very surprised by this title. Aqualad can't blame her, she does not know Earth. He seems strong, Coriandar shows in her final inspection. Before they could say anything about what she said, Superman waved them off the ship, as he was tired of waiting for them to come to their senses. Let's go, Dio said to everyone. They turned and walked through what remained of the command bridge. Dio glanced at the Psion soldiers scattered on the floor, they couldn't escape as they attacked them, and their comrades chose not to save them with them on the ground. Now, they are prisoners, and he can't help feeling some pity for them. Dio wouldn't want anyone, friend or enemy, to be an alien prisoner on Earth. They didn't have to walk far to find something similar to the side exits of an aircraft in the mothership. However, since the ship had no power, Dio had to cut their way out, and then they jumped out while Coriandar floated slowly to the ground. When they set foot on the ground, Superman was already in front of them, his hand extended to Dio. You must be Diana's apprentice. She spoke highly of you. Superman said with a smile at him. Dio moved quickly and shook his hand, which was as firm as steel. It's an honor, Superman. Dio replied from the heart. Superman smiled at him and let go of his hand, and then he looked at Kid Flash and Aqualad. It's good to see that you two are okay, Aqualad and Kid Flash. Superman said. Thank you, sir, Aqualad replied respectfully, but Kid Flash couldn't resist a playful. Hey, Supes, how's the strength holding up Superman's faint smile in response to Kid's playful remark was a small victory for him. I'm doing great, Kid. Superman replied. Then Superman looked at Coriandar and asked, and who might you be my name is Coriandar, and I am the princess of Tamron. The man in front of Coriandar didn't seem to bother her, and she appeared more interested in her surroundings. With this introduction, Superman looked at them and wanted an explanation. It's a long story, one we don't have all the details of either. Dio replied to him, and he nodded in understanding. Let's wait for the others so we can fill in the details. Superman said. Others Aqualad asked with curiosity. Superman chuckled, turned, and pointed to the sky, saying, the rest of the league. Dio's new friends don't have the same vision as him, so they couldn't see a green light ball flying towards them with a woman in red armor beside it. Shortly after, they arrived. Diana landed next to Superman and dashed towards me while giving him a hug. Thank Hera that you're not only well but also victorious. Diana said it with pride and concern in her voice. Lucky bastard, Kid Flash mutters quietly, so low that only those with super hearing can hear. Diana's hug ended and an African-American man controlling the green light bubble arrived and set it on the ground. It was clear that this green lantern was Jon Stewart as his whole suit was black, with only the top part being green. The green lantern symbol was in the middle of his chest on a white background, and his boots were green. This is one of the coolest superhero costumes. Then, on the ground, the bubble that his ring in a line are holding together pops open to reveal Robin, Speedy, Batman, and two other people. One of them was wearing an outfit similar to Speedy's but in emerald green, and it was clearly the green arrow. Dio found his old school mustache quite funny. The other was a man with straight blonde hair, holding a golden trident and wearing a shirt with golden scales and green pants with an A on his belt. It looks like a big part of the League of Justice is here. Batman took the lead. It's been three years since they met on that rooftop, but the way he looks at them still scares Dio. It's like he can see all of their secrets. Robin and Speedy have given a report on what happened in the city, it's your turn now. Batman said it in a calm voice. I would like Calderay HM to speak first. Aquaman said it right after. Aqualad stepped forward like a soldier rather than a hero and placed his fist over his heart, a gesture that Dio thought was a sign of Atlantean respect. As you wish, my king, Aqualad said. Then Aqualad begins to recount everything that has happened since they arrived on the ship. The part where they talk about how their enemies looked interests the Green Lantern and the others because it's clear that they have never seen anything quite like the lizard-like creatures before. A few minutes later, the story is finished, and Batman just looked at them for a few seconds. 
Despite invading an enemy ship without an escape plan for yourselves and the captives, you did an acceptable job. Batman said to them. That was definitely a big compliment since Robin's face looked almost teary as he looked at his father and mentor. We still need to hear the story from our new and beautiful guest. The green arrow said and looked at Coriandar with almost starry eyes. This is Coriandar, princess of a planet called Tamarin. Superman introduced her to the League. Were you also kidnapped by these lizard people, Princess Coriandar Diana asked formally. They're not lizards, they're psions, a race that lives in the Vega system. Coriandar replied. The rest of the League members and their sidekicks looked at Green Lantern, who was floating in the air, and waited for answers. Robin was looking at Coriandar without blinking. The Green Lantern's bodies know a lot about the universe, so the Lantern should also know something. I have no information about the Vega system, and there is no assigned Green Lantern for it. The Green Lantern replied. Our star system has never had a Lantern assigned to it. Coriandar confirmed. What did these Psions want with you, and why did they kidnap people without any explanation Batman asked and looked concerned about an entire system being unprotected? Psions are mad geneticists, they're well known for kidnapping any alien race they come across for their experiments. I was one of their victims, just like my sister. Coriandar replied and looked a bit sad. How can you speak our language so well the Green Arrow asked curiously. This made Kid and Aqualad look at Dio and made the atmosphere quite strange. Then Diana noticed this and looked at Dio, waiting for him to speak. My species has the ability to learn any language through physical contact. Coriandar replied before him. Lucky bastard Kid Flash cursed Dio again, this time quietly. The others, except for Robin and Batman, smiled at him, understanding what had happened. Now I'm curious, how did these lizards manage to kidnap a princess you don't seem like an easy opponent? Diana asked. I don't want to talk about it Coriandar said, looking agitated for the first time. This made the atmosphere a bit tense, but Diana nodded and changed the subject to the issue of the hostages and the unconscious psions aboard. Can I take the Psions with me to OA? I'll also use the opportunity to gather some information about this Vega system from the Guardians. The Green Lantern said to settle the matter. Before the conversation continued, Dio saw some movement on the horizon, a large dust cloud approaching. The Texas reporters are certainly fast. Superman said it with a smile as he looked at the horizon. We'll stay here to take care of the prisoners and hostages in the meantime. Batman said that and looked at the sidekicks. Some of you should return to your private lives since you disappeared suddenly, and we don't want you to be declared missing. Batman continued. The kids should stay, this victory is theirs. Diana argued. We also haven't decided what to do with Princess Coriandar. Aquaman added. Hmm, Batman grunted. Batman clearly didn't want to make them more public than the footage from the battle in the city. It's not like the young hero's partners were a secret, but most forces didn't consider them because they were all children. However, now these children had taken a spaceship on their own, and that drew attention. A few minutes later, police cars and vans from different TV stations drove up to the rocket and stopped a few meters away. The police officers quickly exited their vehicles, but they couldn't isolate the area before the reporters and their cameramen rushed past them toward the League of Justice. Are you sure about this? Diomedes Diana asked quietly from his side and spoke in a quiet tone, so no one could hear his name except Superman. Diana was aware of his decision not to reveal himself in these past months, and she had been understanding, not forcing him into anything. Dio could have disappeared from their sight and hidden, but that became pointless when he used this armor and sword in front of hundreds of people. It was going to happen at some point, so why not now Dio replied. It's been two days since the battle. After spending time with the League discussing what came next, they brought him to his school group. But before that, they made a stop to get another device since he lost his during the chaos. It wasn't difficult to come up with an excuse for his disappearance during all the events. Dio simply said that because of the crowd panicking and fleeing, he got separated from them. After seeing a doctor, which took over four hours because the hospitals were crowded with injured people, they went to a hotel where they slept. The next day, the school arranged for another rented bus to take them home. Finally, Dio arrived home. The first thing he did was take a shower and lie on the couch to rest his mentally exhausted self. 
You're back Vanessa yelled, jumped down the stairs, and gave him a big hug. After a few seconds, she let go and looked at his body. Did you get hurt Vanessa asked as she looked concerned. Not a scratch, Dio assured her. That's good, Vanessa said that and sat beside him. How have things been since I Dio asked. Vanessa's mood soured before she responded. Mom went on one of her trips, and I've just been studying for final exams. Vanessa replied. Vanessa had been preparing to get into a good college. In the past, she wanted to study archaeology like her mom, a clear shot to get closer to her. But after everything that happened, she decided to study medicine, a choice Dio fully supported. Well, now I'm here. Do you want to do something Dio asked to try to cheer her up? I thought you'd spend more time with your new friends since you're going to form a new group of young heroes. Vanessa said as she looked confused. How do you know that Dio asked with curiosity? They agreed to join together and form a team. They had all worked together before but never officially formed a team until now. It was also decided that Coriandar would be under our protection in the base that was already being constructed. What surprised him was how Vanessa found out, as they hadn't released any information yet. It's just speculation from the reporters, as all of you are now quite famous in New York because of the rescues, especially you, Dio. This was the first time you revealed yourself. That wasn't a surprise. Then Vanessa grabbed the remote control and switched to a news channel. See, you're famous now, little brother, Vanessa said and pointed her hand to the screen. Vanessa tuned into a channel that was currently airing a popular program, The Cat Grant Show. The host, a beautiful blonde woman with blue eyes wearing a long red dress with a deep neckline, was talking about Dio. You all know that I won't give up until I get a information. Unfortunately, I haven't heard anything about Wonder Woman's new sidekick, who I think had the best debut of all of them. Sidekick Dio exclaimed in frustration. It was being called something that certainly didn't feel good. Huh, Vanessa laughed beside him. The image on the screen cuts to footage shot by cell phones. There are images of Dio fighting the darts that attacked the city. The camera was shaking, but it provided a good view of his victory. Then, the image was cut again to Cat, who smiled at the camera. Even though I haven't gotten any new information, that doesn't mean I've given up on getting some information about the second being claiming to have a divine origin. Now Dio's face was shown on TV, with his magnificent black and gold armor, shield, and sword strapped to his back. It was a recording of the brief interview I gave to the reporters two days ago. In the video, Dio stood before several reporters and pointed their microphones at his face. Diana was beside him and put her hand on my shoulder to show support. The spaceship he attacked was behind him and made for a stunning background for the scene. What's your name what's your relationship with Wonder Woman is she your mother how do you feel after saving so many people are you and the other young heroes forming a team the reporters bombarded him with questions and didn't give him time to answer. Dio confessed he was a little nervous, he had never received this much attention before. I am. Then his voice forced all the reporters to fall silent. Dio might have used a little magic in his voice to do this, and he didn't regret it. They would probably have thought of him as just a kid without that. I'm a demigod, just like Diana. Dio continued. Dio those words hanging in the air and waited for them to say something. Since they remained silent, Dio continued. I received several years of Wonder Woman's training before I received her approval to act, which is what I did today. It took a few seconds for another reporter to muster the courage to ask another question. How do you want to be called from now on? Dio responded to this question with confidence. You can call me Kirix. Dio chose that name on the spur of the moment, but he didn't regret it. Kirix means herald in Greek, and its meaning somehow grew on him. To save himself from further embarrassment, he grabbed the remote control and turned off the TV. Just stop laughing, Dio said, looking at Vanessa next to him and holding her stomach in pain from laughing so much at him. Sorry, but for some reason, it just seems so funny. Vanessa replied. It took her a few minutes to calm down and be able to have a reasonable conversation. When are you and the others going to join up? Vanessa asked. At the end of the month, Dio replied. So soon Vanessa exclaimed. There were only a few days in the month. The plans for forming this team were almost ready, and this event just sped things up a bit. Dio told his sister. Dio could see that she wasn't too happy about being alone in this house. 
she knew that when he joined the team, he would have to move to another city. You don't need to be sad, Van. You know there are plenty of good colleges where I'm going, and we'll talk every day. Dio said this to her and tried to cheer her up. She was still sad, but she accepted it after a while. So the days passed. Dio focused all his attention on Vanessa and tried to make her strong for the little time she'd be alone. Dio also prepared for his departure. First, he went to see Zatanna, but her house had already disappeared, and she only a key behind. It was actually a magical token. All he needed to do was fit it into any door and open it, and the room that would appear in front of me would be Zatanna's library. Dio was deeply moved by this gift. She had given him a direct passage to her house, and if it fell into the hands of some villain, it would be a nightmare. So Dio carefully stored the key. Next, Dio said goodbye to ARGUS, which had become more of his home than Julia's. It was a great farewell, with a small party and all his friends present. Well, I guess I'm ready. Dio said this to Vanessa, who was standing in front of him and tried not to cry but failed miserably. They were in the backyard of their house, where an ARGUS aircraft was waiting for him to take him to this new home. Take care, and don't forget to call me. Vanessa said. Dio hugged her. There was no need for more words. They had said everything in the last few days. Then they parted, and Dio picked up his small carry-on bag with his things. Dio used a small spell to make it bigger inside so that it could fit all his belongings. Dio got on the aircraft, and it immediately took off. During the trip, Dio began thinking about a way to fly or move more quickly. He really hated needing a ride. After an hour of travel, they finally crossed the city that had been attacked a few days ago. From what he could see, they had recovered quite quickly. The streets were already bustling with people. They flew over the city until they reached the East River in Manhattan. On a small island in the center of the river, a building had been built shaped like a T with its front entirely made of mirrored glass. They were expected, so the aircraft landed smoothly on the helipad on the rooftop. Dio said his goodbyes and thanked the pilot, then went to the only metal door on the roof. When Dio stood in front of it, he searched for a way to open it, but it wasn't necessary. The door emitted a hologram that covered his entire body, and a robotic voice spoke. Beep 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 blam the first beep caught Dio off guard, and the second one made him angry, so he threw his pen at the alarm clock, piercing it and destroying it. Since Dio didn't need to sleep, he spent the entire night studying various spells from different magical systems. The alarm clock is convenient to remind him that it's morning, otherwise, he would stay in his room for days without knowing the time. The problem was that he often forgot to turn off his super hearing while he was deeply studying. It was loud every time it beeped, so he quickly destroyed it. Dio could use his phone, but he was not that stupid. Dio stood up from his chair in front of his desk, which was covered in open books and scrolls, all of which he borrowed from Zatanna's library. They are all about levitation and floating magic. He leans on the table to look over all of his work. Dio had some time since it was six in the morning, and breakfast was normally served at half past six. Dio had been studying levitation magic all week since he arrived at the Titan's Tower and tried to create his own flight spell. Unfortunately, it's going to take a little longer to succeed. The levitation spells allowed magicians to float and move in the air, but not at speed. It's possible to increase speed, but the mana consumption would be too high. That's why he needed to create a new spell, but it's difficult to create a spell focusing on speed because there are no spells like that. The reason was quite simple, and it was that magicians didn't see the need for fast flight. They don't need to be able to fly quickly because most people who practice magical arts fight from a distance. A teleportation spell is also more convenient and easy to use if you need to get from one place to another. But he was not like other magicians, Dio's fighting style is short to medium range. The ability to fly at the same speed he moves will make him much stronger. As for teleportation, the theoretical knowledge isn't too difficult for him since he can move through the shadows, which is natural teleportation. The only problem is his limitations in using spells. If he used something too powerful, he'd end up destroying himself. But that will change over time, Dio's resistance will increase, and as a demigod, they don't age after a certain age. He was confident that he could harness the full power of the underworld's aspects in the future. 
In a few minutes, he finished reading all the information and also his unfinished spell. Dio still thinks he is far from achieving it, but it will take less time than he initially thought. Dio finally finished and looked around his room, which is quite simple, with just a double bed, a desk, a bookshelf, and a wardrobe. A normal room. Dio didn't have many things to decorate his room when he lived with Julia, and he hasn't changed much here either. There are some protection and anti-surveillance spells on the wall and posters of bands. Dio was not an idiot, this place was basically built with Batman's money, so there were many surveillance devices to gather information about them. So Dio invested a bit in these spells to have some peace and privacy in his own room. Dio grabbed his cell phone and saw a message from Vanessa, which he replied to before heading out the door. The Titan's tower was well divided. There was a common area below on the floor with the bedrooms, connected by stairs. Below that, there were the men's locker rooms and showers, while the women's rooms had their own bathrooms. Further down, there was the gym, laundry room, infirmary, workshop, garage, and reception area. The floor above the common area and bedrooms was where the operations room was located, with computers and various other equipment. It's Robin's personal little cave since only he knew how to operate those devices, except for Coriandar, who was more advanced than us because she came from a more developed planet. Still, she didn't like entering the place much because she was more of a warrior type. There were also two underground levels and a small, high-tech prison with two cells. There was an ocean below for an escape route in case of an emergency. They had a lot of freedom in this place, and they divided tasks like cooking and cleaning certain areas equally. They each completed various tasks, such as cleaning their rooms and doing the laundry. When he closed the door to his room, a small magical energy wave pulsed through it. This proves that his protection spells are active. Dio will be notified, and anyone who tries to break in will receive a small curse. Dio walked down the hallway and went to the stairs. The whole place was calm. Wally and Robin usually wake up after noon, Wally because he's lazy, and Robin because he spends the entire night working as a hero. There's no problem, as they all go to school in the afternoon, except for Coriandar. She won't escape this suffering for long, she just needs to get used to their habit a bit more before she's obliged to go. Of course, she's quite excited about it without knowing the kind of suffering that awaits her. Good morning, Diomedes, Coriandar greeted Dio. She's in the small kitchen downstairs, making breakfast. The food on Earth is very different from Tamarin's, so today is her first time trying it. Good morning, Coriandar, Dio replied as he sat at the table in the center of the kitchen. Coriandar is making something on the stove with her back to him. As usual, he glanced at something from her every morning. Coriandar is very open about her body and not at all shy. She doesn't wear vulgar clothing, but her outfits are tight and sexy. She smiled at him while holding a frying pan and a spoon in each hand, as if she knew what was on his mind. She then moves her attention back to the stove. You can try to seduce me as much as you want, succubus, but I won't be easily seduced. Good morning, my friends. Caldera HM said this and pulled Dio out of his humorous thoughts. Caldera HM wore regular clothes with simple navy blue pants and a shirt. Roy, not joining us again today Caldera HM asked when he sat beside Dio. Of course not, Dio responded, his good humor fading a bit. Roy and Dio are avoiding each other as much as possible. Roy opens his big mouth and says stupid things every time they meet. Dio was staying away from places where he was, so Dio avoided attacking him when he was angry, and it looked like he was trying to do the same with them. Here, the food is ready. Coriandar said that and placed the frying pan right in front of them. What did you make? Coriandar Dio asked and looked at the food. Fried eggs with bacon and pancakes, Coriandar cheerfully said while placing other plates on the table. Why are you so happy while cooking? Dio asked with confusion and looked at her smile. I've never had to do this before. It's fun to cook your own meal. Coriandar replied. Sometimes, I forget that this woman is the princess of an entire planet. As they started eating themselves, Caldera HM looked at her and asked, How's the search for your superhero codename and Earth name going? I haven't decided on my codename yet, but Batman has already created my Earth name. It's Cory Anders. Coriandar said happily. It's a good name, Caldera HM said this and turned his attention back to his plate. 
Why not use the meaning of your Tamaranian name as your codename Dio suddenly said oh. Coriandar said and looked at Dio. What would your name be in our language Caldera HM asked. It would be Starfire. Coriandar replied. I like it. Dio said. Me too. Caldera HM agreed. Using my name but also not using it, I like that too. Coriandar says happily. They kept talking and laughing while they ate breakfast. Caldera HM was the one who had to wash the plates when everyone else was done. At the same time, Coriandar and the narrator did what they always did and went to the floor where the gym was. The gym and training area were quite huge, and the best part was that there was specially prepared equipment for beings with superpowers. This allowed Dio to measure his strength and speed better and train them. The two of them changed into workout clothes. Dio was wearing shorts without a shirt, and Coriandar was wearing a sports bra, exposing her abdomen, and black leggings. Staffs again Coriandar asked in the center of the area, in the middle of the gym. Why not Dio replied and went to a small rack where wooden staffs were kept. Dio took two of them and tossed one to her, which she caught in the air. He approached her and gripped the staff while looking at his opponent. Coriandar's cheerful and happy personality can deceive many people, but she's definitely one of the best trained warriors Dio had the joy of sparring with. Since she wasn't from this planet, Dio didn't know much about her martial arts, even though they were close to Earth in some ways welcome to the Titan's Tower, Kyrix. Beep 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 blam the first beep caught Dio off guard, and the second one made him angry, so he threw his pen at the alarm clock, piercing it and destroying it. Since Dio didn't need to sleep, he spent the entire night studying various spells from different magical systems. The alarm clock is convenient to remind him that it's morning, otherwise, he would stay in his room for days without knowing the time. The problem was that he often forgot to turn off his super hearing while he was deeply studying. It was loud every time it beeped, so he quickly destroyed it. Dio could use his phone, but he was not that stupid. Dio stood up from his chair in front of his desk, which was covered in open books and scrolls, all of which he borrowed from Zatanna's library. They are all about levitation and floating magic. He leans on the table to look over all of his work. Dio had some time since it was six in the morning, and breakfast was normally served at half past six. Dio had been studying levitation magic all week since he arrived at the Titan's Tower and tried to create his own flight spell. Unfortunately, it's going to take a little longer to succeed. The levitation spells allowed magicians to float and move in the air, but not at speed. It's possible to increase speed, but the mana consumption would be too high. That's why he needed to create a new spell, but it's difficult to create a spell focusing on speed because there are no spells like that. The reason was quite simple, and it was that magicians didn't see the need for fast flight. They don't need to be able to fly quickly because most people who practice magical arts fight from a distance. A teleportation spell is also more convenient and easy to use if he need to get from one place to another. But he was not like other magicians, Dio's fighting style is short to medium range. The ability to fly at the same speed he moves will make him much stronger. As for teleportation, the theoretical knowledge isn't too difficult for him since he can move through the shadows, which is natural teleportation. The only problem is his limitations in using spells. If he used something too powerful, he'd end up destroying himself. But that will change over time, Dio's resistance will increase, and as a demigod, they don't age after a certain age. He was confident that he could harness the full power of the underworld's aspects in the future. In a few minutes, he finished reading all the information and also his unfinished spell. Dio still thinks he is far from achieving it, but it will take less time than he initially thought. Dio finally finished and looked around his room, which is quite simple, with just a double bed, a desk, a bookshelf, and a wardrobe. A normal room. Dio didn't have many things to decorate his room when he lived with Julia, and he hasn't changed much here either. There are some protection and anti-surveillance spells on the wall and posters of bands. Dio was not an idiot, this place was basically built with Batman's money, so there were many surveillance devices to gather information about them. So Dio invested a bit in these spells to have some peace and privacy in his own room. Dio grabbed his cell phone and saw a message from Vanessa, which he replied to before heading out the door. The Titan's tower was well divided. There was a common area below on the floor with the bedrooms, connected by stairs. Below that, 
There were the men's locker rooms and showers, while the women's rooms had their own bathrooms. Further down, there was the gym, laundry room, infirmary, workshop, garage, and reception area. The floor above the common area and bedrooms was where the operations room was located, with computers and various other equipment. It's Robin's personal little cave since only he knew how to operate those devices, except for Coriandar, who was more advanced than us because she came from a more developed planet. Still, she didn't like entering the place much because she was more of a warrior type. There were also two underground levels and a small, high-tech prison with two cells. There was an ocean below for an escape route in case of an emergency. They had a lot of freedom in this place, and they divided tasks like cooking and cleaning certain areas equally. They each completed various tasks, such as cleaning their rooms and doing the laundry. When he closed the door to his room, a small magical energy wave pulsed through it. This proves that his protection spells are active. Dio will be notified, and anyone who tries to break in will receive a small curse. Dio walked down the hallway and went to the stairs. The whole place was calm. Wally and Robin usually wake up after noon, Wally because he's lazy, and Robin because he spends the entire night working as a hero. There's no problem, as they all go to school in the afternoon, except for Coriandar. She won't escape this suffering for long, she just needs to get used to their habit a bit more before she's obliged to go. Of course, she's quite excited about it without knowing the kind of suffering that awaits her. Good morning, Diomedes, Coriandar greeted Dio. She's in the small kitchen downstairs, making breakfast. The food on earth is very different from Tamarin's, so today is her first time trying it. Good morning, Coriandar, Dio replied as he sat at the table in the center of the kitchen. Coriandar is making something on the stove with her back to him. As usual, he glanced at something from her every morning. Coriandar is very open about her body and not at all shy. She doesn't wear vulgar clothing, but her outfits are tight and sexy. She smiled at him while holding a frying pan and a spoon in each hand, as if she knew what was on his mind. She then moves her attention back to the stove. You can try to seduce me as much as you want, succubus, but I won't be easily seduced. Good morning, my friends. Caldere HM said this and pulled Dio out of his humorous thoughts. Caldere HM wore regular clothes with simple navy blue pants and a shirt. Roy, not joining us again today Caldere HM asked when he sat beside Dio. Of course not, Dio responded, his good humor fading a bit. Roy and Dio are avoiding each other as much as possible. Roy opens his big mouth and says stupid things every time they meet. Dio was staying away from places where he was, so Dio avoided attacking him when he was angry, and it looked like he was trying to do the same with them. Here, the food is ready. Coriandar said that and placed the frying pan right in front of them. What did you make? Coriandar Dio asked and looked at the food. Fried eggs with bacon and pancakes, Coriandar cheerfully said while placing other plates on the table. Why are you so happy while cooking? Dio asked with confusion and looked at her smile. I've never had to do this before. It's fun to cook your own meal. Coriandar replied. Sometimes, I forget that this woman is the princess of an entire planet. As they started eating themselves, Caldere HM looked at her and asked, How's the search for your superhero codename and Earth name going? I haven't decided on my codename yet, but Batman has already created my Earth name. It's Cory Anders. Coriandar said happily. It's a good name, Caldere HM said this and turned his attention back to his plate. Why not use the meaning of your Tamaranian name as your codename Dio suddenly said oh. Coriandar said and looked at Dio. What would your name be in our language Caldere HM asked. It would be Starfire. Coriandar replied. I like it. Dio said. Me too. Caldere HM agreed. Using my name but also not using it, I like that too. Coriandar says happily. They kept talking and laughing while they ate breakfast. Caldere HM was the one who had to wash the plates when everyone else was done. At the same time, Coriandar and the narrator did what they always did and went to the floor where the gym was. The gym and training area were quite huge, and the best part was that there was specially prepared equipment for beings with superpowers. This allowed Dio to measure his strength and speed better and train them. The two of them changed into workout clothes. 
Dio was wearing shorts without a shirt, and Coriandar was wearing a sports bra, exposing her abdomen, and black leggings. Staffs again Coriandar asked in the center of the area, in the middle of the gym. Why not Dio replied and went to a small rack where wooden staffs were kept. Dio took two of them and tossed one to her, which she caught in the air. He approached her and gripped the staff while looking at his opponent. Coriandar's cheerful and happy personality can deceive many people, but she's definitely one of the best trained warriors Dio had the joy of sparring with. Since she wasn't from this planet, Dio didn't know much about her martial arts, even though they were close to Earth in some ways. This made her the perfect person to train with. She was also glad to train with him all day after he got there. Coriandar made the first move. She floated a few inches in the air and slid forward, holding the staff with one hand at its tip like a sword. She thrust it toward the center of Dio's nose. Dio turned his body to the to dodge, but she spun the staff to the same position where he turned and forced him to crouch to avoid the attack. While crouched, Dio counterattacked with his staff and aimed for her waist, but she held the staff with both hands and defended herself. When compared to martial arts practiced on Earth, the one she learned was specifically made for beings that can fly, which makes it hard to predict her movements. With their staffs still meeting, she spun it and tried to strike his head. Dio managed to defend and counterattack, and they exchanged blows, alternating between defense, attack, and counterattack. Then she landed on the ground to reduce her height by a few inches, enough to catch Dio off guard, and she thrust the front part of the staff into his abdomen. Coriandar spun her body and kicked his leg, which caused Dio to fall backward. Well, you lasted longer than last time. Coriandar said and extended her hand to help Dio up. I'll take that as a compliment. Dio replied as he stood up on his feet. And it was, it took a lot of training with the warlords of Okara for me to defend myself so well with a staff as you're doing now. Coriandar continued. The warlords are great martial arts masters in the Vega system, where Coriandar comes from. It seems she trained there with her sister when she was younger. This was one of the few details she shared about her past. Coriandar doesn't like to talk about her past much, and Dio has a sense of why, so he'd rather not push her. Another round Coriandar asked while holding the staff with both hands. Sure, Dio replied. Dio got into position, but unlike her, he held his staff low with both hands and used it more like a sword. This time, Dio attacked first. He raised the staff above his head and brought it down toward her shoulder. Coriandar gracefully levitated in the air to dodge, but he predicted quickly. Dio stopped his downward strike and shifted it from the bottom to the side, just as she had done to him. The staff moved faster than her flying speed, which caused her to lower her head to defend herself and counterattack, aiming for his leg. Dio jumped to avoid the strike and kicked Corian's face. Coriandar defended herself in the middle of the staff and took advantage of the moment to create some distance. She then lunged with a thrust and targeted his chest. Dio dodged the first two strikes and counterattacked on the third. But that was what she was waiting for. She spun her body in the air and kicked Dio. Dio managed to defend her kick aimed at his chest, but the staff broke in two. However, Dio didn't give up. He grabbed the broken second half of the staff and attacked her with two strikes at the same time, one aimed at her extended ankle and the other at her chest. Dio managed to hit her leg and cause her to wince in pain, but the attack targeting her chest failed. Are you okay Dio asked, as he was concerned about her leg. Maybe I had gone a bit overboard. Injuries during training are common, don't worry about them. Coriandar replied, though Dio could see that she was in pain. Let me examine it, the training is over. Dio said it without giving her a chance to object. Coriandar sat on the floor while Dio checked her ankle. It wasn't swollen, so it wasn't broken. Sorry, sometimes I forget that I'm not training with Wonder Woman. Dio apologized while still looking at her ankle. I've already told you it's nothing. My natural healing is already at work, and the pain is disappearing. Coriandar continued. Training with Diana helped me control my powers but not hold back because I didn't need to do that during our fights. Diana was stronger and more resilient than Dio, so he always went all out, and she was never injured. In addition, he didn't land many direct hits on her. After a few seconds, she was fully healed. If it weren't for that, Dio would have healed her. Dio was not very skilled in healing spells, but he had a very effective one, 
but not a pleasant experience. This little incident kind of killed the mood. How about we work out a bit on the machines Dio suggested it to his gym partner. I don't understand why you got so upset over such a minor injury, but okay, let's go to the machines. Coriandar replied as she stood up. As they walked toward the machines, Caldera HM entered the gym in his workout clothes. Have you finished your physical training Caldera HM asked. Caldera HM also used this floor quite a bit, along with everyone else except Wally, who only came to brag that he could reach the treadmill's maximum speed. Roy tried to avoid him, so he came at a different time. Robin tried to train with them in the morning, but he fell asleep during an exercise and almost got hurt, so he didn't try again. I accidentally injured her during our fight, so we stopped. Dio explained it to him. Are you all right? Caldera HM asked and looked at her with concern. It was just a minor injury. I'm completely healed. Coriandar replied and went toward one of the gym machines. Caldera HM then approached Dio and asked in a low voice, What happened? Nothing serious, I just don't have much control over my strength. I ended up hurting her ankle, but it healed in a few seconds. Dio explained more. Understood. Do you want to work out while we talk about magic? Caldera HM asked and changed the subject. Sure. So the two of them went to the futuristic style treadmills, turned them on to speeds much higher than any normal human could run, and began their conversation while enjoying a light warm up. Caldera HM wasn't a sorcerer or magician, his magical powers came from his tattoos. It wasn't necessary for him to understand how the tattoos worked in order to use his powers. He just had to learn how to infuse energy into them. This way, everyone who didn't focus on creating tattoos trained and learned only to manipulate them. It was a magical shortcut. When Dio met this version of Aqualad, he was quite excited about the possibility of discovering some of the secrets of his Atlantean magic. Atlantean magic was one of the first systems created on Earth, but the truth was boring. It seemed that the true Homo Magi of Atlantica were few, and the reason for this was somewhat vague. According to Caldera HM, Atlantean magic is fueled by belief, will, and faith in Atlantis itself. However, it seems that this magic has been corrupted in some way and made quite thin. So, they came up with tattoos, which are shortcuts made and spread by the royalty of the country of Zebel, who can naturally manipulate water. Din 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 while they were running and talking, the alert signal started beeping. Coriandar, who was closer to the communicator on the wall near the door, went to it and pressed a button, asking, what happened get dressed and go to the roof, now Robin's voice responded without providing many details. Those were just a few words, but the three of us acted immediately. They entered the elevator and made a brief stop on the floor where our rooms were located. That's where Aqualad and Coriandar changed into their costumes, while Dio simply touched the black metal of his pendant to have his armor spread over his entire body. Coriandar and Aqualad returned dressed in their suits, and as they ascended, Dio couldn't help but keep his eyes on Coriandar's new outfit. It was quite sexy. She was wearing a purple outfit that clung to her body, with the center of her chest exposed, which revealed a bit of skin, and a miniskirt. She had two silver bracelets on her wrists and matching boots, all in the same color as her outfit. It was simple but perfect for her, with her long red hair flowing freely and her orange skin. They arrived on the roof, and in the center of it was the Titan's means of transportation. Dio can't describe it better than a wide, silver flying car with multiple seats. Kid Flash, Robin, and Speedy were all in their places, with Robin in the front as the pilot. Hurry Kid Flash yelled at them. Aqualad and Dio rushed to the flying car while Coriandar flew to her seat. When they were all seated, the car took off towards the city. What happened Aqualad asked in the middle of the flight. Without looking at us, Robin replied, a metahuman just attacked a jewelry store a few minutes ago and stole thousands of dollars worth of jewels. The police tried to stop him, but they were not enough. At this moment, the metahuman is leaving a trail of destruction in his escape. I see. Aqualad responded. Did the League approve this mission Dio asked with hope in his eyes. I received the mission directly from Martian Manhunter, but all the other League members are busy, so we'll have to fight this battle without supervision. Robin replied. Stop being a coward, Rookie Speedy shouted, but Dio ignored him. The League of Justice wouldn't let a group of teens live alone without supervision, as Dio said before. 
That's why they made rules, like not going on tasks without a league member with us to help them if something goes wrong. A league member would also stay in the Titan Tower with them every once in a while. These rules are good. They forgot one important thing was that they were very busy. Since they moved in, not a single one of them has come to stay with them. This made some members think they could go on their first mission without getting permission from the League, which Dio thought was a bad idea and made Roy think of him as a coward. What's the plan Coriandar asked and shifted into warrior mode. The plan and the information were announced by Robin, who was their unofficial boss. Kid, Aqualad, and I will clear the streets. Meanwhile, Kyrix, Speedy, and Coriandar will target the objective. Robin explained. It's Starfire Coriandar corrected. What do you mean Robin asked with confusion. I decided that would be my codename. Starfire responded. When did this happen Kid Flash asked while looking puzzled. Earlier this morning. Starfire continued. Enough joking around. Speedy interrupted. Robin was about to say something to Speedy, but before he could speak, Kid shouted, look out Robin quickly refocused his attention on the road in front and turned the flying car to the right, just in time to avoid being hit by the motorcycle that was thrown in their direction. They all tensed up at how close the motorcycle came to hitting them. We've arrived, Robin then said. Dio looked ahead and saw an ordinary street, but it was empty of people. Instead, it was swarmed with police who had set up perimeters on both sides of the street using their patrol cars. They were taking cover behind their vehicles and firing pistols and shotguns at the man standing in the middle of the street. He was likely responsible for the motorcycle that nearly hit them. You forgot to mention our enemy's size, super strength, and resistance, Robin. Kid Flash spoke with anxiety evident in his voice. Kid had every right to think that their opponent was intimidating. He was well over two meters tall, and his body appeared entirely of muscle, and his broad shoulders gave the illusion that he was a giant. He wore only a black vest and pants, exposing his arms, and had shoulder-length red hair and a beard. Unfortunately, Dio couldn't recognize him in any of the DC characters he knew, so he only knew what everyone else does now. The police need help, now Aqualad shouted upon seeing the giant lifting a parked car on the street and facing one of the barricades. Starfire Dio yelled, and she understood. Starfire flew out of their vehicle towards the giant, and as he threw the car, she was close enough to hit him with her energy blasts from above, forcing the car to fall to the ground a few meters away from the police officers. We need to land. Kid Flash said. I'll go in front. Aqualad warned. I'm going too. Dio also replied. Since there were no people in the street to clear, Robin's plan had to change. Unfortunately, they didn't have much time to wait for him to instruct them. Robin couldn't land the car in the middle of the street, they'd be easy targets. So Robin had to take them to one of the rooftops of the buildings on the street. Aqualad simply jumped out of the car, and Dio teleported to the ground. With the instant movement of shadows, Dio touched the ground before Aqualad landed. This height wouldn't hurt him, Atlanteans are much more resilient than humans. Dio then drew his sword and shield from his back and sprinted toward the enemy. When Dio reached the first perimeter, he jumped over it. The police had the courtesy and intelligence not to continue firing since Starfire arrived, and at this moment, she was firing green energy blasts at the giant from a distance. The giant was swinging his hands as if trying to grab her, but she was much more agile in the air. When she saw Dio approaching, she spun in the air and made the giant turn his back to Dio in an opening position. Dio was certainly going to accept the invitation. Dio accelerated with a burst of speed from one point to another, and he appeared right in front of the giant's back. D.O.P. jumped to the perfect height and attacked with his shield aimed at his head. However, he somehow managed to predict his movement and turned to face his strike. But it didn't matter, the blow was too close for him to dodge. But the giant managed to surprise Dio by delivering a headbutt to his shield. Blam it sounded like his head was made of metal, as it was that hard. The force of his headbutt caused Dio to retreat a few meters, which stopped his attack. The giant seemed satisfied with his strength and smiled at Dio, a smile that disappeared when Starfire hit his back with her attack. Clearly infuriated, the giant spun his body and tried to punch her, but he made the mistake of getting too close. The punch was stopped before it could hit her by a whip made of luminescent water that coiled around the giant's wrist. 
Aqualad arrived just in time. The giant wasn't stupid, when he saw he was being restrained, he grabbed the whip with his other hand, turned his body, and lifted Aqualad off the ground as if he were a toy. The giant continued to spin him in the air until the water whip snapped and threw Aqualad at high speed toward a wall on the other side of the street. Dio was about to help him when a golden blur passed by his side and ran up the wall, held Aqualad's body, and then disappeared and reappeared by Dio's side. Thanks, Kid Flash. Aqualad said this and looked at his friend. You're welcome. Kid Flash replied. Now, how are we going to deal with this Dio asked. There was no time to plan as several arrows flew over the giant's head and hit the giant's body. The giant didn't seem the least bit scared by them and didn't appear to be injured when they hit his back. The ones that touched his body didn't break. Instead, they went through a thin layer of skin and got stuck. This meant that his invulnerability wasn't as ridiculous as Superman's. Even if it were, Dio's sword had magical enchantments that were about to be tested against invulnerable beings. What's the plan kid asked over the communicator. We're going to attack together and make sure no police officers get hurt. Robin replied from a few kilometers away on top of a building with Speedy by his side. It's not a good plan, but given the situation, there's nothing else they can do. Their enemy doesn't seem to be the type to use his head, and the police are too proud to retreat and leave everything to them. At least they were kind enough not to shoot in the back, which would be one more thing Dio have to worry about. One interesting thing Dio discovered about his demigod powers is that he was not bulletproof. To be more precise, sharp things can cut his skin. Dio really didn't understand this. For example, Diana can fall from a hundred-story building and not be seriously injured. They can absorb the impact and heal almost instantly, but a bullet can kill them. That's why they receive so much training to compensate for this weakness. Dio stopped thinking about it and focused on the battle again. Starfire hasn't tried to get closer and has started firing her green blasts from a distance, but it seems she's holding back because the giant didn't seem to be suffering much damage. Kid Flash then entered the fight and ran at high speed towards their enemy. Kid jumped and kicked the giant squarely in the head, and when the giant fell to the ground, Kid Flash sped away before getting hit by a punch from his opponent. You missed, Bigfoot Kid taunted. Bigfoot I'm Mammoth Mammoth shouted for the first time in response. Look, he can talk, Kid Flash continued to tease. In response, Mammoth went to a vehicle on the sidewalk, lifted it, and threw it in the direction Kid Flash had passed, which Dio's direction. When Dio turned around, he saw that dodging would hurt several police officers, so he put his shield and sword on his back and held the car in front of him while using both hands. Watch out, Kirik Starfire yelled. While holding the car in front of him, he couldn't see why, and before Dio could set it down, Mammoth's arm pierced the car's body and hit him directly. The punch didn't hurt much, but it caused the car to explode, and sent Dio flying backward. Dio did several somersaults in the air to avoid falling and hurting anyone, then he used the shadow's movement to reappear on the second floor, on the roof of a building. Kirix, are you okay Robin asked through the communicator. I'm fine. Dio replied while walking to the edge of the roof where he was. Funny, right Dio can be injured by a bullet, but not by an explosion like that. Let's finish him off by attacking together Aqualad shouted over the communicator. I agree, Kirix, come back here soon. Robin yelled. Dio looked down and saw everyone attacking at the same time. Robin, Aqualad, and Speedy are now engaged in a closer combat, while Starfire is still in the distance and firing her blasts. Dio was about to join in and end the battle when he saw movement outside one of the perimeter. Soon, four big black police cars with the police logo on them stop a few meters from their vehicles. There are a lot of troops getting out of the cars with tactical black clothes and big guns and surround the barrier. The SWAT team is here. Dio thought they would just stay and protect their position while they fight, but to his surprise, one of the SWAT members grabs a grenade launcher and pointed it at the center of the battle. Dio jumped from the building where he was and landed a few inches from him, ripping the weapon from his hand. What are you doing, kid one of the SWAT members angrily shouts. The likely SWAT leader has all the typical of a lousy cop, which is short with a big belly and a terrible mustache. You were about to shoot at my friends, of course, I'm stopping you. Dio replied and then twisted the barrel of the weapon to render it useless and throw it on the ground. 
I was trying to stop these freaks from destroying my street. Arrest this kid now the police officer yelled. Before Dio get attacked and start a battle against the police because of their useless leader, he teleport to the other side of the perimeter and run toward the battle. They need to end this quickly before this idiot attacks. The first thing Dio saw is Robin swinging with his back claw and hitting Mammoth's head with both feet. Speedy passed under him and fires a point-blank arrow right into his chin, causing a small explosion. Mammoth then took a few steps back only to be hit in the back of his leg by Aqualad, who had turned his water into a spiked club. The force of the blow made him raise his leg, and Kid Flash enters the fight, running around Mammoth so fast that he creates a small tornado, sending him flying into the air. Starfire jumps out from above and hits him in the stomach with both arms spread out. He is five meters high and can't avoid the blow. This sends him flying to the ground. Dio attack at that point. Epsilon Pi Iota Kappa Alpha Lambda Omicron Nu Alpha Iota Tau Omicron Kappa Rho Omicron Tau Eta Theta Lambda Psi Eta Tau Omicron Upsilon Pi Omicron Tau Alpha Mu Omicron Cosite, I summon the cold of the river Cositis, Dio used the shadow's movement to appear beneath him a few inches from the ground and attack. A black mist-like pitch covers Dio's sword, lowering its temperature and coating it in ice. Dio I point the sword upward and thrust it into Mammoth's shoulder. The force of the hit made both of them spin in the air and Dio facing the ground. When the mammoth's weight is about to flatten Dio, he twisted his body, which caused Dio to fall face first onto the ground. Dio pushed his sword even further, pierced mammoth's entire body in reaching the ground, his skin is quite hard, and he had to exert some force. H-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-
Seriously, Man Kid exclaimed in surprise like everyone else by his attitude and audacity. That's no way to act with your elders, kid. Well, what can you expect from people like you? The officer looks at each one of them disdainfully until he looks at Starfire and freezes. Of course, all the men here understood why, and they didn't like it one bit. Can I shoot an arrow in his leg? Speedy asked, and for the first time since Dio knew him, Dio liked what he said. What the officer shouted in fright and took a few steps back. Maybe it's better to take him somewhere to cool off, like a very exclusive island in the Atlantic Ocean. Kid Flash suggested. As tempting as that sounds, let's just wait for the transport in a more distant place before I agree with your suggestions. Aqualad said. So, they all went to the rooftop of a building right across the street, where they could see all the chaos. Could someone explain why you all got so angry with that ugly man Starfire asked. She comes from a planet where her culture is much more open compared to theirs, so Dio tries to explain it in the best way for her. Apart from the fact that he spoke to us and looked at us as if we weren't human, he looked at you with desire. And is that wrong here on Earth? Starfire asked again. No, you definitely draw a lot of attention with your beauty, but he didn't look at you as if he admired your beauty. It was more like. If you were an object to satisfy him. Robin continued. He's taken a small bird shaped dart from his belt and is staring straight at the idiot below. I see. Starfire said this while also thinking about it. The transport has finally arrived. Kid Flash said this and pointed to the other side of the street, where a large bus was approaching. A group of guys in blue uniforms get off the bus and walk up to Mammoth. But they can't move the frozen Mammoth, so Dio had to come down to thaw him out. As a precaution, Dio thawed only his torso and arms and his legs frozen. After that, he was handcuffed with the thickest handcuffs Dio had ever seen, dragged to the back of the truck, and went to Bel Reve prison, which is the place used to contain metahuman criminals. Mission accomplished. Now, how about celebrating with some pizza kid asked when Dio returned to the rooftop where everyone was. B.O.M. then, the transport vehicle explodes into a fireball in the middle of the road. Kid after a few seconds of shock, Robin screamed. Kid Flash ran toward the flaming bus. Aqualad and Speedy, contain the flames. Robin continued and gave them the orders. Aqualad and Speedy jumped from one building to another in the direction of the fire. Then Kid Flash reappears in front of Dio, Robin, and Starfire. Mammoth disappeared through the sewers. Kid informs us. The three of us will pursue him. Kid Flash, you have to look for any other metahuman nearby, that explosion was a long-distance attack. Robin explained, and they all moved. Before entering the sewers, Dio saw Aqualad manipulating the water to put out the fire, and Speedy shot an arrow into the remaining flames of the vehicle. Then they entered the sewer. Dio always feels at home in dark places, but this was the first time he entered the underground part of a city, and he can't help but imagine his personal hell being like this. Just imagine the dirtiest and smelliest place anyone can, and then add super senses to it all. Fortunately, the place was wide enough for the three of them. There was a long corridor with a dirty water stream running in the center, and the walls were old. It's likely that this place has never seen renovations since it was built. This place stinks worse than the warlord's bathrooms. Starfire spoke in a very low voice, with one hand holding her nose. I just checked the maps, this tunnel literally leads to any part of the city, even the ocean. Robin said this and looked at his wrist monitor without seeming to mind the smell. I can't see any trace of Mammoth, he's definitely getting help. Dio said this to everyone and looked at the ground with his night vision. You both can see in the dark Robin asked with curiosity. Yes, Dio replied. I can't see in the dark, but I was trained to fight in it. If you want, I can light up my hands. Starfire suggested. No, my mask has night vision. They continued walking through the sewers, going further and further without finding any sign of their enemy. What cute creature Starfire then said, looking at a group of rats, which made both Robin and Dio scrunch up their faces. Starfire, your definition of cute is a bit off. When we get back home, I'll show you some earth animals to fix that. Dio told his friend with pity. What kind of creatures exist in her world for her to genuinely find a rat cute, after more time searching? That's enough. Robin said. We've been walking for over an hour, 
and we've completely lost him. Dio agreed with him. He didn't seem like an intelligent enemy to cover his tracks like this. Maybe he has an ally Starfire speculated out loud. I agree, let's get out of this stench. Robin said while looking for the nearest exit. They the sewer through an exit just a few meters from where they were. Aqualad kindly brought the hover car to them. Robin took the wheel, and they went home. On the way, Aqualad explained that they easily extinguished the fire, but none of the officers in the transport survived the explosion. Kid Flash also couldn't find the person responsible for the attack. With a bad mood for their first mission not ending in a complete victory, they arrived home, and all those who had spent more than an hour in the sewer rushed to the bathroom. Coriandar was in such a hurry that she started taking off her suit, threw it on the floor, and her in just her underwear on her way to her room. Unfortunately, Dio will have to teach her a bit of modesty later, as he is the mentally eldest member of this group. After a long shower, they gathered on the couch, where they sat. There was a group of people sitting in front of it. Even though everyone was sitting down and clean, no one spoke up, so Dio did. Has anyone reported what happened to the League? Dio asked. I just sent a written report to Batman, he'll get in touch with us when he has time. Dick responded as he was sitting on the floor in front of him in a defeated pose. There's no need to be so down, Robin. The escape was completely unexpected. Dio continued and tried to cheer him up. I agree with Dio, but even knowing that doesn't make me feel better. Aqualad said this while sitting on the couch next to Dio. Even when you do everything right, there's a chance you might still lose. It's a common saying on my planet. Coriandar sat on the other side and was drying her long red hair with a towel. But I really would like to avoid going into the sewers again, forever. Coriandar continued. Don't speak for yourselves, I don't need anyone's approval Roy vented his anger, like always, by acting like a fool. He then the group and went for the elevator. Roy, where are you going Wally asked. To train he's the kind of warrior who likes to train to relieve his frustrations. I understand that. Coriandar nodded in agreement with Roy's actions. It's always good to punch things and lift weights when you're mad, but Dio would rather think of a way to fix his mistakes. Instead of sitting here grumbling, why don't we go after him again Dio suggested. I don't think the League would like us going after Mammoth on our own again. Wally said. We don't need the League's permission to just look for him. Dio tried suggesting the idea again. And it seems to have worked. Robin got up from the floor, calmed down, and said, there is something very wrong with the robbery. I can look into it to try to find answers. Wasn't it just a simple robbery Calderay HM asked. Robin put his hand on his chin and started walking back and forth in front of them. He broke into a jewelry store with hundreds of millions in gemstones and jewelry and only stole one item, an item that wasn't listed as the most valuable on the premises. Robin told everyone. Dio needs to make a mental note to get Dick to share more details. If he had known this earlier, he would have immediately tried to recover the stolen item. It was a mistake on his part as well to not ask. They all understand this here, but they also understand that this isn't the best time to tell him. Is there a picture of the jewelry DOP asked Dick, who is still pacing back and forth in the room. I'll look for one now. Robin said, stopped his walking, and rushed to the elevator. Wally and Calderay HM stood up and followed him, and Dio joined them. Aren't you coming Dio? asked Coriandar. I'm starving, and it looks like the investigation won't be over any time soon, so I'm going to eat something first. Coriandar replied, stood up, and ran toward the kitchen. An interesting fact about her is that her stomach seems bottomless, she can eat even more than a speedster like Wally. Dio was not stupid enough to stand between her and her food. Dio entered the elevator with the other boys, without Roy, and they went to Robin's little cave. The cave is quite small, just a little room of 15 square meters with 5 in width. The place is dark, except for the light from the huge monitors mounted on the wall. There are four large screens arranged in the shape of AC facing downward and a leather armchair in front of a keyboard. The only things other than the computer and the chair that keep the device on the other side of the wall in good shape are air conditioners. Dick quickly sat in his chair and started typing on the keyboard while the rest of them took positions around him and looked at the information displayed on the computer screen. I found it Dick exclaimed excitedly, and all four screens showed the same image. The jewel has an oval shape, 
is the size of a palm, and is red like a ruby. A valuable gem called a red stone is surrounded by gold metal that has small letters engraved into it in a language that no one can understand. Any additional information about it Wally asked as Dio tried to decipher the writing. No, just that the jewel was recently found in a private excavation and was kept in the jewelry store's vault until it was scheduled to be transported for auction in five days. Can you zoom in on the inscriptions, please Calderay HM requested. Their vision isn't as sharp as Dio's, so they need a closer look. Soon, the image is zoomed in to show the inscriptions on the ruby, but Dio still can't figure out what language it is. Later, Dio can ask for Vanessa's help. She isn't an expert like her mother, but she learned about ancient civilizations from the people around her, so she knows more about this topic than Dio does. If she doesn't know, maybe this will be intriguing enough for Julia to help him. The computer couldn't identify this language. Dick continued, also intrigued by the inscriptions. That's because this is an ancient archaic language of Atlantica. Caldera HM spoke, which surprised them. Can you translate it? Wally asked, eagerly looking at him. I'm not an expert, but I believe it says, the Amulet of Arion. A lot of people want to visit Washington, D.C. But right now, the most popular spot is the Hall of Justice, which is where the Justice League's headquarters are located. The structure of the huge building was a unique mix of Greek and modern styles, which makes sense since Wonder Woman and Green Lantern designed it and Superman built it from scratch in just a few minutes. This building happened only a few months ago. Since then, visitors could explore some of the building's rooms to learn about the history of past and current heroes. Of course, there were areas not open to the public, like the League's meeting room, where four of its members are currently gathered. You did what Green Arrow shouted as he rose from his chair and slammed his fist on the table. A test. Batman replied while sitting on the opposite side of the three-meter by one-meter square table. You tested our protégés without telling us against a metahuman green arrow shouted again. Despite my dislike of this, why don't we let Batman explain his reasons Wonder Woman interjected, seated with her arms crossed, looking sternly at Batman. Batman answered calmly, I tested the new team to see if they could work together successfully against an enemy without one of us watching over them. Batman, we agreed together that the Titans wouldn't take any missions without a League of Justice member accompanying them. Superman said while sitting on the other side and was faced with Wonder Woman. Batman looked at him and responded with the same calm voice. We don't have enough time to do this task. Have any of you had enough time to stay with them since they began Batman's question everyone in silence? Due to our obligations, we were unable to fulfill the agreement. I checked if the task could proceed without our assistance. Batman continued. The other three members still didn't like it, but he was right. They didn't have time to do what was agreed upon. Still, testing the kids in this manner was wrong and dangerous. Green Arrow shouted again. I was present the whole time, they just didn't know it. Batman countered and ended Green Arrow's arguments. That's why John didn't inform us that the kids weren't alone since you were there. Superman guessed. Then everyone fell silent, and Green Arrow calmed down a bit and said, I still don't agree with this test. But what was the result? Batman took the opportunity and pressed a button on the table that caused several screens scattered around the room to light up and display the recording of the fight against Mammoth. Both the strategy, execution, and teamwork were acceptable. There were no major mistakes made by any of the members. In the end, I think they're ready to work alone when necessary. Batman assessed everyone. Wow, Diana, you've certainly trained him well. Green Arrow said while looking at the scene where Kyrix plunged his sword into Mammoth's shoulder and froze him with his magic. Diana saw this scene and also felt a sense of pride, demonstrating it with a broad smile. It's good to see that he hasn't stopped training both his magic and his sword since we parted ways. Diana said. So, they passed your test. I thought it would be the opposite, given that the prisoner escaped. Superman interjected. I can't blame them for something I couldn't even stop. Batman replied. Then, the images shifted to the scene of the prisoner transport's explosion. Does this mean that when the explosion occurred, you intervened? Green Arrow asked. That's correct, but I couldn't find his trail in the sewers. This group is skilled enough to explode a car in front of me, recover the prisoner, and escape without leaving a trace. Group Diana asked. As I mentioned, there isn't any hard evidence, 
but my gut tells me two people carried out the escape. What was the objective then Superman asked. A jewel. I'm about to investigate. Beep a signal on Batman's wrist device stopped him. He read the message on his wrist computer and then informed everyone, the Titans have found some clues about the reason for the theft and are requesting one of us to go there. They've also asked for Aquaman's presence. It seems the kids want to do something about their defeat, and that's a good thing. Diana commented. There were nods of agreement from everyone except Batman. I'll send a message to Aquaman. Who's coming with me to talk to them Batman asked. I'll go with you. I'd like to see my apprentice. Diana volunteered. It took just a few minutes to gather all the information about the stolen amulet. Unfortunately, there wasn't much to work with. Caldera HM knew a lot about ancient magical amulets, but he couldn't give them a deep understanding of them. He then contacted a friend of his in Atlantis who might have more information, as their king wasn't answering calls. The conversation with his friend was quick, but it created a sense of urgency. The amulet was no ordinary item. Robin placed an emergency call to Batman, and within minutes, the Batplane landed on the rooftop helipad, with Diana flying alongside him. What's the information Batman asked as he stepped out of his plane? They were on the rooftop, and Batman wasted no time and didn't even wait for them to enter the building. It had been some time since Dio had seen him, and he appeared as cold and intimidating as ever. Diana stood beside Dio, her hands on her waist, and smiled at them as she always did. We've obtained some information about the theft. I think it's best if Caldera HM explains. Robin said this to Batman. Caldera HM took the lead and started to talk about what the team had discovered. The stolen jewel is the amulet of Arion. Caldera HM said. Great Hera. Diana exclaimed and interrupted. You know him Batman asked. Arion is well known among the Amazons. He was one of the first heroes of ancient Atlantis, and he was born before the Great Flood. Diana explained. That still doesn't explain the great hero. Dio said. Arion is a being of immense power and powerful enough to seal away the ancient gods known as the Black Giants. That means the power of any artifact bearing his name is powerful. Diana went on. Diana continued. They had gained some information about what the amulet could do, but not about its current owner. However, knowing its previous owner was enough to justify calling in the League. What information did you gather about the amulet's use Batman asked Caldera HM. Not much, only that the stone is a sort of magical battery connected to the gods. Caldera HM replied. Gods like Poseidon Batman asked. No, I'm referring to the gods of Atlantis before it sank. It was only after that event that Poseidon became our patron. Caldera HM clarified. Because of the event where Atlantis sank into the sea, they lost an important part of their history and knowledge. It's not an exaggeration to say that their technology level before the sinking was far superior to what they have now. Atlantis is still one of the most powerful nations in the world, even though they lost a lot of their knowledge. We still lack information about the amulet and who might know about it. Batman pondered aloud. Batman made an interesting point. How did the person who stole the amulet know its value after learning a lot from a good detective, Robin came to the same conclusion. A magic user could recognize the jewel's value even without knowing its history, which would also explain the miraculous escape that just happened. Robin said. I agree. Batman replied. Then Dio realized that the agreement was too confident in the possibility that there was nothing they could do in that situation. Furthermore, they hadn't sent any detailed reports about what happened for him to arrive at this conclusion. You were watching us, weren't you Dio asked Batman, and everyone turned to him. Yes, I was. Batman replied without changing his cold and emotionless expression. A test Dio asked again. Correct. Batman answered. Dio didn't mind. He didn't care about this, as he knew what the comics told him. It's likely that he already has ten different plans to defeat Dio, if necessary. Dio was fine with that, but his team wasn't. You said this team was approved, and now you're testing us Roy asked furiously. I wasn't testing you for that reason but to see if the team could function without the supervision of a league member. Batman explained. Dio ignored him and looked at Diana. 
You approve this too this level of paranoia is expected from Batman, but Dio would feel bad if Diana had been involved as well. Wonder Woman and the other League members didn't know that I was watching you or that you were working alone. Batman replied on her behalf and gave Dio relief. I noticed. Robin said, which surprised everyone except Batman. Why didn't you say anything Wally asked? It didn't matter. I know you probably didn't like it, but that was our fight, whether he was watching us or not. Robin replied. I don't mind either, and I'm just a little upset that I couldn't sense his presence. Coriandar said and gave her opinion on the matter. She has a good point. Dio's senses were very sharp, but all he could see or hear were the heartbeats of his team and the other police officers. Of course, Batman could have stayed out of Dio's range, but he was almost sure that he had entered the sewer with them when the escape began. Dio kept his senses at a normal level in the upper city, but he used them all the way to the limit in the sewers and still didn't sense Batman. In addition to his training, his suit must have helped him do this. He remembered that there was a version of his suit that could hide his presence from almost everything, even telepathic beings.